Hello and welcome to my limited set review for Kamigawa Neon Dynasty. This is going to be a limited set review mainly focusing on draft, although it might be applicable to sealed as well. And as usual, I use a letter grade system to rate different cards. So let me give a quick intro to how I like to do my card grading using some cards from the previous expansion, which was Crimson Vow. And uh, we split the tiers into S, A, B, C+, C, D, and F. And the card in front of you is an example of an S tier level card. So these are ridiculous bombs, cards that are very difficult to beat. They provide often an immediate advantage when they come into play. And even if you do manage to remove them, they will still have a very big impact on the game. These are few and uh, far in between, so not too many S tier level cards in every set. These are usually mythic rare cards as well. Next up we get to the A category. So these are still very powerful cards. So still bomb level cards. That will certainly win a game if uh, they go unanswered. Can provide a very big advantage. Think of wedding announcements in Crimson Vow. And uh, another example, Blood Vile Purveyor. A card that can very quickly end the game and requires pretty much an immediate answer. Then we've got the B-level cards. These are still great playables. Often the best common removal spells in each color will fall in the B category. These are often unconditional removal spells or cheaper instant speed removal spells like a braid. And uh, often nice 2 for 1 cards. Often the best uncommons in each color will fall in the B category. And these are still cards you're very happy to first pick out of a pack in a draft. So certainly great cards. Next up is the C plus category. These are above average playables. These are often going to be common cards and among the better commons you find in each color. So these are cards that will be important to fill out your deck and uh, hopefully you can get as many of these as possible as opposed to having to play some of the weaker C level cards. So the four drop a good example of a c plus card some cheaper removal spells that might be a little bit more conditional in nature or slightly more expensive and clunky removal spells might also fall in a c plus category and then we get to the c tier these are just decent mediocre kind of filler cards that uh, still will make up a reasonable percentage of your limited decks and they might be a little bit more synergy dependent, they might not always have the best rate, but they're still playable cards that you will have to uh, play a few of. Don't be too surprised if most combo tricks end up in the C category. And then finally we get to the D tier. These are the bad filler cards that get cut from your deck more often than not. Now it doesn't mean that you'll never play these, but if you can avoid them it's probably for the best. Serpentine Ambush, definitely one of the weaker cards in Crimson Vow. Think of a card like Blood Servitor that's just pretty inefficient, even if it does have some stats and does something when it comes into play. Just not particularly efficient or exciting. And then, last but not least, the F tier. And I actually didn't find any F tier level cards for Crimson Vow, even though, you know, a lot of the D tier level cards you could argue are unplayable. But going back to Midnight Hunt, Pithing Needle, a great example of an unplayable card that's more meant as a sideboard card for Constructed and that should uh, basically never make the main deck of your limited decks. Also want to remind you that if you are interested in my spreadsheet for all these ratings, where I'll make a nice overview of all the ratings for the entire set, that I will also try to keep up to date as I play the set more, because of course this is only my initial set review. I'm sure that by playing the set more, some grades will change over time and uh, I'll try to keep those ratings up to date in a nice little spreadsheet that's accessible for all my Patreon supporters and Twitch subscribers. So first things first, I like to get started with the multicolor cards because multicolor cards usually give you a better idea what all the archetypes in Limited are all about. And in fact, we've got a handy little overview of all the two color archetypes in Limited that will kind of guide us through this set review and most limited decks in Kamigawa, I think, are going to end up two-color decks. You might have a few two-color decks that can splash a third color, a rare exception of maybe a deck trying to go five-color to play certain rares, and uh, maybe you can 
end up with enough playables where a monocolor deck is viable. There are a few rares that might incentivize you to go monocolor, but for the most part I think most decks will be two color and they will more or less follow these archetypes. And so blue-white is going to have the highest density of both vehicles and other vehicle synergies. Red-white is going to introduce the samurai and warrior tribe, which cares about creatures attacking alone, uh, getting certain bonuses, and there's a little bit of uh, synergy there. Then blue-black is going to be the ninja and rogues archetype, highlighted by the ninjutsu mechanic, which is a returning mechanic for those that have played the previous Kamigawa sets. Then black-green is kind of your typical get stuff back out of the graveyard strategy, not one of the more prominent um, mechanics I would say in Kamigawa, but just good black and green cards with a bit of graveyard synergy. Next up, red-green is gonna introduce the modified mechanic, and modified simply means cards that have an equipment attached to it, cards that have plus one counters or other counters, those count as modified cards, and then there will be a number of cards that play into that theme, maybe get better if you control a certain number of modified creatures. Then blue reds is the artifacts archetype, so it's going to have a bit of overlap with the vehicles from blue white, and uh, it's going to have some other enter the battlefield abilities, maybe ways of discounting your artifacts, and generally promote you to play as many artifacts as possible. Then black white's pretty interesting. There's going to be a number of cards that care about you controlling both an artifact and an enchantment. So that's kind of a new archetype that we haven't really seen before. So be on the lookout for both artifacts and enchantments when you're drafting black-white. Then red-black, as usual, has a bit of a sacrifice theme. This time maybe less focused on sacrificing opposing creatures and a little bit more on sacrificing your own artifacts instead. So also has a lot of overlap with those artifact synergies. Next, green-white cares all about enchantments, and we will also see the saga enchantments reintroduced once again, so that those are enchantments that will eventually end up in the graveyard, although there's a bit of an interesting twist as we'll see, as most sagas will actually turn into creatures at the end of the third chapter, so that's a neat little spin on the sagas. And then blue-green finally is kind of the channel and ramp archetype, so generate a lot of mana, and then we'll see a bunch of cards in the set with the channel mechanic, meaning you can sometimes discard them at an often cheaper cost to get some sort of effect that's similar to what you would otherwise get for casting the card at the entire price, but uh, gives you a little bit more flexibility. So blue-green is also not one of the more defined archetypes, but generally cares about ramping and playing big expensive spells. So that's just a quick overview of all the two-color archetypes. And now we'll dive right into the multicolor cards of the set. Start out with Asari Captain, 5 mana for a 4-3, human samurai at uncommon has haste, and whenever a samurai or warrior you control attacks alone, it gets plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn for each samurai or warrior you control. So red-white, does promote you to sort of attack with one creature, but at the same time it might actually benefit you to have multiple creature tokens or other creatures with the warrior and samurai creature type. So it does both want you to go big with one creature as well as go wide, so there's a bit of tension there, but it is also reminiscent of the exalted mechanic for those that may remember that one. So uh, Sari Captain, certainly a decent card, if the opponent doesn't have any blockers out, can get in there and also triggers uh, off itself being a samurai. So yeah, the Asari Captain gets a B grade for me and uh, a solid way to kind of guide you towards a red-white. Next up we've got the Colossal Sky Turtle, 7 mana for a 6-5 turtle and it's also an enchantment creature at Uncommon. So as you'll notice there's going to be quite a few enchantment creatures in the set which has a lot of different applications between the black-white archetype caring about controlling enchantments and uh, of course a whole bunch of graveyard recursion that might get enchantments back and removal spells that can maybe tag enchantments whereas otherwise they would not be able to. So there's quite a few cards that care about enchantments 
And the Sky Turtle is certainly a very powerful one as a 6-5 flyer with a ward 2. So if the opponent wants to target it with a removal spell, they have to pay 2 additional mana. Otherwise their spell gets countered. And this is also our first example of a card with the channel mechanic. So we can channel at instant speed. So we can pay 3 mana at any point. We could cast an instant to discard the Colossal Sky Turtle and return target card from our graveyard to our hand. Or we could use the blue channel ability for 2 mana and return target creature to its owner's hand instead. So the Sky Turtle offers a ton of flexibility. You could kind of see it as a three-way split card of a seven mana creature, a three mana get a card back or two mana bounce a card. So just a ton of flexibility. Plus, as we mentioned, if we maybe pick up ways of returning enchantments from our graveyard to our hand, we could use a channel early and then later still get access to the seven mana turtle. So just offers a ton of flexibility and uh, I'm very high on the turtle. B for me. Next up, Iganjo Uprising, a red-white rare. It's a sorcery for X, a red and a white. Creates X, 2-2 two, two white samurai creature tokens with vigilance. They also gain menace and haste until end of turn. And then each opponent creates X, minus 1, 2-2 two, two white samurai creature tokens with vigilance. So we never like it when our cards give the opponent some sort of advantage. Now that being said, we do get more tokens than the opponent. We could technically cast this for x equals 1 and then we get one token, the opponent doesn't get any, although at that point it's not a very exciting card. But it could help you maybe deal those last couple points of damage thanks to your tokens gaining haste and menace when they enter the battlefield. So Uprising is kind of this weird flexible card that could be cast early or could maybe be a finisher in the late game, of course also making lots of samurai tokens can maybe help with certain abilities that care about controlling lots of samurai. So there is still quite a bit of flexibility, even though at a base level I'm not in love with uh, giving the opponent a ton of tokens as well. So Iganjo Uprising is a tricky card to evaluate. I'm going to start out with a conservative C grade, but this is the type of card I could easily be off and uh, might end up being better than it reads. But uh, I'll start out with a conservative C. Next is the Enthusiastic Mechanaut, a 2-mana, two 2-2 two -two artifact creature, Goblin Artificer. So, as same as we have lots of enchantment creatures, we also have lots of artifact creatures in the set, which also has a ton of uh, different meanings and uh, applications. This one, a 2-2 two -two flyer, saying artifact spells we cast cost 1 generic mana less to cast. So, if you're in the blue-red archetype, presumably you've got lots of artifacts, both the red artifact creatures and the blue artifact creatures will get a nice discount. And then of course we've got a bunch of colorless artifacts as well. So in a very focused artifact deck, the Mechanaut could be amazing and could easily get a B. Also just a 2 mana 2 to flyers already quite good. So getting that discount on top makes the Mechanaut pretty awesome and also very good in multiples once you get one or two uh, Mechanauts out, then it becomes much easier to empty your hand. Also maybe plays well with card draw effects to refill your hand to make use of that discount. So all things to keep in mind. And next up we've got Gloom Shrieker, 3 mana for a 2-3 enchantment creature can't be set uncommon, has menace, and when it enters the battlefield, return target permanent card from your graveyard to your hand, and if Gloom Shrieker would die, exile it instead. So there's no like infinite recursion shenanigans that you can uh, make happen. But yeah, at a base level, Gloom Shrieker is still a nice 2 for 1. A 2 1 with menace for 3 minus, not amazing, but can maybe chip in there or maybe help you trade away or double block. And uh, Black Green, as we mentioned in the introduction, cares about. Graveyard Recursion, getting value from the graveyard, maybe has a few ways of milling cards into your graveyard, so the Gloom Shrieker might already have a target when you played on turn 3, as opposed to having to wait. Of course, a 2-1 with Menace, maybe not as good as, let's say, a Death Touch creature would have been. So, I'm still not super high on the Gloom Shrieker, even though it has the potential of being a 2-for-1. So I think I'm going to end up more on a C+, as opposed to maybe a B that we've given to a lot of the other uncommons so far. Next is a Grease Fang, Okiba Boss, a 3 mana, 4 3 legendary rat pilot at rare, saying at the beginning of combat on your turn, return target vehicle card from your graveyard to the battlefield, it gains haste, and return it to its owner's hand at the beginning of the next end step. 
So a bit of a strange card, of course, a 4-3 for 3 mana, already a pretty good deal. So it has a nice upside on top of that, so we can be too picky. Um, Black-white does care about artifacts and enchantments, so vehicles, of course, are going to be artifacts. And uh, yeah, we also have quite a bit of graveyard recursion happening in black-white. So it does play with that theme as well. But uh, yeah, um, the Okiba boss is still kind of a weird card. You need to have a vehicle, you need to have a vehicle end up in your graveyard somehow, and then it doesn't even stay in play. So while the ability is nice, I wouldn't count on the ability too much. So we're mostly looking at a 4-3, 4-3 with slight upside, which, you know, still good, but probably not more than a B grade. Next we have our first enchantment saga. The Hidetsugu consumes all, 3 mana, black red, mythic rare enchantment saga in fact, on the first chapter. So when it enters the battlefield, it destroys each non-land permanent with mana value 1 or less. Now, non-land permanents with mana value 1 or less, there's not going to be too many of those, but it does of course mean it destroys tokens, which generally have mana value of 0. So a nice way to deal with all tokens. Then on the second chapter, which means after your draw step at the beginning of your first main phase, it will go to chapter 2 and trigger the Exile All Graveyards ability, which in black red is mostly going to punish opposing strategies that rely on the graveyard, like maybe black white or black green. So but black red itself doesn't have a major graveyard recursion theme. So it should usually be an upside to exile all graveyards. And then on the third and final chapter, we exile the saga and return it to the battlefield transformed under our control. So that does mean that once it does transform into Vessel of the All-Consuming, it is going to still have Summoning Sickness because it got exiled, so it didn't stay uh, in play under our control continuously. But we do get a 3-3 Enchantment Creature Ogre Shaman with Trample. And then it says when the Vessel deals damage, put a plus one plus one counter on it, and whenever the vessel deals damage to a player, if it has dealt 10 or more damage to that player this turn, they lose the game. So it's going to be pretty difficult to trigger that alternate win condition, would have to enhance it with an equipment or an aura somehow, otherwise that's probably not happening. But uh, yeah, at a base level, it's still 3 mana for eventually a 3-3 Trampler that can pick up some plus one counters. So if we can give it some evasion, it uh, does get quite a bit better. And uh, yeah, still not one of the best mythics I've ever seen. So I think I land somewhere on a C plus. The main thing that's going to keep me from giving these sagas too high of a grade is that it does take a long time for you to get that creature eventually. Let's say you top deck the uh, consumes all saga and you have to play it, there's no one mana or less permanence in play, then on the next turn exile all graveyards, who cares, and then it's another turn before it transforms into a creature which can't even attack right away. So you know, it does take a while, but maybe it all still ends up to a C+. Next is Hinata, Dawn crowned a 4 mana 4-4 four four legendary Kirin spirit at rare, so nice callback to the original Kamigawa where there were a ton of Kirins, and this has Flying and Trample, so 4-4 four, four Flying Trample for 4 is a pretty decent deal, but of course we do have to jump through the hoop of having all three colors, which as I mentioned at the start is not going to be trivial, I think most decks are still going to be two color decks. But then we get a nice little ability on top saying spells we cast cost 1 generic mana less to cast for each target, so spot removal becomes a bit cheaper, and spells your opponents cast cost 1 generic mana more to cast for each target, so opposing spot removal gets a bit more expensive. So overall, a decent card. If it was just a two-color card, it would maybe even get up to an A grade. Given that we do have to play three colors to support Hinata, meaning it's unlikely for us to play it on turn four on curve, it does take away a few points. So I'm still going to go with a C plus on Hinata overall. But uh, if your deck can support three colors, then it's definitely a slam dunk. Next is Invigorating Hot Spring, a 3-mana enchantment at Uncommon. 
saying the spring enters the battlefield with 4 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it. Then it says modified creatures you control have haste, so this is the first instance of modified we encountered. So just to reiterate, equipments, auras we control and counters are modifications. So if your creature has an equipment attached to it, an aura attached to it, or a counter of any kind, so that also includes plus one counters, they are considered as modified creatures. And then we can remove a plus one plus one counter from invigorating hot spring to put a plus one plus one counter on target creature we control, can only use it as a sorcery and only once each turn. So this card is very reminiscent of the three mana Gruel Enchantment from uh, Ravnica, which I'm kind of blanking on right now. I'll pull up the card in a post. But that made you choose between giving your creature um, a plus one counter or giving it haste. Whereas this time we can potentially do both because we play creature, give it a plus one counter right away, and it gains haste thanks to modified creatures we control having haste. So I remember that card being pretty reasonable in the uh, Ravnica set, and while we do have only four uses of the plus one counter, usually that's enough to get your value, and the game's probably going to be decided by the time you remove the last counter. Plus, we could even uh, put more than one counter on the same creature if we don't have more creatures to play out, so it does have quite a bit of flexibility over Rhythm of the Wild, which is a card I was referencing. So I think this card's better, and Rhythm was already a playable card for sure. So I think this easily gets a B, also because it helps you enable other modified synergies in your deck um, as just an easy way to give your creatures plus one counters. So yeah, Hot Spring seems like a great kind of entry point for the red-green modified deck, as long as you have some nice beefy creatures to play afterwards. Next is Ishin, two heavens as one, a three mana, three four legendary human samurai at rare, although it is three colors, so the Mardu colors, and if a creature attacking causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. Now we haven't seen a ton of these samurais and warriors yet that trigger when a, a warrior or samurai attacks, but we did see the red white uncommon already. So this card sort of plays into that theme, wants you to have plenty of Samurais and Warriors with certain abilities that you can then trigger multiple times. So in theory this card is amazing, 3 mana, 3-4, three, it's very, very efficient, plus a potentially very powerful ability on top. But of course, 3 colors, not that easy to support, especially in a more aggressive deck that wants to have a low curve, potentially play lots of cheap creatures early, doesn't want to mess around too much with tap lands and having to fetch up your lands, etc. So that makes this pretty difficult to cast on turn 3, so this is more like maybe you play it in the late game if you're splashing a third color in your aggressive red-white deck. So again, maybe a great card for Constructed, but from a limited perspective, I'm hesitant to build too much around a three-color card. So while Ishin is powerful, I would still lean more towards a conservative C rating. So I wouldn't necessarily want to first pick it and build a deck around it. But if you're already two of the three colors, you get it relatively late. And then maybe you pick up some mana fixing, you can make it happen. Next is Jukai, a naturalist, 2 mana for a 2 to enchantment creature, human monk, and uncommon, has lifelink, and says enchantment spells you cast cost 1 generic mana, less to cast. So perfect for the green white enchantments deck, where there's plenty of enchantment creatures that get a discount, as well as sagas, and then a 2 2 lifelink for 2, also a totally reasonable card in and of itself. It's an easy B for the naturalist. And then we get our first Planeswalker, Kaito Shizuki, 3 mana for a 3 loyalty legendary Planeswalker, with a passive ability saying at the beginning of your end step, if Kaito entered the battlefield this turn, he phases out. So phasing out means it's gonna basically cease to exist for a brief moment, and then it's gonna phase back in at the beginning of our next upkeep, I believe. So... 
Kaito is going to be basically unkillable as he's phased out, which means that we can play him, activate maybe the minus two, and then be guaranteed to untap with it so you can start using the plus one ability afterwards. Then the minus two creates a 1-1 one, one blue ninja creature token, and it says this creature cannot be blocked, so perfect for enabling your ninjutsu synergies potentially, even though I guess you would lose the token in the process but also very good at enabling the plus one ability, which says draw a card and then discard a card unless you've attacked this turn. So the usual play pattern is going to be play Kaito, use the minus two, Kaito phases out, phases back in, and then we can use the plus one ability on the following turn to draw a card after attacking with our 1-1 token. And uh, yeah, then we still have a Planeswalker in play that the opponent will have to deal with. So... Overall, seems like a pretty good deal. And then if we somehow get to the minus seven ultimate, we get an emblem saying whenever a creature we control deals combat damage to a player, search our library for a blue or black creature card and put it onto the battlefield and then shuffle. So realistically, we're not going to get to the minus seven, but we're still happy making maybe one or two ninja tokens and drawing a few extra cards in the process. So yeah, Kaito seems like a pretty good card and gets an A rating from me a bomb, but maybe not quite in the S tier. Next is the Kami War, a 6 mana, 5 color, Mythic Rare Enchantment Saga, that on the first chapter, Exiles target a non-land permanent and opponent controls, so we get to remove something right away. On chapter 2, we get to return up to 1 author, target non-land permanent to its owner's hand, each opponent discards a card, and then on the final chapter, we get to transform it, into Okagachi Made Manifest. So a 6-6 Flying Trampler has all colors, and when the Made Manifest attacks, defending player chooses a non-land card in your graveyard to return that card to your hand. It gets plus X plus 7 to end of turn, where X is the mana value of that card. So just a ton of awesome abilities. Yeah, I mean, if you can cast this card, then it's probably going to win you the game. I'm not uh, going to dispute that. Of course, the problem is casting it in the first place. While there is a little bit of mana fixing in the set, there is a cycle of dual lands at common, and there's a few artifacts that can maybe help you fix your mana. It's still going to be quite the challenge to get all five colors in uh, play in a realistic time frame. So that's kind of the main thing that's potentially holding this card back. Now, am I going to open this card in a pack and try and draft around it? Probably, but it's probably more for entertainment value as opposed to it actually being the correct strategy. So probably you can give the Kami War more than a C grade, but hopefully I'm proven wrong and five color decks are easier to assemble than I think. And then this is going to be a slam dunk first pick that you want to draft around and get as much mana fixing as possible. Next up, we've got Kotose, the Silent Spider, a 5-mana 4-4 legendary human ninja at rare. And when Kotose enters the battlefield, exile target card, author then a basic land from an opponent's graveyard. You get to search that player's graveyard, hand, and library for any number of cards with the same name as that card and exile them. That player shuffles, and for as long as we control this creature, we can play one of the exiled cards and spend mana as 34 mana of any color to cast it. Let's assume the opponent only has one copy of that card in their graveyard or in their deck. Then we're basically dealing with a 5-mana 4-4, enters, exiles the cards from the opponent's graveyard, and then we can eventually cast that card. So a nice 2-for-1 on a 4-4 body seems like a good deal. The extra clause of exiling multiple copies might be more relevant in Constructed, so maybe this is some sort of hate card for opposing combo decks. But uh, yeah, still a good deal, a nice two for one. So I'm happy giving this a B. Naomi, Pillar of Order, a five mana, four four legendary human advisor and uncommon. And when Naomi enters the battlefield or attacks, if we control an artifact and an enchantment, create a two two white samurai creature token with vigilance. All right, so this highlights the main mechanic of black white nicely, which is. It cares about controlling both artifacts and enchantments at the same time. And uh, Naomi is a pretty good payoff. A 4-4 that makes a 2-2 token when it enters for 5 mana. That's very good stats. And then hopefully we can get an attack or two in with Naomi 
to make some more tokens, and then Black White also color that might have some graveyard recursion to get Naomi back, make more tokens, and try to grind the opponent out. So Naomi gets a B and a nice kind of uh, incentive to go Black White and try and assemble those artifacts and enchantments. Oni Cult Anvil is the Black Red signpost uncommon. It's an artifact saying when whenever one or more artifacts you control leave the battlefield during your turn, create a 1-1 colorless construct artifact creature token. This ability triggers only once each turn. And then we can also tap and sacrifice an artifact, and then the anvil deals one damage to each opponent and we gain one life. So the anvil is, I think, deceptively powerful, just because it kind of fuels itself. The token it generates is an artifact token, which means we can sacrifice that same token on the following turn maybe to sacrifice it, drain the opponent for one, and then get another token. Now, important to point out is that it only generates a token if it happens in our turn, um, when um, an artifact leaves the battlefield. So we can't, like, chum block with our token, sacrifice it, and still get a replacement token. So it's not quite that powerful. But still, you know, an anvil that, you know, generates a few tokens, and eventually we can start draining the opponent for one every turn. Seems like something pretty powerful. And it can also potentially enable certain cards that care about artifacts entering the battlefield, as it can make a 1-1 artifact token every turn. So, yeah, I think I like the Anvil quite a bit, and seems like a good incentive for drafting Black Rat's Artifact Sacrifice, and gets a B. Next is the Prodigy's Prototype, a 3-mana, three 3-4 three, artifact vehicle at Uncommon. And whenever one or more vehicles we control attack, create a 1-1 one, one colorless pilot creature token, and this creature crews vehicles as though its power were two greater. So it can basically crew three, as it were, and the crew cost on a prototype is two. So a 3-4 vehicle that we don't even have to attack with the prototype itself to make that pilot token, it just says whenever one or more any vehicles attack, so if we already have a vehicle in play, we can maybe play the prototype and get a 1-1 token right away, which can then crew the prototype on the following turn, maybe. So, yeah, in a dedicated blue-white vehicles deck, prototype seems like a, a nice source of uh, board presence, which in a way is also a way of card advantage. So, prototype is good. Um, now, 3-4 is not enormous for a vehicle for 3 mana, We've definitely seen bigger vehicles at that mana cost in the past, and this set also has plenty of vehicles around the same size, even at lower rarity. So I'm hesitant that the prototype itself is going to be able to attack more than once. So don't expect it to generate a ton of pilot tokens, but it's mainly here to synergize with other vehicles that you might already have in play, maybe evasive vehicles that have flying. This would be a great combo with. So by itself, I'm still probably giving it a C+, plus, but it's the type of card that could be awesome if you pick up maybe one of those rare vehicles that's uh, easier to get in with and repeatedly generate pilot tokens. Next is Ryu Storm's Edge, a 4-mana 3-3 legendary human samurai at rare, has first strike, and whenever a samurai or warrior you control attacks alone, Untap it, and if it's the first combat phase of the turn, there is an additional combat phase after this. So, this stacks incredibly nicely with other cards that also care about a samurai or warrior attacking alone, as then your creature might pick up some power and toughness bonuses that also persist in the second attack step. So, it kind of gets even better on the second attack step. And uh, by itself, a 3 3 first strike for 4 is nothing to uh, scoff at, so. Yeah, Ryu seems awesome and might be a bomb level card and a great incentive for the red white samurai slash warrior deck. And just try and get as many of those effects that care about samurai or warrior attacking alone as possible. Next is Risona, a Sari commander, a 3 mana, 3 3 legendary human samurai at rare. So another nice red white rare here. It has haste, and when Risona deals combat damage to a player, if it doesn't have an indestructible counter on it, 
put an indestructible counter on it. And whenever combat damage is dealt to you, remove an indestructible counter from Rizona. So it's going to be incredibly difficult for the opponent to deal with if they are on the back foot, as it's going to be more difficult for them to sneak in a point of damage to remove that indestructible counter. And then, of course, Rizona can also benefit from those Samurai and Warrior benefits, can get in there right away. So it seems like an incredibly scary card to face, especially when uh, the person playing it is on the play and can get in there right away. And uh, also worth pointing out, the indestructible counter makes uh, Risona count as a modified creature, which could be relevant. Maybe if you've got some uh, red cards from the red-green archetype that overlap with it and might care about it. So yeah, Risona seems very strong and I think worthy of an A grade as well. Next is Satoru Umezawa, 3 mana, 2 4 legendary human ninja at rare, saying whenever you activate a ninjutsu ability, look at the top 3 cards of your library, put one of them into your hand, rest on the bottom, and this ability only triggers once each turn, and each creature card in our hand has a ninjutsu for 4 mana. So that's quite interesting. All of a sudden we can cheat all sorts of creatures into play for 4 mana. So for those that aren't familiar with the ninjutsu ability, it means that if an unblocked creature that's attacking uh, goes unblocked, so we declare attackers, opponent declares blockers, and one of our attacking creatures is uh, unopposed, then we can, in this case, pay 4 mana to put one of the creatures in our hand into play, tapped and attacking, by picking up one of the unblocked creatures. If we have like a 5 or 6 mana creature, it's a way to even get a nice discount. And not only do we get potentially a nice discount, but the creature's already in play tapped and attacking, so it's going to deal a nice chunk of damage. So Satoru plays incredibly well with any cheap evasive creatures that have flying or are unblockable in some way. And uh, at the same time, we're also you know, generating additional card advantage with the ability. And uh, it's not really a card that needs a ton of support, as long as your deck has some number of creatures. Ideally, they have some form of evasion. But yeah, as long as your deck has some number of creatures, Ume Umezawa kind of works by himself. So yeah, this card seems awesome and seems like a bomb level card. Next up is Satsuki, the Living Lore, a 2 mana, 1 3 legendary human druid at rare. We can tap to put a lore counter on each saga we control, can only activate it as a sorcery. So this is a nice way to speed up that very slow process of our sagas getting additional counters, and to, in most cases, eventually turn into a creature. So Satsuki seems like a great fit for that archetype. And when Satsuki dies, we get to choose up to one between returning target saga or enchantment creature we control to its owner's hand which is maybe a way to re-trigger some sort of saga that's powerful on the first chapter, perhaps. Or we can return target saga card from our graveyard to our hand, so we can maybe pick up a saga that's already gone all the way. So, yeah, two mana for a 1-3 with a ton of extra upside. Seems like a fun build around and gets a B grade from me. Next is Silver Fur Master, another ninjutsu creature. This one a 2 mana 2-2 two -two red ninja at uncommon. And here we kind of see the ninjutsu ability written out. So we can pay a blue and a black to return an unblocked attacker we control to our hand and put this card onto the battlefield from our hand tapped and attacking. So we don't really get a discount in this case, but of course there's more. The Silver for Master says ninjutsu abilities we activate cost 1 generic mana less to activate. That's not relevant if you have more copies of the Silver for Master, but could certainly be relevant on other ninjutsu cards that have a generic mana cost. And then other ninja and rogue creatures we control get plus 1 plus 1. So that's the part that makes ninjutsu so powerful on the Silver for Master, because if you control multiple rogues or ninjas, all of a sudden they might get a plus one plus one bonus that the opponent wasn't expecting, and that could maybe blow them out in the middle of combat. So when you're facing a blue-black ninja ninjutsu deck, always be mindful of the silver for master potentially swooping in and pumping all ninjas and rogues. So master gets a B and seems like a great build around for the ninja deck. 
Next is Spirit Sister's Call, a 5 mana mythic rare enchantment in black white. Saying at the beginning of your end step, choose target permanent card in your graveyard. You may sacrifice a permanent that shares a card type with the chosen card. If you do, return the chosen card from your graveyard to the battlefield, and then it gains if this permanent would leave the battlefield, exile it instead of putting it anywhere else. So a very interesting, grindy, recursive engine that um, takes a second to kind of wrap your head around, but it would play very well with any sort of permanence with good enter the battlefield abilities, be it maybe creatures or enchantments or artifacts. And black-white is a color pair that cares about controlling both artifacts and enchantments. And as we mentioned, the set has lots of enchantment creatures, lots of artifact creatures. So there's quite a bit of overlap, meaning that it's going to be easier to control multiple permanents with the same types, both in play and in your graveyard, to kind of switch around and generate a ton of value. So this is a slow card, but uh, in the right deck, assuming you've got a ton of permanents with sweet enter the battlefield abilities, hopefully some of which are on the cheaper end of the spectrum, some may be more expensive, so you can sacrifice your cheaper things to get something expensive back. That's kind of a perfect home for Spirit Sister's Call. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty hopeful that this is going to be a powerful engine card that's going to be hard to beat once Black White can slow down the game and get it to a board stall. This certainly should be able to take over. So I'm going to give this an A, bomb level card, and I'm certainly interested in building a deck around it. Next up we have Tamyo, Completed Sage. So the return of Phyrexian mana. So this is either 5 mana or 4 mana, and we can pay 2 life to cast it. Although if we cast it using the 2 life method, it's going to come into play with 2 fewer loyalty, so 3 as opposed to 5. Then we have a plus 1 ability to tap up to 1 target artifact or creature, and it doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. So a nice defensive ability. We can use a minus X to exile target a null and permanent card with mana value X from our graveyard and create a token that's a copy of that card. So a weird way of generating card advantage. And then the minus seven, which is quite achievable, especially if we play Tamiya for five mana. We create a Tamiya's Notebook, which is a legendary Corlos artifact token saying spells we cast cost two generic mana less to cast. And we can also tap it to draw a card. So I think Tamiyo is all about trying to protect her, use Tamiyo maybe at 5 mana, start using the plus 1 to protect her, and then try and get to the minus 7 as quickly as possible. I don't think the minus X is all that relevant, but I guess it's just pure upside. So yeah, if we can get that minus 7 Tamiyo's notebook, it's going to be very difficult to... Uh, lose any grindy game thanks to all the card advantage and mana advantage it provides. But of course it is still an artifact token, it's not an emblem, so the opponent could still potentially interact with your artifact, also worth uh, to keep in mind. But I think Tamiya is still an S tier card in the sense that it's a planeswalker which is already difficult to interact with, it protects itself with a plus one, and it's not that difficult to get to the minus 7, assuming you played any sort of creature beforehand. So, seems like a very difficult card for the opponent to interact with, especially if the board's already somewhat stalled. Our first white card, Ancestral Katana, a 2-mana artifact equipment at common, saying whenever a samurai or warrior you control attacks alone, you may pay 1 mana to attach the katana to it, giving plus 2 plus 1, Otherwise, the equip cost is 3. So for equipping the katana for 3 mana, we're kind of overpaying for it in a way, since plus 2 plus 1 for a 5 mana investment at first is a pretty steep. But if we can consistently move it for 1 mana, then it becomes much more interesting, and definitely a card I would want at least one copy of in my red-white warriors deck. So... Katana also plays well with any double strike creatures you might have, uh, which there's going to be at least one of that we'll cover in just a second here. So I think Katana is certainly a playable card, um, but probably a card you should be able to pick up relatively late in the pack, assuming you're interested in it. So I think a C grade is reasonable, 
but uh, just be mindful of not including too many copies since of course your equipment do need creatures to go with it next up we have a very powerful card right off the bat here Ao the dawn sky one of the legendary dragon spirits in the set so they're all mythic one in each color this one five mana for a five four flyer with vigilance and when the Dawn Sky dies, we get to choose one of two different modes. Either look at the top seven cards of our library, putting any number of non-land permanent cards with total mana value four or less from among them onto the battlefield. Or we can put two plus one plus one counters on each permanent we control, that's a creature or vehicle. I'm assuming we're usually going to choose the second mode unless we don't have any board presence whatsoever. But either way, a 5 mana 5-4 five, Flying Vigilance is a must-answer card that will kill the opponent in a couple attacks. And then even if the opponent does have an answer, for the most part we're going to get to trigger the Dice ability, unless that answer somehow removes the Dawn Sky some other way, maybe an enchantment that keeps it locked down, although in that case we could still maybe free it, or an Exile removal spell, although there's very few of those in the set. So... For the most part, we're going to get our value, and uh, this seems like an easy S-tier level card. And spoiler alert, I think I probably gave all the mythic dragon spirits an S-grade. Banishing Slash, a 2-mana uncommon sorcery, saying destroy up to one target artifact, enchantment, or tapped creature. Then if we control an artifact and an enchantment, we also get to make a 2-2 white samurai creature token with vigilance. Now... This card would already be good even if it didn't make that additional token, especially in a set that is filled with artifacts and enchantments. Keep in mind it is a sorcery, so it's not like you can kill an attacking creature at instant speed, so it does have a slight limitation. But as far as removal goes, this seems like an awesome one. The flexibility of hitting artifacts and enchantments and creatures of any kind, and then especially if you're kind of the black-white artifact enchantment deck, this uh, might be able to make a 2-2 token as well, at which point this is just an awesome rate. So I think this is a B-grade card, with the potential of being even better in the right deck. Next is Befriending the Moths, a 4-mana common enchantment saga, which on the first two chapters says target creature you control gets plus 1 plus 1 and gains flying until end of turn and on the final chapter transforms into a 2-4 Flyer Imperial Moth. A 2-4 Flyer for 4 is generally a decent deal, although in this case we do have to wait multiple turns for it, and it's not going to be able to attack right away. But in the meantime we do get that plus 1 plus 1 and flying bonus to maybe chip in. So in a very aggressive deck, I could see this being reasonable, especially if we can curve out and have a couple creatures in play already that can make use of that plus one plus one and flying bonus and then we eventually get a 2-4 that can block so we can maybe still you know attack with our other creatures have something back to protect our life total and then another evasive creature that can also start attacking so while it is slow the total you know power and toughness combined seems like a reasonable deal still Probably not a very high pick, but uh, at the very least seems like a C playable card. Next is Blade Blizzard Kitsune, a 3 mana 2-2 two -two uncommon fox ninja. And it has double strike, so as I mentioned earlier, equipment play very well with double strike. Although, strangely enough, this is not a warrior or samurai, so it doesn't necessarily play with the katana too much. But it does have ninjutsu, so even though ninjutsu is primarily a blue-black ability, there are a couple ninjas in other colors as well. It's maybe not the best deal with ninjutsu in terms of mana efficiency, as we're paying more for ninjutsu than we are for the normal cost, but it does mean that we get to basically deal 4 damage right away at the very least. So it does have that going for it. So yeah, this card seems good especially if we have ways to enhance its power, which white usually doesn't struggle with. So I think uh, I'm happy giving this a relatively high grade, maybe not quite a B, 
just because of the weirdness of it being a ninja and not a samurai or a warrior, in which case it would probably get a B grade, but at the very least a C plus. Next is Born to Drive, a 3 mana enchantment aura at Uncommon, and I actually want to start by reading the channel ability first, because I think that's the mode that's going to be used most often. So for 3 mana we can discard Born to Drive, and we can once again do this anytime we could cast an instant, to create two 1-1 one, one colorless pilot creature tokens, saying this creature crews vehicles as though its power were too greater, so they can essentially crew three, even though they're just one ones. Yeah, the fact that it's a channel ability also means it cannot be countered in any way. This is going to be at its best in presumably the blue-eyed vehicles archetype, where having those pilot tokens means we have uh, an easier way of crewing some of the more expensive vehicles. If we read the actual enchantment aura, it enchants an artifact or a creature, and then as long as enchanted permanent is a creature, it gets plus one plus one for each creature and or vehicle we control. But I think for the most part we're going to be using the channel ability on this one. And yeah, that ability seems pretty good, being able to potentially ambush like a one toughness creature from the opponent that's attacking and still have a 1-1 one, one token left over. Sounds like a good deal. So yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy with Born to Drive at C+. A solid card, and just don't focus too much on the aura, but mainly look at the channel ability for this one. Next is Brilliant Restoration, a 7 mana, including quadruple white, rare sorcery, saying return all artifacts and enchantment cards from your graveyard to the battlefield. It's a very expensive card, it's also a very big commitment to white, but in a set that's filled to the brim with sagas, enchantment creatures, artifact creatures, and other vehicles that are artifacts, this card could generate quite a bit of value, especially if your deck also happens to have some self-mill of any way. You have to be pretty dedicated to the whole artifact and enchantment theme, but I'm guessing in like a black-white artifact enchantment deck, and maybe green-white, that also cares a lot about enchantments and maybe has a few more self-mill effects. Brilliant Restoration should be quite awesome. Uh, maybe even in blue-white, where there's a ton of vehicles. So, expensive, not that easy to cast, and it does require a bit of setup. But in the late game, this should be a game winner in the right deck. So overall, I think I'm going to end up on a B for Brilliant Restoration. Powerful card, just be mindful that you meet all its different requirements. Also good with channel if you've got cards that are also enchantments, creatures, that's also a good point. Next is Cloudsteel Kirin, 3 mana for a 3-2 artifact creature, Equipment Kirin at rare. So this is the first instance of a reconfigure. So let's ignore the whole equipment and reconfigure part of it. So it's a 3 mana, 3-2 three, flyer. And it's an artifact creature, so pretty decent rates for 3 mana, get a nice evasive creature. But then it also happens to be this weird equipment, and we can reconfigure it for 5 mana, meaning we pay 5 mana to attach to a target creature we control, or we can unattach it from that creature by paying the reconfigure cost once again. We can only do it at sorcery speed, and while this is attached to a creature, instead of being a 3-2 creature, it ceases to be a creature and instead is just an equipment artifact saying equipped creature has flying and says you cannot lose the game and your opponents cannot win the game. So kind of like a platinum angel. So if you can somehow combine this with hexproof, it's going to be very hard for the opponent to win. I've looked ahead in the set and I think there's one instance of a creature that permanently has hexproof as long as it's untapped, although it's a pretty expensive artifact creature. Of course there are still ways to destroy artifacts, so the opponent could just get rid of the equipment itself. Yeah, let's ignore that for a second. So a 3 mana 3 2 flyer that in a pinch can kind of switch the race around, give one of your creatures flying and make it so they have to basically kill every creature that this is equipped onto, or kill the equipment itself, otherwise they simply won't be able to win the game. So this seems like a huge headache for the opponent, especially if your deck is capable of producing multiple creatures that you can keep equipping the Kirin onto. 
I guess it's worth noting that if the opponent does get you to a negative life total, they could kill your uh, Kirin at a later point and still win the game. So you do have to be a little bit careful there, but it still seems like an awesome card. Just good at 3 mana and has this ability to make it very difficult for the opponent to ever win the game. Next we have a Dragonfly Suit, a 3 mana, 3-2 three artifact vehicle at common has flying and crew cost of 1. So 3-2, crew cost of 1, flyer, does seem like pretty good stats. Of course, we have to be mindful when playing vehicles that we don't fill our deck with only vehicles and then have no way of crewing them. This one's very easy to crew, so any creature with any power can tap to turn this into a creature until end of turn. And then a 3-2 flyer for 3, as we saw with the Kirin, is a pretty good rate. So yeah, I like the Dragonfly suit for a dedicated vehicle deck, like maybe blue-white, where we just want to have as many vehicles and vehicle synergies as possible, but also a card that we should be able to get pretty late, so it doesn't get more than a C. Then Iganjo Exemplar, a 2-mana, two 2-1 two enchantment creature human samurai, saying whenever a samurai or warrior you control attacks alone, it gets plus one plus one until end of turn. This fills multiple roles. It's a samurai for the red-white samurai and warrior deck, giving a nice plus one plus one bonus. It's also an enchantment for the black-white enchantment and artifact matters deck. Also an enchantment for the green-white enchantment deck, possibly. It's a two-drop to fill out your curve. So it may seem unassuming, but it's, I think, a card that's going to fit into a lot of different archetypes, making it a lot more valuable than it might appear at first glance. And uh, yeah, I think the Exemplar gets a C plus for me. Solid role player. Next is Era of Enlightenment, a two-mana common saga. On the first chapter we get to Scry 2. On the second chapter we gain two life. And on the final chapter, transforms into Hands of Enlightenment, a 2-2 creature, enchantment creature of course, with First Strike. 2-2 First Strike, a pretty decent blocker. We do have to wait for it quite a while, but Scry 2 and Gain 2 Life in the meantime helps us stay alive, maybe find more answers. So even if we top deck this in the late game, we still get kind of that immediate value of the Scry 2 to dig towards our next card. And if we play it on turn 2, then uh, the 2-2 first strike should still be relevant by the time we get it, hopefully. So, yeah, Arrow of Enlightenment seems fine. Probably still only a C, but might go up in value in, let's say, the green-white enchantment deck or the black-white artifact enchantment deck, which care more about the card type. Next is the Fall of Lord Konda. A 3-mana uncommon enchantment saga. On chapter 1 we exile target creature an opponent controls with mana value 4 or greater. On the second chapter each player gains control of all permanents they own. That one's probably not going to be all that relevant. And then on the final chapter transforms into Fragment of Konda, a 1-3 enchantment creature with Defender, saying when Fragment of Konda dies, draw a card. So a 1-3 that eventually draws a card seems like a reasonable deal, especially because we're mainly playing this for the first chapter anyway, to exile target creature and opponent controls with mana value 4 or greater. Probably not a card you want to play a million copies of, because the opponent's only going to have so many expensive cards for us to exile, but still happy with at least the first two copies, let's say, and uh, gets a B as a removal spell that eventually draws a card in a convoluted way. Next is Farewell, a 6-mana rare sorcery. And it's a powerful one, letting us choose one or more between exiling all artifacts, exiling all creatures, all enchantments, or all graveyards. So we could conceivably choose all four modes if we really want to reset the board, only leaving, I guess, Planeswalkers in play. The fact that this is a very modal card kind of lets you pick your spots and potentially surgically remove all the opponent's stuff while keeping your stuff in play, especially once enchantment creatures and artifact creatures are involved. 
As far as sweepers go, this is a very good one and gets an A. Six mana is a little expensive, but still very powerful. Next we get our first legendary enchantment creature, Shrine. So important to point out, Shrine is not a creature type, but it's a an enchantment type, which is a little confusing at first. But I'm uh, not sure if that's going to be all too relevant. So 4 mana for a 1-3. It's an enchantment. It's a creature. It's a shrine. It has vigilance. And it says at the beginning of your end step, you may pay 1 mana. If you do, create a 1-1 one, one colorless spirit creature token for each shrine you control. So as most shrines, they want you to control as many of them as possible. Which does push you towards potentially 5 colors. Now... You don't necessarily have to be five colors to make the shrines playable, even if you maybe play two colors or two colors with a splash and manage to get a couple of them. They're going to get quite a bit better if you can assemble multiples. But even by itself, let's evaluate this. A 1-3 with Vigilance, so not the best rate there, but we can essentially pay one mana every turn to make a 1-1 token. Now... While it is a spirit, it's not a flying spirit that we might be used to from previous sets, so that's a huge distinction, because a 1-1 one -one flyer is miles better than a normal 1-1 one -one token. But uh, still, making a 1-1 one -one token every turn gives you a chum blocker, maybe eventually helps you go wide. So it's a nice mana sink to have access to, and uh, enchantment also relevant type to have in white, and hopefully you can assemble more than one shrine to really get it going. So I think C plus is appropriate for this shrine in particular. Next is Golden Tail Disciple, a 3 mana to 3 enchantment creature, Fox Monk, and it has a lifelink. So nothing too special about this, just a good playable card that can uh, fill your curve nicely in a variety of decks. Gets a C. Hotshot Mechanic is 1 mana for a 2-1 artifact creature, Fox Pilot at Uncommon, saying the mechanic cruise vehicles as though its power were 2 greater, so essentially has crew 4, which is not bad for 1-drop, so can play it early, get in some damage, and then the problem sometimes when you play too many cheap creatures is that they don't really accomplish much in the late game, but assuming your deck has a number of vehicles, this will still do a very good job of even crewing the most expensive vehicles, which is a good use for your one drop that maybe got two or four damage in. So yeah, the mechanic seems decent, gets a C plus. Also an artifact creature, which is a relevant type. And next is Imperial Oath, six mana for a common sorcery, creating three two two white samurai creature tokens with vigilance, and we get to scry three. Don't underestimate Scry 3 when you already have 6 mana, which is the point in the game typically when you don't want to draw lands. So any land you bottom with a Scry 3 almost feels like drawing a card. So, of course it is 6 mana, so it's not a card you want to include too many copies of. But as far as curve toppers go in your red-white uh, samurai and warrior deck, this seems like a pretty good one. And uh, especially if you have cards that care about controlling multiple warriors and samurai at the same time, then uh, Imperial Oath will fit the bill and maybe eventually help you go wide to deal those last points of damage. Now that being said, it's not a card that a ton of decks are going to want, like the black-white artifact enchantment deck doesn't really care about this too much, so it's still pretty narrow and expensive that I think a C is fine, you should be able to get this pretty late if you want it. Next is Imperial Recovery Unit, a 3-mana, three 3-4 three, uncommon vehicle, saying when the Recovery Unit attacks, return target creature or vehicle card with mana value 2 or less from your graveyard to your hand. And the crew cost is 2, so pretty cheap crew cost. A 3-4 three, for four, 3, reasonable rate for a vehicle, but nothing too exceptional. But uh, yeah, the ability to return stuff from the graveyard is always nice. So recover unit seems like a C plus as well, just a good above average vehicle. Next is Imperial Subduer, a 3 mana, 3-2 three, human samurai at common, and when 
a samurai or warrior you control attacks alone, tap target creature you don't control. So this seems awesome for the aggressive red-white samurai and warrior deck, especially if you can get multiple copies in play. Seems like a nightmare for the opponent to ever block. And uh, yeah, if you can attack with one big samurai or warrior, maybe tap one blocker down, maybe you've got another effect that gives it plus one plus one, you can quickly see how those start adding up, and then 3 mana 3-2 three is still a decent rate. So this seems like one of the better commons in white, especially for the red-white samurai and warrior deck, but even outside of it it's still okay. So I think C plus for this one. Next, Intercessor's Arrest. 3 mana enchantment aura at common, saying it enchants a permanent, which cannot attack, block, or crew vehicles, and its activated abilities cannot be activated unless their mana abilities. So pretty much the same as Bounding Gold from Kaldheim, which was also the same from the Enchantment Aura in Kaladesh, I believe. So an effect we've seen a few times in the past, and it's always pretty decent. That clause of preventing the crewing of vehicles is especially relevant here, where there's even more vehicles than there were in Kaldheim. Expect this to be one of the best commons in white, and uh, I'm gonna give it a B. And looking at my spreadsheets, I don't have any commons over it, so this is officially my best white common, at least starting out. We'll see how it performs, but being an enchantment has a few implications here. Um, it does mean that the opponent might be more likely to remove it, because main deck enchantment removal is going to be more common, but it might also imply that it can improve some other cards in your deck that care about controlling enchantments. As far as 3 mana removal spells in white, you're not going to get much better, so B for a rest. Next is Invoke Justice, 5 mana for a rare sorcery, although this quadruple white, returning target permanent card from your graveyard to the battlefield, and then distribute 4 plus 1 plus 1 counters among any number of creatures and or vehicles target player controls. The fact that this has two separate targets is actually good, because that means that if the opponent somehow removes the permanent from your graveyard at instant speed, you still get the counters, because there's two separate targets. So it's a nice uh, safety measure. And uh, for 5 mana, this seems like an awesome deal. Getting something back, and getting 4 counters on top. And you can even distribute them however you want, seems incredibly powerful. Of course, the mana cost is somewhat prohibitive, so don't necessarily expect to cast this on turn 5 on curve. But if your deck is primarily white, then you should still be able to cast this in a timely fashion. And uh, if you do, it's certainly going to have an impact, so I think this is a bomb, an A. Next is Kitsune Ace, aka Star Fox, a 2 mana 2-2 two -two fox pilot at common. And whenever a vehicle you control attacks, we can either untap the ace, or the vehicle gains first strike until end of turn. So this can apply to multiple vehicles, if you can attack with multiple vehicles at once, and I think mainly the first strike ability is going to be the relevant one. So yeah, as far as two drops go, especially in the blue-white vehicle deck, the ace seems like a very good one, and I remember Gearshift Ace from uh, Kaladesh, the 2-1, that's can potentially give vehicles first strike. Of course, that one had built-in first strike, whereas this is just a 2-2, so maybe not quite as good. Although, as we'll see, there are a few ways in the set to punish one toughness creature, so the second point of toughness is actually quite relevant as well. So I like a C plus for the ace, although the only deck that really wants it is probably going to be the blue-white vehicle deck, although it's going to be in pretty high demand there and potentially like a black-white artifact enchantment deck might have a couple vehicles as well, in which case the ace becomes much more interesting. And then Soul of Kamigawa, a 4-mana 3-3 three, three legendary dragon spirit at rare, which has flash and flying. And when Soul of Kamigawa enters the battlefield, another target permanent gains indestructible, and it's not until end of turn, it's for as long as we control this uh, Soul of Kamigawa. And then there's more. If we somehow have all five colors, we can get plus five, plus five until end of turn. Now I don't expect to activate that plus five, plus five ability very often, 
but even just a 3-3 with flash and flying that can make something indestructible seems very powerful, since we can not only potentially ambush an opposing creature by blocking with Soul of Kamigawa, but by turning another creature indestructible at instant speed, we can potentially eat an opposing creature as well. So, especially in best of one where the opponent doesn't know about it and wouldn't be able to play around it as easily, this seems like a nightmare to attack into and certainly deserves a bomb level status. Next is Light the Way, a 1 mana instant at common, letting us choose one between putting a plus 1 plus 1 counter on target creature or vehicle, also get to untap it, or we can return target permanent we control to its owner's hand. So we can maybe save something from removal, which could come up, but for the most part we're focusing on untapping something and giving it a plus 1 plus 1 counter, which is not a bad ability, but it's still relatively low impact, all things considered. So while it is efficient at 1 mana, a single plus 1 counter doesn't always make the difference in combat, and uh, untapping a creature could be relevant, but white tends to have rather small creatures, so maybe not quite as relevant as it would be in green, for instance. So I'm still hesitant to include this in too many decks, so I'll go with a D, but uh, yeah, if you need a combat trick, this will fit the bill. Light Boss Emperor's Voice, 2 mana for a 2-2 legendary Fox Advisor at rare, saying whenever an aura enters the battlefield under your control, if you cast it, you may search your library for an aura card with mana value less than or equal to that aura, and with a different name than each aura you control, put that card onto the battlefield attached to Light Paws, and then shuffle. So 2 mana 2-2 two, two with potential upside, where is this card going to be at its best? Of course in a deck with plenty of auras, which presumably is going to be in green-white, where you get a lot of enchantment synergy. You don't even have to put the original aura on Light Paws itself, that aura can be targeting a different creature, it's just the aura we search up that has to be attached to Light Paws, so we don't necessarily have to go all in on one creature. For a 2 mana 2-2, two -two, this potentially has a lot of upside. Now I wouldn't necessarily first pick it and build my entire deck around it, but assuming my deck has like 2 or 3 auras, maybe some of which also have channels that are not purely auras, then a Light Paws becomes much more interesting. So I'll go with a C+, this might end up more like a C in the end, if there's not too many playable auras you want to include, but uh, seems like a, a decent card. Next is Lion Sash, a 2 mana artifact creature equipment cat at rare, so this is another one of those reconfigure equipments. Starts out as a 1-1 one -one creature, so pretty small. Can pay a white mana to exile target card from a graveyard, any graveyard. If it was a permanent card, we can put a plus one plus one counter on Lion Sash. So reminiscent of Scavenging Ooze, except we don't gain life, but in return we can exile any permanent. So that includes opposing artifacts and enchantments as well. Yeah, even lands, I suppose, if they somehow get milled. And then we can also use it as an equipment, which is pretty cheap to reconfigure in this case, only 2 mana, giving the equipped creature plus one plus one for each counter on Lion Sash. So if we haven't activated Lion Sash, it doesn't do anything by default, but we'll quickly pick up more counters over time. So this is the kind of equipment that you probably want to put on your creatures as much as possible, so you don't expose Lion Sash to creature removal and then it will certainly dominate a, a grindy game, especially if your opponent is playing any sort of strategy that relies on the graveyard. So, while it is slow to get going, it is powerful, also a relatively big mana investment, needing white mana every time, but uh, yeah, the power is certainly there. So this is at the very least a B, could see this sneak up into the A category. I'm gonna be conservative with a B here, since not every deck necessarily dumps a ton of permanence in its graveyard right away, and the opponent can sort of play around it a little bit, but uh, at the very least a B for Lion Sash, and certainly has constructed applications. Lucky Offering, a 1 mana common sorcery, destroying target artifacts, with mana value 3 or less, we also gain 3 life. Now if this sets artifact or enchantments, I would be a lot more into it, but this is pretty narrow, only destroying artifacts, which are still a relatively big part of the overall format, but not, not every deck necessarily has a ton of artifacts, thinking of 
let's say the red white warriors deck might be mostly just creatures maybe a couple enchantments tossed in the blue green channel ramp archetype mostly is just creatures and enchantments doesn't have a ton of artifacts green white enchantments kind of the same mostly just enchantments not necessarily a ton of artifacts so lucky offering seems a little bit too hit and miss to be a main deckable removal spell so i'm going to end up giving this a d but if you're playing best of three don't be afraid to uh, sideboard this in if your opponent's playing plenty of artifacts of course then we've got march of otherworldly light this is part of a cycle of rare instants that have x in their mana cost so this is x and a white and as an additional cost to cast we can also exile any number of white cards from our hand and then it costs two generic mana less to cast for each card we exile this way and then we get to exile target artifact creature or enchantment with mana value x or less so we're never really getting an amazing deal since we're either two for one ourselves or we're paying more mana than the opponent paid for whatever we want to exile but it is gonna deal with pretty much anything and uh, it does so at instant speed so it's a nice kind of catch-all removal spell might also have some constructed applications who knows but uh, as far as limited goes seems like a solid removal spell that i'm willing to give a b not particularly efficient but i think the versatility makes up for it then we've got michiko's reign of truth a two mana uncommon enchantment saga on the first two chapters target creature gets plus one plus one until end of turn for each artifact and or enchantment we control and then on the final chapter transforms into portraits of michiko a zero zero enchantment creature that gets plus one plus one for each artifact and or enchantment we control so being an enchantment creature itself at the very least it's going to be a one one and can easily become much larger so seems perfect for the black white artifacts slash enchantment archetype also plays well in just a green white enchantment deck and potentially even in blue white vehicles where you're going to have more artifacts so it is kind of a cross archetype staple i would say uh, which increases its value now the first two chapters aren't always going to be what you need and it does take a while to get the creature out of it so that's potentially what's keeping this card back but i think it's still a c plus overall assuming your deck cares about that uh, plus one plus one bonus and can apply a bit of pressure then we've got moth rider patrol a one mana a one one fox warrior at common with flying can pay four mana tap it to tap target creature so the tap ability is very much overpriced and it's not what we really care about but i guess it's just a nice bonus for those rare circumstances but we're mainly interested in a 1-1 warrior with flying so this fills a couple roles mainly for the warrior slash samurai deck if there's a board stall where you have a you have trouble attacking with your ground creatures the patrol can maybe still sneak in and make use of all those various bonuses from a creature attacking alone it's also one drop to potentially enable ninjutsu even though white doesn't have a ton of ninjutsu cards maybe there's overlap with the second color which does have more ninjutsu creatures and then having access to a one mana evasive creature that can enable ninjutsu and that you can then replay very easily afterwards makes this much better than it would be in a different set so overall i think patrol actually adds up to an overall pretty decent card now it is still in white not a primary ninjutsu color still hesitant to give it more than a c just uh, don't sleep on this card is all i'm trying to say next is norika yamazaki the poet a three mana three two legendary human samurai at uncommon with vigilance saying whenever a samurai or warrior you control attacks alone you may cast target enchantment card from your graveyard this turn so this is the type of card that would play very well with the one drop we just uh, saw earlier as a way to enable this ability and replay enchantments which plays well with sagas that we'll be able to then uh, get more value from if they ended up in our graveyard and other enchantment creatures especially so yeah narika seems pretty decent a three two four three you know 
doesn't necessarily attack all that favorably, so the Vigilance might not be all that relevant if the opponent can just trade for their 2-drop. We can still essentially trade in Norika to replay something out of the graveyard, so it should be a 2-for-1 under most circumstances, even if we have to work for it a little bit, so C plus seems fine. And uh, some decks might even go up to a B, but uh, yeah, it is a little awkward that the Samurai and Warrior archetype doesn't care as much about enchantments as maybe some other archetypes would. So that's also part of the equation. And then Regent's Authority has a 1 mana instant, giving target creature plus 2 plus 2 until end of turn. If it's an enchantment creature or legendary creature, instead put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it and get plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn. So we still get plus 2 plus 2, but we get to keep a plus 1 counter instead. Now, there's not too many legendary creatures in the set, so I wouldn't be too hung up on that line of text, but there's certainly quite a few enchantment creatures in the set. So that's the main factor we have to consider. And then one mana for plus two plus two is sort of what we're used to now in terms of combo tricks. So it uh, gives you a little bigger boost than light the way, which we gave a D grade. So still not amazing for a combo trick, but this might be closer to a C than a D as far as one mana combo tricks go. So yeah, like a D plus C minus somewhere in that range for Regent's Authority. Then we've got Repel the Vile, a 4 mana common instant, chooses one mode between exiling target creature with power of 4 or greater, or exile target enchantment. So exiling an enchantment in this set is a lot more relevant than it would be otherwise. We get to do it at instant speed, which is nice, so we can tag sagas, enchantment creatures as well. And exiling a creature with power 4 or greater is typically an effect you're happy to have at least one copy of in your uh, main deck. But given all the enchantments in the set, this might be a card that you're happy to maybe include at least two copies of in your deck. Now there's still, of course, a couple archetypes that don't have a ton of enchantments and necessarily big creatures. So let's say you're up against a blue-black ninja deck typically has lots of small creatures with evasion, typically doesn't have many enchantments, so that's the type of matchup where this could be a dead card, so then it becomes risky to include too many copies. But overall I think this is still a card I'm happy to have one, maybe two copies in the main deck, and uh, yeah, I think C plus for Repel the Vile is appropriate. Next, the Restoration of Iganjo, a 3 mana a rare enchantment saga. On chapter 1 we get to search for basic planes to put into our hand, so we already get a nice bit of card advantage. On chapter 2 we may discard a card. When we do, return target permanent card with mana value 2 or less from our graveyard to the battlefield tapped. So if we wanted to we could discard the planes we picked up the turn prior. And then on the final chapter we get Architect of Restoration, a 3-4 enchantment creature with Vigilance, and when the Architect attacks or blocks, we get to create a 1-1 Colorless Spirit Creature token. Once again, the Spirit token does not have flying. So Architect of Restoration seems like a pretty good deal, especially since we only paid 3 mana for Restoration. Now again, it is going to take a while before we can actually attack with the 3-4, but we did get to generate a little bit of value in the meantime. So yeah, Restoration seems good, at the very least a B. Selfless Samurai is a 2-mana 2-2 two -two Fox Samurai at Uncommon, and when a Samurai or Warrior we control attacks alone, it gains lifelink until end of turn. So also applies to itself, so could attack as a 2-2 two -two lifelink. And then much like Selfless Savior, we can sacrifice Selfless Samurai to give another target creature we control indestructible until end of turn. So this is an awesome card, both for limited and potentially constructed and you're always happy to have it, relevant in the early game, relevant in the late game, so not much more you can ask for out of a 2-drop, and this might be one of the best uncommons for white in the set, so I'll happily give this a B, but this is very high in the B grade. And then 7 Tail Mentor, a 4-mana 2-3 Fox Samurai at common. When the Mentor enters a battlefield or dies, Put a plus one plus one counter on target creature or vehicle you control. 
we can potentially put the character on itself, so a 3-4 that when it dies puts another character somewhere, but it has even more flexibility as we can potentially put the counter somewhere else to begin with. So overall we're getting a pretty good deal in terms of power and toughness, the creature type is relevant, falls somewhere between like a C and a C+, plus. so final verdict, I'll be I guess more generous and we'll go with a C plus on this one, but uh, could potentially fall down to a C, so I wouldn't be too surprised there. And then a Sky Blast Samurai, a 7 mana, 4-4 four, four enchantment creature human samurai at uncommon. Costs 1 generic mana, less to cast for each enchantment we control, and it of course flies. So in a dedicated enchantment deck where we can start playing enchantments turn after turn, let's say we play an enchantment on turn 2, 3 and 4, then we could potentially cast this on turn 5 for a pretty reasonable price and get a 4-4 four, four flyer. So yeah, it does take a little bit of work to make it worthwhile, and I guess it also suffers in a way from being an enchantment creature, because then enchantment removal from the opponent can take it out, but it's still pretty substantial in terms of power and toughness on a flying creature. And if you look at the set overall, the creatures outside of green aren't really all that enormous, so a 4-4 flyer is actually quite substantial. So I think I'm happy giving the uh, samurai a B. Just make sure you have enough enchantments to enable it. And speaking of enablers, Spirited Companion might be one of the favorite cards in the set for me. A 2-mana 1-1 one, one enchantment creature dog at common. So it's an enchantment creature which is very relevant in a ton of different archetypes and when it enters a battlefield our favorite three words on any magic card draw a card so it instantly replaces itself it's an awesome enabler for the green white enchantment deck or the black white enchantment deck and it's also cheap enchantment that we can maybe recur from the graveyard in a multitude of ways and it replaces itself gives you a little bit of board presence so what's not to like an easy C+, plus, and I'll be picking as many of these as I can get. And Sunblade Samurai is a 5 mana 4-4 four, four enchantment creature human samurai at common. Has Vigilance and Channel for 2 mana, so we can discard the Sunblade Samurai to search our library for a basic planes card, reveal it, put it into our hand, and we also gain 2 life. So kind of a different take on planes cycling, which some of you may remember. And you could draw some comparisons to environmental sciences from Strixhaven. Of course, this doesn't fix your mana, but you're still searching up a land and gaining two life. And then we still have the flexibility of potentially playing this as a five mana 4-4 four, four creature with Vigilance, which is not too bad. It's an enchantment to potentially recur from the graveyard. And yeah, there's just a ton of synergy here that may not be apparent at first glance. So yeah, Sunblade Samurai. Seems good, probably not quite a C plus necessarily, but in a deck especially that has some graveyard recursion where you can often cycle this early and then get it back to then play the 5 mana 4-4, four, four, it's going to go up in value, so give this a C, but seems like a pretty solid role player. And Touch the Spirit Realm is a 3 mana uncommon enchantment. When it enters a battlefield, we exile up to one target artifact or creature until touch the spirit realm leaves the battlefield. So, pretty used to these sort of banishing light effects. This one doesn't quite deal with any permanents, but only artifacts or creatures, which is still a pretty large portion of uh, permanents, I would say. And then there's also a nice little channel ability for two mana in which case we discard it to exile target artifact or creature and return it to the battlefield under its owner's control at the beginning of the next end step. So we get to kind of blink something to maybe remove it from combat, to save it from removal, to uh, maybe re-trigger and enter the battlefield ability. So quite flexible. Although I imagine for the most part we're going to be using this as a 3-mana removal spell, but the 2-mana channel ability of course is just pure upside. So give this a B, another very good removal spell, probably better than the common version um, because we have that added flexibility, but uh, they're about the same, I would say. 
And then a Wanderer's Intervention, a 2 mana instant at common, deals 4 damage to target attacking or blocking creature. So we've seen these effects quite a few times in the past. Gideon's Reproach is what it was named back then. 4 damage usually deals with most creatures, except for maybe some of the larger green creatures in the set. The main problem, quote-unquote, is that it has to be targeting an attacking or blocking creature. So that means we either have to attack our smaller creature into a larger blocker, at which point we kind of lose out on a little bit of damage compared to a traditional spot removal spell, or we have to target an attacking creature from the opponent, which means we have to keep up mana during the opponent's turn, which means that if the opponent doesn't play into our intervention, we just wasted two mana. So it's not quite as good as your, you know, unconditional removal spells, but for two mana it's still quite efficient. And it's going to play better the more other instants you have in your deck or things you can do at instant speed, which also includes channel abilities. So give uh, Wonders Intervention somewhere between a C and a C+. Plus. Given that it doesn't really have a ton of synergy with any particular archetype, since there's not like a blue-white instant speed control archetype like there might be in other formats, the blue-white archetype here is Vehicles, compared to maybe blue-white flyers in other sets, where this would be slightly better. I think I'm leaning more towards C than C+, but uh, yeah, still a removal spell, so if your deck is lacking interaction, this will do. And then the Wandering Emperor, 4 mana for a 3 loyalty, Mythic Rare Legendary Planeswalker, and we don't get to find out the Wanderer's name yet, since we typically have a little dash and then the Planeswalker's name but the Wandering Emperor remains anonymous. And strangely enough, it has Flash, so we can play it at instant speed, which is unusual for a Planeswalker. And as long as the Wandering Emperor entered the battlefield this turn, we may activate her loyalty abilities any time we could cast an instant. So this is going to be the new Settled Wreckage, as we can use three different abilities right away as we flash in the Wandering Emperor, and they can all help us ambush the opponent's attackers. We can use the plus one, in which case put a plus one plus one counter on up to one target creature. It gains first strike until end of turn. So that seems like a, a very powerful combo trick, let's say. We can use the minus one to create a 2-2 white samurai creature token with vigilance. Can also maybe trade for something or ambush a smaller creature. And we can use a minus two to exile target tapped creature and gain two life. So perfect to flash this in after attackers are declared and kill an opposing attacker. And then we get to untap and still have a planeswalker in play. So the Wandering Emperor seems awesome, easily an S tier level card. And uh, yeah, I don't foresee enjoying playing against this card very much. Next we have When We Were Young, a 4 mana uncommon instant, saying up to 2 target creatures each get plus 2 plus 2 until end of turn. If we control an artifact and an enchantment, those creatures also gain lifelink until end of turn. So as far as combo tricks go, this one's pretty clunky at 4 mana. If we can enable the alternate mode of lifelink, then, you know, 4 points of power and toughness spread across two creatures in addition to the lifelink is gonna probably win most racing situations and could be a complete blowout. The problem kind of is I don't imagine the black-white artifact enchantment deck really wanting an effect like this. It seems more like black-white artifact enchantments is a very grindy archetype, cares about slowly eking out card advantage, doesn't strike me like a deck that really wants a big combo trick like this. So it's a little awkward. I'm hesitant to give this a very high grade. So I'll probably go with like a C, might be closer to a D in reality, but uh, can still lead to some blowouts. So play it only if uh, you think your deck actually needs this type of effect. First blue card, Acquisition. Octopus, a 3 mana, 2 2 artifact creature equipment octopus. It's another reconfigure card. And when the octopus or the equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, we get to draw a card. So, kind of your thieving magpie 
Ophidian effect that's been a staple in magic for many years. And having reconfigure on this effect is very powerful because, of course, if you can put this on a small evasive creature, maybe one with flying, then it's going to be much easier to connect and start drawing cards over and over. And especially in like a blue-black ninja deck that already wants access to cheap flying creatures, this is going to be even easier to enable. Also plays well with removal spells, just play this on curve, hope the opponent doesn't have a great start, and then you can quickly punish them by removing their only blocker, connecting, maybe drawing more answers, and that can quickly snowball from there. So yeah, Octopus is great, gets a B. Next we have Anchor to Reality of 4 mana Uncommon Sorcery. As an additional cost to cast, we have to sacrifice an artifact or creature, and then we can search our library for an equipment or vehicle card, put it onto the battlefield and shuffle. If it has mana value less than the sacrificed permanent's mana value, we get to scry 2 as well. Now, I've already looked through the entire set, and I can tell you that there is one expensive vehicle that might be worth anchoring to reality into. It's a 7 mana vehicle, and I believe it's even a common, so it shouldn't be too difficult to assemble that combo. So I think that's probably the only realistic scenario where Anchor to Reality might be worth it, as you get to kind of cheat on mana. Now it still requires quite a bit of setup. If you don't have any like expendable artifacts or creatures to begin with, then you're basically two for one in yourself to even get something in play in the first place. Yeah, there's not too many situations where I think this is going to be worth including. But it is one of those cards that probably goes pretty late, and if you happen to have some of those very powerful vehicles or equipments, then maybe it's worth it to go for it. But you also still need the early setup cards to actually sacrifice. So at the end of the day, I think this is still a D. But just keep those rare edge cases in mind. Then Arm Guard Familiar, a 2-mana two 2-1 two artifact creature equipment beast. At common has ward 2, and then it's also an equipment with reconfigure for 4 mana, giving plus 2 plus 1 and ward 2. So I'm always happy when my 2 drops have additional utility in the late game. A 2 mana 2 2, nothing amazing, and ward 2, still not amazing, but turn it into an equipment in the late game when there might be a board stall and a 2 1 is not relevant, then we get a much more interesting card. So I think this is. A C plus, just a very solid 2-drop that I'm happy to have in any blue deck. It's also an artifact for potential artifact synergy, so just a solid role player. Next is Awakened Awareness. X and double blue for an enchantment aura at uncommon. Can enchant an artifact or creature. When the awareness enters a battlefield, we put X plus 1 plus 1 counters on the enchanted permanent. And as long as the enchanted permanent is a creature, it has base, power, and toughness 1-1. One, one. So that last line of text makes this card probably a lot worse than it would be otherwise. I guess it does allow you to turn any artifacts into a creature to start attacking, but in a set that already has vehicles, a lot of the artifacts that aren't creatures are actually still creatures. So then as soon as you crew your vehicle, it turns into a 1-1, one, one, as opposed to whatever power and toughness it had before. So, yeah, I'm not a fan of Awakened Awareness, it's just very inefficient. Maybe in like a blue-green ramp deck where you can generate a ton of mana, and you don't really care about artifact claws, but you just use this as a pump spell for a creature. I could see this being okay, but even then it's pretty inefficient. So, yeah, not a fan, give this a D. Behold the Unspeakable on the other hand is a 5-mana Enchantment Saga at Uncommon. Chapter 1, creatures you don't control get minus 2, minus 0 until your next turn. So nice defensive ability. On chapter 2, if we have 1 or fewer cards in hand, draw 4, otherwise scry 2 and then draw 2. And then on the final chapter, it transforms into Vision of the Unspeakable, a 0-0 enchantment creature spirit with flying and trample, and it gets plus 1 plus 1 for each card in your hand. So just be mindful not to play out that last card, otherwise you're going to lose your creature. But assuming you just drew four cards, 
this is going to be pretty large, so you can attack first and then second main, play your land, play more spells potentially. So yeah, this seems like an awesome deal. Five mana to eventually draw a bunch of cards and make a creature that could be quite large. Yeah, Behold the Unspeakable seems like an easy B. Could maybe even sneak into the, the, the B plus A minus category. Seems like it is certainly approaching bomb level status. So certainly first pickable. Next is Covert Technician. A 3 mana 2-4 artifact creature Human Ninja at Uncommon has a ninjutsu for 2 mana, so we get a potential discount. And when the technician deals combat damage to a player, we may put an artifact card with mana value less than or equal to the damage from our hand onto the battlefield. So assuming no enhancements, it's going to be 2 damage. But uh, yeah, we still get a reasonable card pretty much any way we play it. A 3 mana 2-4, not exciting, but if we can ninjutsu this, put something else in play, maybe later get another hidden. And it's also an artifact creature for potential artifact synergy. So yeah, the technician seems fine, like a C plus probably. Discover the impossible on the other hand doesn't seem all that great. A 3 mana instant at uncommon lets us look at the top 5 cards of our library, exile one of them face down, put the rest on the bottom, and then we may cast the exiled card without paying its mana cost if it's an instant spell with mana value 2 or less. If not, we just put it into our hand. So it's an expensive cantrip, and even if we do get an instance with mana value 2 or less, it's still like not that exciting. So yeah, I'm not going to play this in many decks, I don't think. A D for Discover the Impossible just doesn't have a ton of synergy in this set. Disruption Protocol, a 2 mana instant at common for double blue. As an additional cost to cast it, we have to tap an untapped artifact contr we control or pay one generic mana, and then it just counters target spell. So this seems like a pretty good counter spell in this set. It's a little bit similar to Metallic Rebuke, which had uh, Improvise. This one is always at the very least going to cost double blue, but in the late game it's just a 3 mana counter spell, and blue just has a ton of artifacts, it's not too difficult to tap an untapped artifact to cast it for double blue. So yeah, this is actually a counterspell I like, which is pretty rare for these common counterspells, which typically fall more towards the C category. I think Disruption Protocol might get a C+. Essence Capture is a reprint, also a double blue instant speed counterspell, this one at Uncommon. Counter target creature spell and put a plus one plus one counter on up to one target creature you control. Limited at the end of the day is still a format where creatures are the most commonly played card type. Now that being said, there's quite a few enchantment sagas in the set that eventually turn into creatures, but you won't be able to counter those with essence capture, so maybe makes it a little bit worse than it would be in a different set. But it still seems like a very solid counter spell and about the same rates as the one we just discussed, C+. Futurist's Operative is a 4-mana 3-4 Uncommon Human Ninja. As long as it's tapped, it's a human citizen with base power and toughness 1-1 one, one, and it cannot be blocked. And we can pay 3 mana to untap it. So very strange card. So we can play this, attack with it, it's going to be a 1-1 one, one unblockable, so could enable ninjutsu, although the problem there is we spend 4 mana to play the operative, so whatever we ninjutsu better be good. And then we can pay 3 mana to have a 3-4 on defense, so kind of expensive, but it does mean we can essentially deal 1 unblockable damage each turn and still have a 3-4 on defense. So it's a little clunky. So I don't think I can give it too high of a grade, but if you've got some bomb ninjutsu card that you absolutely have to ninjutsu into play, then maybe this is an enabler for it. And uh, of course we can always just use it as a nice uh, damage source to just get one point in every turn. I think a C for operative is fine. It's still a 3 4 4 4 so it can be too bad. 
Futurist Sentinel, a 4 mana 6-6. Six, six. And it's a vehicle with crew cost of 3, so we've seen a very similar vehicle in past expansions. A 4 mana 6-6 six, six, crew 3, just as a colorless vehicle, the Iron Thread Crusher, I believe it was called. And back in Kaladesh, that was a good card, not anything amazing, but definitely a vehicle you were happy to have in most decks. And I imagine it's going to be similar for the Sentinel, especially in a blue-white vehicle deck where you've got more vehicle synergies, all those 1-1 tokens that um, were able to crew 3 essentially are perfect for turning this into a creature. So C for Futurist Sentinel. Next we have another shrine, the Goshentai of Lost Wisdom. 2 mana for an 0-4 legendary enchantment creature shrine with flying. So pretty good blocker. And at the beginning of your end step, you may pay one generic mana. When you do, target player mills X cards, where X is the number of shrines you control. So we don't really care about milling all that much. So this is mainly a two mana 04 flying blocker. But strangely, it could also enable ninjutsu, because it doesn't have defender, so... Yeah, why not attack with it? It's an evasive attacker, and as long as the opponent doesn't have any reach or flying creatures, we can still use it as a ninjutsu enabler, which is pretty strange for a shrine, but, uh, you know, it, it still works. And, uh, yeah, it's just a nice two-drop to play early. It blocks. Maybe it turns into a win condition late game if you don't have anything else going on, but I think it's mostly here, so it can also power up your author shrines if you manage to pick those up. So you can play this early and then later hopefully play a second shrine to power them up. So it's actually better than it might appear at first glance. And I think mainly the ninjutsu thing is what makes me like this card. So C plus for the Shrine of Lost Wisdom. Then Guardians of Oboro is a 3 mana 3-4 three, common with Defender. And it says modified creatures you control can attack as though they didn't have Defender. It's a bit of a strange ability to see in blue when the modified thing is more of a red-green thing. But uh, yeah, in blue we could still have some reconfigure cards to eventually let this attack or maybe some auras. And 3-4 uh, with Defender is still pretty decent stats for 3 mana. The main kind of weird thing about it is that it's not an artifact, which Blue cares about, and the creature type of Samurai also not really something you need in Blue, but maybe there's a bit of overlap with a red-white archetype, who knows. So, yeah, it seems playable, nothing exciting, but especially if your deck has a couple ways to modify it, it's gonna go up in value. So see for now. Inventive Iteration, 4 mana for a rare enchantment saga. On chapter 1 we get to return up to 1 target creature or planeswalker to its owner's hand. So we get a nice bounce spell. Chapter 2, return an artifact card from your graveyard to your hand. If you cannot, you get to draw a card, so you get some value regardless. And finally it transforms into Living Breakthrough, a 3-3 enchantment creature with flying. Saying whenever you cast a spell, your opponents cannot cast spells with the same mana value as that spell until your next turn. So yeah, a ton of great abilities, one better than the next almost, and all just for 4 mana. So yeah, there's a lot to like about it. The fact that it's a saga that actually has a an immediate impact on the board if you're behind as a nice defensive ability is great, and then it will eventually try and stabilize you, maybe even pull you ahead. So that's a lot for for mana, so seems like an A, bomb level card. Invoke the Winds, part of the Invoke cycle. So five mana, including quadruple blue for a rare sorcery, to gain control of target artifact or creature and untap it. Untapping a stolen creature is kind of an underrated aspect of this card because often if the opponent has some bomb in play that's beating you down, sure you can steal it, but then they might still have some other creatures that can get in, whereas now we have that creature on defense right away. So that's great about it. There's not too many bounce spells in the set, so 
not too many ways for the opponent to get their creature back if we do manage to steal it. But of course a main hurdle here is the quadruple blue cost, so it's no simple mind control. But on the other hand, it's also a sorcery, so it doesn't have that drawback of being an enchantment aura that stays on your creature that the opponent can maybe remove to get their creature back. So yeah, Invoke the Winds is powerful, as long as you can cast it, which isn't trivial, but if your deck is primarily blue, then this seems like a powerful inclusion. So we'll go with B for Invoke the Winds. If this were like three mana double blue, this would probably go closer to an A, maybe even with just triple blue and two generic mana, I would give this an A, but the quadruple blue is still quite a hurdle to overcome. Next is Jin Gitaxius, Progress Tyrant, one of the main uh, cards of the set, I would say. A 7 mana, 5-5, five, five, a legendary Phyrexian Praetor, of course a mythic rare, saying whenever you cast an artifact, instant or sorcery spell, copy that spell and you may choose new targets for the copy, only triggers once each turn, and if you're casting a permanent and getting a copy it comes into play as a token, and whenever an opponent casts an artifact, instant or sorcery, we get to counter that spell instead, also only triggers once each turn. So this seems like a nightmare for the opponent to deal with. Jing attacks basically counters most removal spells that would get rid of it, so the opponent has to first play something that gets countered and then be able to cast their removal spell afterwards, hopefully have enough mana for both. So that's a lot to ask from the opponent. Of course, we are paying 7 mana for a 5-5, which is not the best stats, admittedly, but especially in like a blue-green ramp deck where we can maybe get this in play a little sooner. This card is going to be amazing, and uh, yeah, if you get to untap with Jingataxius and copy one or two things over time, it's probably going to be game over. So S tier card, as it's just very difficult for the opponent to remove. And uh, yeah, if you open this pack one, pick one, blue green is probably the best place for it. Next is Kyrie, the Swirling Sky, six mana for a 6-6 six, six legendary dragon spirit at Mythic. And uh, I've already mentioned earlier, I've given all the dragon spirits an S grade. So no different here. After we give the S grade, we can, I guess, still read the card. So a 6-6 flyer with a ward 3. When it dies, choose one between return any number of target non-land permanents with total mana value 6 or less to their owner's hands, or mill 6 cards and then return up to 2 instant and or sorcery cards from your graveyard to your hand. It's kind of fun to speculate which of the two will be used more often. In this case, I'm not so sure. Maybe if you kind of draft a, a blue-red spells deck with lots of instants and sorceries, then you could go for the second mode, although I imagine the first one is going to use, be used uh, more often than not. But uh, I guess yeah, it all depends how your deck is built. But uh, yeah, this set just doesn't support your typical blue-red spells deck as much as it would be in a, a different environment just because the focus isn't really on instants and sorceries as much as it is on artifacts and enchantments. But yeah, still a bomb level card of course, so take it if you open it. Next is March of Swirling Mist, so also part of that rare cycle, can exile a card to pay 2 mana. So what is the actual effect here? We get to phase out up to X target creatures. So this one took me a second to kind of process, and I'm still not entirely sure on the rating. So at first you think, yeah, March of Swirling Mist, I guess I can save a creature from removal, seems a little bit narrow, but of course we can do a lot more than just that. We could cast this at the beginning of combat, phase out a whole bunch of the opponent's creatures, so not only do they not get to attack us, but they're also not going to be there on blocking duty, since they only phase back in at the beginning of the owner's upkeep, so we get a free attack in basically. So it could be a pretty powerful finisher in kind of a racing situation. That being said, it's still pretty narrow, and I'm not quite willing to give this too high of a grade. But uh, yeah, it is flexible, just requires quite a bit of mana to keep up at all times if we want to make the most out of it. Yeah, I think I'm going to fall somewhere 
like a C4 March of Swirling Mist. But uh, yeah, I do recognize its potential under the right circumstances, just happens to be a little bit narrow. Mind Link Mech is next a 3 mana rare artifact vehicle, a 4 3 flyer with just a crew cost of 1, so very easy to crew. And whenever the Mind Link Mech becomes crewed for the first time each turn, until end of turn, the mech becomes a copy of target non legendary creature that crewed it this turn, except it's a 4 3 and a artifact vehicle in addition to its other types, and it has flying. So probably a needlessly complicated card when at the end of the day it's just going to be a 4-3 flyer. But it might have some random upside, maybe with different uh, keywords like lifelink or first strike. Those are the types of things this could benefit from. Yeah, it could potentially work with some of the warrior synergies as well when creatures attack alone. Since it's in addition to its other types. So yeah, that's the type of use case. But yeah, for the most part, 4-3 flyer, crew 1, already a good deal. Also, fun fact, I guess that's worth mentioning now, uh, since that might be like a weird scenario with a mind link mech, is you can no longer crew vehicles with itself. You could technically tap the vehicle itself to crew itself, which was this weird rule. You can no longer do that, so they changed those rules. Maybe to avoid some weird rule scenario with a mind link mech, I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, just thought I would mention that here. So we'll give Mind Link Mech a B, just a solid vehicle, especially in blue white. Next is Mirror Shell Crab, a 7 mana, 5 7 crab at common. It's also an artifact creature. And it has channel, so we can pay 3 mana to discard it at any point to counter target spell or ability unless its controller pays 3 generic mana. And. If we do play it as a creature, it also has Ward 3. So this seems like a pretty nice split card. We can either use it as a 3 mana counter spell, which is, by the way, also essentially uncounterable because we're using the channel ability as opposed to casting a spell. Or we can cast it as a 7 mana 5 7 in the late game with some built in protection. It's also an artifact, which is another relevant card type. So there's a lot to like about the Mirror Shell Crab. And overall, Worthy of a C plus. Next is a mnemonic sphere, two mana for an artifact at common. You can pay two mana to sacrifice it and then draw two cards. And it also has channel for a single blue to draw one card. So not a bad little artifact, so we can pay four mana total to draw two, or we can pay one mana to cycle it, but then it's mostly used to potentially get it back from the graveyard later. Could be nice in a blue-red artifact deck as something that can enable enters a battlefield triggers when you play an artifact. So there's a lot of neat little synergies, I guess. Uh, sometimes you just need a cheap artifact to then later sacrifice to a different effect. So there's just a lot more going on than just 4 mana draw 2, which overall I think adds up to a C+. The decks that want Mnemonic Sphere are really going to want it. And a Mobilizer Mech, another vehicle. This one, 2 mana for a 3-4 uncommon with flying. Crew cost is 3. And when the mech becomes crewed, up to one other target vehicle you control also becomes an artifact creature until end of turn. So by crewing the Mobilizer Mech, we get to crew a different vehicle for free. So this potentially counteracts some of the problems of drafting too many vehicles and not having enough creatures to crew them. Now we only need to crew the mech to crew a second one, which, yeah, could be a pretty big help. But we're mainly interested in the mech as a only 2 mana, 3 powered flyer. Not the easiest to crew at crew 3, but hopefully we've got a few of those pilot tokens that can crew 3 for just being a 1-1 token. So, yeah, I like the mobilizer mech in the right shell, which presumably it's going to be blue-white, but uh, yeah, B for Mobilizer Mech. Next is The Modern Age, a 2-mana common saga. On the first two chapters we get to loot, meaning draw a card and then discard a card, and on the final chapter it transforms into Vector Glider, 
a 2-3 flyer and enchantment creature. So this one doesn't have a ton of synergy because most blue decks care about uh, artifacts more than they care about enchantments. It is a flyer, so I guess it could enable ninjutsu, but do you really want to wait three turns for a flyer to then pick it back up? And I guess we get to loot afterwards again, but then it's going to be a while before we get our flyer back. So that doesn't seem all that amazing. Maybe for like a blue-green deck where there's more enchantment synergy, this could be okay. As there might be ways to get cards back from the graveyard as well to make use of the drawn discard. So I think blue-green is probably the best home for it. But uh, yeah, overall, it's still a playable card. You're doing stuff for two mana. So if you don't have a ton of other two drops, this will fit the bill. So C for Modern Age. And Moon Circuit Hacker is a two mana, two one enchantment creature human ninja with ninjutsu for just a single blue. So we do get a nice discount. And when the hacker deals common damage to a player, we may draw a card if we do discard a card, unless the hacker entered the battlefield this turn. So the first time we ninjutsu the hacker, we basically just get to draw a card for free, and then afterwards it turns into looting. Now a 2 one's not going to have an easy time connecting after the first time, but uh, there's still the threats of the hacker connecting, so the opponent might leave more creatures back than they would otherwise, so that could be helpful in a racing situation. And then the ninjutsu is very cheap, so assuming you can uh, enable it by having enough cheap flyers, this seems nice. So, yeah, this falls somewhere between like a, a C and a C+. I'm gonna go with a more conservative C, because while, you know, we can read the ninjutsu ability and be like, oh, it's nice, just one mana, we get to draw a card. I think it's gonna be a lot harder in practice to actually enable ninjutsu, since, of course, knowing that there's going to be a lot of ninjutsu cards in the set, they're not going to print a whole lot of 1-mana, one 1-1 one -one flyers, for instance, to enable it. So I, get, I think C for the hacker is fine. Next is a Moonfolk Puzzle Maker, 3-mana, 1-4 artifact creature, Moonfolk Wizard. It flies, and when it becomes tapped, we get to scry 1. Interesting ability on a 1-4, which typically wants to hang back and play defense. But there are other ways to tap the Puzzle Maker besides attacking for one damage. We could maybe tap it to crew a vehicle, we could tap it to pay for that counter spell that we saw earlier. So there are a few scenarios where we can still tap it without actually needing to attack with it. And I think there's also like a one mana artifact that we'll encounter in just a bit that lets us tap artifacts to make mana. Also another neat combo with the Puzzle Maker. And at the end of the day, a 1-4 flyer is a pretty good defensive creature. Can maybe enable ninjutsu in a pinch, although don't really want to pay 3 mana to replay my uh, enabler necessarily. Usually draw the line at 2 mana. So yeah, the, the puzzle maker is a little awkward. I think the fact that it is an artifact kind of pushes it to a C, whereas otherwise it would have been a D. Here we have the Moonsnare prototype, the card I was just talking about. A 1-mana common artifact can tap and tap an untapped artifact or creature we control to add colorless mana. So this is maybe a good use of your uh, Moonfolk. It can also be channeled for 5-mana, which gives us an uncounterable interactive spell, saying the owner of target a non-land permanent puts it on the top or bottom of their library. So potentially a nice removal spell that the opponent won't have an easy time interacting with. Now, uh, I guess it's also worth mentioning that the crab we saw earlier can also counter abilities, so that's maybe still a way to counter channel abilities. So that's also worth pointing out. So Prototype is a pretty narrow card, only really wants to go in the dedicated, probably blue-red artifact deck, uh, where most of your deck is artifacts, and you care about the ramp, you care about artifacts entering the battlefield, you care about the flexibility of the channel ability, of course. So if you draw this in the late game, it's not a dead card, which is often the problem with this type of ramp. So yeah, I don't mind the Moonsnare prototype. Now that being said, it's still 
not particularly efficient when we use the channel ability. Five mana is kind of pricey. So probably just a C, but uh, certainly a playable card. Moonsnare Specialist is a four mana 2-2. Two -two. When it enters the battlefield to return up to one target creature to its owner's hand. So we get a nice bounce effect. And it's also a creature with ninjutsu for three mana. So we get a nice discount if we can enable it. We can hopefully also pick it back up with a different ninjutsu creature to then replay later, maybe bounce something else. So it does have quite a bit of potential. Great against any creature tokens, not that there's a ton of creature tokens in this set, as we can just straight up kill them with a specialist. So yeah, there's a lot to like about this. Seems like a C plus. Gives you much needed interaction in blue for the ninja deck. Network Disruptor, one mana for a 1-1 one -one flyer. Artifact creature, Moonfolk, Rogue. And when it enters the battlefield, tap target permanent. So this is exactly what the ninja deck needs as a ninjutsu enabler. I just said there's not going to be a ton of 1-1 one -one flyers because of the presence of ninjutsu. Well, here we have our 1-1 one -one flyer. So this is going to be in very high demand for any ninjutsu deck as something we can play early, enable ninjutsu, cheaply replay, and it even has a relevant enter the battlefield ability. Now it's also an artifact creature, so might have a little bit of overlap with the artifacts archetypes, but uh, this is mainly a ninja card. It's also rogue, so it benefits from the uh, blue-black uncommon giving ninjas and rogues plus one plus one. This might go up to like a B, just because it's such an important enabler for the ninjutsu deck. Um, otherwise, if you don't have your early enabler, the deck just doesn't function as well as it could otherwise. Yeah, if you have any aspirations to draft a ninja deck, make sure to pick up all the disruptors you see. Planar Incision, 2 mana for an instant at common, saying exile target artifact or creature, then return it to the battlefield under its owner's control with a plus one plus one counter on it. So we get to flicker something, add a counter to it. Yeah, not that interested in this. I uh, think I'm giving this a D. Prosperous Thief, 3 mana for a 3-2 human ninja and uncommon. Ninjutsu for just 2 mana. And whenever one or more ninja or rogue creatures you control deal combat damage to a player, create a treasure token, which will be helpful for then maybe replaying the creature you just picked up with ninjutsu. So this seems like an awesome inclusion for the blue-black ninja deck, giving you access to much more explosive, th uh, much more explosive turns, and generally gonna smooth out your draws. So C plus for Prosperous Thief. Then we have the Reality Chip, two mana for an O4 legendary artifact creature equipment jellyfish. So quite a mouthful. Says you may look at the top card of your library at any time. And then it also has reconfigure, so we can pay three mana to turn this into an equipment, ceases to be a creature, and then as long as the reality chip is attached to a creature, we may play lands and cast spells from the top of our library. So we get a nice future sight effect, which is a very powerful effect to have access to. It's also an equipment, so once it reconfigures, it's not that easy for the opponent to deal with unless they have artifact removal. And it just provides so much card advantage that it's going to be difficult for the opponent to keep up. And we can also just decide to keep it as an 0-4 blocker, so it protects our life total nicely. So yeah, this seems like an awesome bomb level card that requires an answer, otherwise it's just going to provide too much card advantage for the opponent to keep up with. So bomb level card gets an A. A reality Heist, 7 mana for an uncommon instant, costs 1 generic mana less to cast for each artifact we control. And then we get to look at the top 7 cards of our library, reveal up to 2 artifact cards from among them, put them into our hands, rest goes on the bottom. So a pretty narrow card only really goes into one archetype, which is presumably going to be like a blue-red artifact deck. Outside of that deck, this is just not going to have enough artifacts for you to consistently hit to be worth it. But in the blue-reds all-artifact deck, this seems pretty awesome. 
as you'll be able to cast it probably around three or four mana and then a, a nice two for one that gets to dig pretty deep so I'll play as many of these as I can get even if it has a bit of a nombo that it doesn't find additional copies of itself but uh, yeah reality heist seems like a fun payoff for the artifact deck C plus don't think we need to give it too high of a grade since the decks that want it should generally get it since no other decks are going to be interested in this Replication Specialist, 5 mana for a 3-4, uncommon a Moonfolk Artificer with flying. So already 5 mana 3-4 flyer, not a bad deal. But there's more, whenever a non-token artifact enters a battlefield under your control, you can pay 2 mana, 1 and a blue. If you do, create a token that's a copy of that artifact. So this says non-token artifact, it doesn't say non-creature artifact. And a lot of the blue creatures are indeed artifacts. And it's only 2 mana to get a copy, so if you're already at 5 mana, you can typically pay the uh, 2 extra mana to get those tokens going. And at the same time, it's still a 3-4 flyer for 5, so it's not like we had to overpay too much on our creature. So this seems like an awesome card for the right deck. Again, probably wants to go in like a blue-red artifact deck. But unlike the Reality Heist we just covered, I would be happy to play this even in a deck that only has a handful of artifacts, whereas Reality Heist really needs you to be fully dedicated to the theme. So B for Specialist, definitely high B. Could see this sneaking up into the A- category. Saiba Trespassers, 5 mana for a 3-5 artifact creature Moonfolk Rogue. And doesn't have any special abilities if we play it as a creature, but it also has channel, so we can discard it for 4 mana to tap up to 2 target creatures we don't control, and they don't untap during their controller's next untap step. So, not particularly impressive as a 5 mana creature. The channel ability is also not amazing, but could be useful in a racing situation. So, overall, where do we land on Trespassers? Probably like a C. Even if neither mode is particularly amazing, the flexibility of having both, I guess, makes up for it. Short Circuit, 2 mana enchantment aura at common, has flash, enchants an artifact or creature, and as long as the enchanted permanent is a creature, gets minus 3 minus 0 and loses flying. So, Important that this can enchant both artifacts and creatures. If it's only enchanted creatures, it would be pretty awkward when used against vehicles, because as soon as the vehicle ceases to be a creature, it would fall off. But luckily, this can still target uh, and enchant artifacts. So, as far as removal spells go, this one's okay. Still leaves the creature in play for the opponent to potentially block with or chum block with. Doesn't remove any utility that the card may have. So it's not a clean answer, but in a control deck that just needs to stay alive and have some form of interaction early, maybe you've got a bomb that can win the game for you in the late game, then I guess I'm happy to have a couple short circuits. It's an enchantment as opposed to an artifact, so blue typically prefers artifacts, but there may be some enchantment synergy. So not a card I'm thrilled about. But if, you're, if your deck lacks interaction, this will do. So we'll give this a C, but uh, just don't go wild about this. And then a Sky Swimmer Koi, 4 mana, 3-3 three, three fish at common, it flies, and says whenever an artifact enters a battlefield under your control, you may draw a card if you do discard a card. So a 3-3 three, three flyer for 4, we have grown used to. It, it used to be a very good card in Limited, now it's just merely a good card. And then we get a looting ability on top, so... Seems like a good deal for any deck that has a couple artifacts floating around. So Koi gets a C+. And Spell Pierce is reprinted, 1 mana. Instant to counter-target non-creature spell unless its controller pays 2 generic mana. Just a little bit too narrow for Limited, where... Most cards are still creatures, which Spell Pierce doesn't counter, and then only paying two extra mana once you get to the late game is not going to be relevant anymore. So can't recommend main decking this, but I could see scenarios where you want to sideboard this in. 
and then suit up, 3 mana instant, says until end of turn, target creature or vehicle becomes an artifact creature with base power and toughness 4-5, and we get to draw a card. Now sadly this doesn't say target artifact, it specifically wants you to target a vehicle or a creature, so not being able to target regular artifacts makes this a little bit worse, but uh, it does replace itself, so we can be too picky about the additional effect and uh, being able to potentially ambush a creature by turning our blocker into a 4-5 could certainly come up. I'm just kind of wondering what deck wants this effect and is going to reliably keep up all their mana to cast this and maybe ambush something. I guess we could always kind of use it as a combat trick in our turn to grow one of our creatures as well. So it does have a lot of kind of different applications and you can usually figure out a way to get an extra card out of it. So it could lead to a nice two for one. Just, you know, requires a little bit of setup. So I wouldn't play too many copies of this, but it's probably going to be okay in like a blue-white vehicle deck where you're going to have a ton of targets for it. But uh, yeah, probably like a C. Typically this effect is something I don't want and gets a D grade, but adding draw card to anything of course makes it a lot more appealing. Next is Tameshi, Reality Architect. 3 mana for a 2-3, Legendary Moonfolk Wizard at rare, saying whenever one or more non-creature permanents are returned to hand, draw a card and only triggers once each turn. So this doesn't specify returns to our hand, could also be to the opponent's hand. So if we combine this with, let's say, the 4 mana ninja that bounces something, we get to draw as well. So that seems nice. But of course we can enable its own ability by paying X and a white, returning a land we control to its owner's hand, and then return target artifact or enchantment card with mana value X or less from our graveyard to the battlefield. Can only use it as a sorcery. So an interesting source of potential card advantage. And yeah, a lot of ways to trigger it that may not be obvious at first glance. And then it's still a 3 mana 2 3, so while not an exciting stat line, it's still not embarrassing. So I think Tameshi has enough going for it that it should get a B. Pretty slow, requires the right setup, but uh, on a stalled board, it could take over. And then Tamyo's Completion, 4 mana Enchantment Aura at common does have flash, which is relevant, and then it enchants an artifact, creature, or even a planeswalker, and when it enters, we get to tap the enchanted permanent. If it's an equipment, we get to unattach it, also relevant, and the enchanted permanent loses all abilities and doesn't untap during the untap step. So for most intents and purposes, it takes the enchanted permanent out of commission. Yeah, it's just a flexible removal spell, a little bit more of a permanent answer than the uh, two mana short circuit. So yeah, there's quite a bit to like about Tamiya's completion. Um, of course does have potential risks involved if the opponent can eventually destroy the enchantment or maybe bounce their own creature. So there's still ways around it to eventually free the creature. But uh, yeah, as far as removal goes in blue, this seems pretty good, gets a C plus. And then Tesseret's Betrayer of Flesh is the blue mythic rare planeswalker for 4 mana, starts out at 4 loyalty, and says the first activated ability of an artifact you activate each turn costs 2 generic mana less to, ca to activate. Rather, We haven't seen too many artifacts with activated abilities. Uh, I guess there's like the, the cheap one to draw 2 cards that we can get a 1 mana discount on, but yeah, just not too many. At least uh, in this set, I guess there's a few artifacts we haven't looked at yet that are colorless that uh, may synergize with Tazeret. But uh, yeah, don't focus too much on the passive. Then the plus one lets us draw two and then discard two cards unless we discard an artifact. So Tazeret does want to be in a very focused artifact deck to provide real card advantage. Then the minus two says target artifact becomes an artifact creature and if it isn't a vehicle, it has base power and toughness 4-4. Now note this doesn't say until end of turn, 
so it permanently turns an artifact into a 4-4. Now that being said, there's not a ton of cheap artifacts that aren't creatures somehow, so again, difficult to get too much value out of this. Maybe if you have a way of generating artifact tokens, that would be nice. Going back to the uh, black-red multicolor anvil, can maybe somehow combine the two, that would be nice. And then the minus six gives us an emblem saying, whenever an artifact you control becomes tapped, draw a card. So that's where the real power of Tezzeret lies. Can relatively quickly reach the ultimate. Just play him plus one, plus one, minus six. It's realistic. Problem is, Tezzeret doesn't really protect himself if we go with that line of play. So it does kind of require you to already have a board presence to get the most out of it. Now it is still a Planeswalker. Planeswalkers tend to make people do weird things in Limited. So that's also factored into the equation here. So at the end of the day, I think Desert still gets an A. Still seem like a powerful bomb level card with the asterisk that you do need to have enough artifacts to make it worthwhile. But uh, that shouldn't be too difficult in blue in this set. And then Thirst for Knowledge, a nice reprint. 3 mana, uncommon instant, lets you draw 3 cards and then discard 2 unless you discard an artifact card, which shouldn't be too difficult in blue, so seems like a powerful card draw effect. Happy giving this a B. And then Thousand Faced Shadow is our last blue card. A 1 mana, 1-1 one, one human ninja at rare, and it flies. So already you've got my attention, a 1 drop that flies, perfect ninjutsu enabler. And it also happens to have ninjutsu itself for 4 mana. And when the Thousand Faced Shadow enters the battlefield from our hand, if it is attacking, create a token that's a copy of another target attacking creature. The token enters the battlefield tapped and attacking. And then once we ninjutsu the Thousand Faced Shadow, presumably our deck has more ninjutsu creatures, so we can put it back in our hand, re-enable the ninjutsu ability, and profit. So yeah, this card seems quite powerful for the blue-black ninja deck and might even approach bomb status. So given that we gave the author 1-1 flyer a B grade, can go much lower than an A for Thousand Faced Shadow as it has a ton more potential upside. First card, Assassin's Ink. We're starting out strong. A 4 mana instant, which Destroys target creature or planeswalker, so I'm already very much interested, and then it gets even better. If we control an artifact or an enchantment, we get a discount, potentially a two mana discount if we control both. So it doesn't get much better in terms of insta speed spot removal in this set, so a high B for Assassin's Inc. Then we have the Biting Palm Ninja, a 3 mana, 3-3 three, three human ninja at rare, with ninjutsu for 3 mana. When it enters battlefields, it enters with a menace counter on it, so the ability counters from Ikoria return. They don't appear on a ton of creatures, but also interesting to note is, is that those ability counters count as modifications, which can be relevant for a few cards. And when the ninja deals combat damage to a player, we may remove a menace counter from it. When we do, that player reveals their hand, and we get to choose a non-land card to exile. This seems like a pretty awesome card. 3-3 three, three with menace, can play it on curve, hit the opponent once, which we shouldn't have too much difficulty with. And then it's a nice 2-for-1 as we get to remove a card from their hand, still have a 3-3 three, three left over, and with ninjutsu it becomes even easier to uh, hit the opponents to then make them exile a card. So yeah, the ninja seems great, and at the very least gets a B, and a high B at that. Blade of the Oni, a 2 mana, 3-1 artifact creature equipment demon at mythic. It has menace. If we ignore everything else for a second, it's a 2 mana, 3-1 menace. That's already an awesome deal. We're used to seeing these cards that cannot block, like 3 1 menace can block. Nope, this can block just fine if needed. And then there's more. We can pay 4 mana to reconfigure and turn this into an equipment, at which point it's no longer a creature. And the equipped creature has base, power, and toughness 5 5. 
and has menace and is a black demon in addition to its other colors and types. Yeah, this seems awesome. Turning every creature into a 5-5 menace creature seems a lot to keep up with, so this is going to be at its best in a, a creature deck that has a relatively low curve, so we can turn any old 1-drop or 2-drop into a 5-5 menace, as opposed to turning your 4-drop into a 5-5, which might be a small upgrade. Low curve, aggressive creature deck. It has menace as a 3-1 menace, so it's also good at enabling ninjutsu. So this is probably going to be at its best in like a, a blue-black ninja deck or maybe a red-black artifact deck, as uh, this is also an artifact creature, so it has some artifact synergy. But, uh, I mean, any deck playing black cards is going to be ecstatic to include Blade of the Oni. So it doesn't take too much work to make it great, and certainly approaches bomb status as a very powerful, repeatable 5-5. Five five. Next is Chain Flail Centipede, a 3-mana 2-2, two two, another artifact creature equipment insect with Reconfigure. Reconfigures for 2-mana, and when the centipede or the equipped creature attacks, it gets plus 2 plus 0 oh until end of turn. So not the best creature on defense, but does attack as a 4-2, so hits pretty hard. And then also going to be great if you can reconfigure this onto like a small evasive creature to give two additional power, which is not a bad deal. So all in all, the centipede falls somewhere between the C and C plus range. Going to be optimistic and give it a C plus just because of the flexibility of reconfigure. But just make sure you have maybe some first strike creatures to combine this with. Maybe some menace creatures also play well with increased power. And uh, flying creatures, of course, also play well with additional uh, stats. Next is Clawing Torments, one mana for an enchantment aura. Can enchant an artifact or creature. And as long as the enchanted permanent is a creature, it gets minus one, minus one, and cannot block. And then the enchanted permanent deals one damage to the controller's upkeep, basically, or I guess loses one life, slightly different, at the beginning of their upkeep. So very peculiar enchantment. Um, not immediately clear which archetype really wants this, but it could theoretically go into a few different ones. It's going to be at its best in a more aggressive deck, where the in you know incidental one damage adds up over time. The best target to put Clawing Torment is like, let's say a 1-4 creature from the opponent's uh, where now it doesn't deal any damage, so it's useless when it's attacking, and it's also useless when blocking, since it cannot block. So finding the right target for Clawing Torment is going to be the main challenge. It can, of course, just kill one toughness creature straight up for one mana, which, you know, can be useful. But uh, I think to get the most out of it, you really want to, like, incapacitate an opposing creature while having it deal one damage repeatedly. And uh, I guess it's also an enchantment for maybe the black-white enchantment deck, where you could use this as like a very early removal spell if needed, with maybe some damage uh, applications later in the game. So, it has a lot of text. I think it's a playable card, but I also wouldn't go wild about it, since it could still be a relatively low-impact card. If you're very far behind, then... It doesn't really matter if you shrink an opposing creature by one, and the one damage probably doesn't matter if you're on the back foot. So it's no it's no spot removal spell that's very reliable. But uh, it's still interesting and could maybe lead to some unique aggressive uh, strategies. So I'll go with a C on Clawing Torment, and we're kind of going to have to play with it to get a better sense of how the card performs. But I definitely have fond memories of Stab Wounds from the uh, Return to Ravnica, which, you know, not quite as powerful, but it does give me similar vibes. Next is Debt to the Kami. Three mana instant at common lets you choose one between target opponent exiles a creature they control or target opponent exiles an enchantment they control. So reminiscent of Farika's Libation from Theros. So exiling makes it a little bit better than just sacrificing, so there's no graveyard shenanigans happening afterwards. At the end of the day, I'm still not a huge fan of edict effects in limited, as they're known, making the opponent sacrifice, or in this case exile, something of their choice. 
as they will usually be able to get rid of their random 2-drop that they no longer need. Yeah, there's also just a ton of enchantment creatures in the set, making the Exile and enchantment parts less surgical than it would otherwise be, as there's just going to be more enchantments in general floating around. So that to the Kami gets a D for me, but again, it's like a card you could include, just not happy about it. Next is a Dockside Chef, 1 mana for a 1-2 enchantment creature, human citizen, at uncommon, can pay 2 mana to sacrifice an artifact or creature to then draw a card. So there's not a ton of great sacrifice outlets in the set, there's also not as many cheap Act of Treason effects as there might have been in previous sets. That being said, Dockside Chef is still a pretty awesome card, since 1 mana for a 1-2 gives you early board presence, can maybe even enable ninjutsu for the ninja deck for what it's worth. And then in a late game, if the opponent tries to kill something, you've got 2 mana open, you still get some value. Of course, going to be at its best in the red-black sacrifice archetype, where you're going to have more payoffs and incentives to sacrifice stuff. Although, weirdly, this is an enchantment creature and not an artifact creature. So it's not the perfect synergy, but could also be very good in like the black-white enchantment artifact deck as a very cheap enchantment you can get in play and uh, can provide a ton of value if you then can maybe recur stuff out of the graveyard. So it fits into a few different archetypes. It's very cheap, it's impactful, C+, seems appropriate. Next is the Shadow Walker, a 6-mana, 5-5, five five, Ogre Ninja at common, and it has ninjutsu for 4 mana. So we get an awesome discount if we can ninjutsu enable it. And the 5-5 five five is pretty big for the ninja deck, which typically has smaller creatures. So this could be a great curve topper for the deck. And yeah, hopefully we've got lots of cheap evasive creatures to enable it. And uh, then it's going to be great. If we don't have any cheap enablers, then... You want to stay as far away as possible from the Shadow Walker, and it's not going to be a card you're going to want to put in your deck. So very much relies on having enough ways to get it going. And assuming you do, this is probably a card you want to have like two or three copies of even in your deck as a curve topper, as it's only really four mana to play it, which is not too much. So I think C+, I'm going to be optimistic that the Ninja deck is going to come together and... Then a 5-5 five five again is pretty big. The set doesn't have a ton of large creatures. There's a couple green creatures that outsize this, but uh, even a lot of the vehicles are kind of on the smaller side this time. It's not as many huge 6-6s six uh, floating around, even though there is the 4-mana uh, 6-6 six six in blue. Next is the Silencer, 2-mana two 2-1, two Human Ninja at Uncommon. Has Ninjutsu for 2-mana. So same as the normal casting cost. And when Silencer deals combat damage to a player, we may discard a creature card. When we do, destroy target creature or planeswalker that player controls. So conveniently, if we use the ninjutsu ability, we'll have picked up a creature that we can now discard to enable its ability if we didn't have any other creatures in hand. So that's very convenient. And uh, yeah, getting potentially repeatable removal spells seems awesome if we have other ways to then uh, pick it back up with other ninjutsu cards, perhaps. Although a 2-1 might have hard time uh, getting in. But uh, yeah, 2-1 seems like uh, it has a ton of upside being a 2-drop. So the silencer, at the very least, a C+, as it should be able to at least kill one creature, even if it does come at the cost of discarding a card but uh, might be difficult to enable for a second or third time. Then we've got Enormous Energy Blade, a 3 mana uncommon equipment, giving the equipped creature plus 4 plus 0. And when the Energy Blade becomes attached to a creature, we have to tap that creature. Equip cost is 2. So there's not a ton of equipment that don't have reconfigure, but this is one of them. And this is a difficult one to evaluate for sure. 4 power is a lot, it's only equip cost of 2, which is relatively cheap, even though we have to get the initial investments out of the way. But uh, tapping a creature means we won't be able to attack with the creature the turn we equip it, so we have to kind of equip 
and then uh, wait a turn before we get to connect. So it's pretty slow. There's not that many cards that care about having a high-powered creature, which maybe would synergize with it otherwise. So it doesn't really have that going for it. But it is still impactful, so on a stalled board this will completely outgrind the opponent, assuming you have enough creatures to equip. So again, plays well with menace creatures, trample creatures, flying creatures. Uh, any form of evasion will make this even better. So I'm probably going to be wrong on the energy blade since it's just such a difficult card to kind of gauge how good it's going to be. But I'm, I'm relatively optimistic and I'll go with a C plus. Just make sure you can stall out the board before you get this going. Not a card you're going to want to play on curve to start beating down right away, since then you might end up losing the race. But if you've already got a kind of stalled situation, then Energy Blade should be a great way to break that board stall. Also great with uh, Lifelink indeed. Next is the Goshentai of Hidden Cruelty, another shrine. This one a 4 mana 2-2 two, two with Death Touch. This one can trade for a lot of opposing creatures. And black, both black white and black green have a ton of graveyard recursion to maybe get it back. So Death Touch is a pretty useful ability to have. And this one also has a very interesting ability on our end step. We can pay one generic mana. If we do, destroy target creature with toughness X or less where X is the number of shrines we control. So this can start killing one toughness creatures. There's not a ton of them, but I did mention earlier there's a few cards in the set that do punish one toughness creatures, and this is certainly one of them. And uh, as soon as you get a second, let alone a third shrine, this is going to be very hard to deal with if you don't have an immediate answer. And four mana to two death touch, we are overpaying maybe one mana, let's say. But it's also an enchantment, so it has potential enchantment synergies going for it. Lean C+, plus, but assuming you have uh, another shrine to go with it, then uh, of course it skyrockets in value. So it's going to be tricky to decide when to pick up the shrines. But uh, yeah, assume that if you already have a shrine, you're going to probably take this out of every pack that's uh, presented to you. Next is a Grave Lighter, a 3 mana 2-2 two, two spirit at uncommon. It flies, and when Gra Grave Lighter enters a battlefield, to draw a card. If a creature died this turn, otherwise each player sacrifices a creature. So we're used to seeing these effects stable onto 3 mana creatures, although they're usually not 2-2 two, two flyers, so that's quite the upgrade here. And uh, being a flyer means it could maybe enable ninjutsu synergies. It also plays well in like the black-green sacrifice, graveyard recursion deck, black-red as well. So it fits into a lot of different archetypes, even if it doesn't have a relevant creature type necessarily, or a card type for that matter. Assuming you've got some early sacrifice fodder to go with it, it's already good. And then if it's a 2-2 flyer that draws a card, that's just awesome. So yeah, B for a Grave Lighter. Next we have the Devouring Chaos. Another uh, appearance of Hidetsugu, known from the Second Rites and some other famous cards. 4 mana for a 4-4 four, four legendary ogre demon at rare. And looks like he's got two colors, or at least an activated ability in red. So black mana can sacrifice a creature to scry 2. So perfect for the black red sacrifice deck. And we can also pay 3 mana, tap it, exile the top card of our library. We may play that card this turn, and when we exile a non-land card this way, it deals damage equal to the mana value of that card to any target, so it can take out opposing creatures, can go face, and we can even use the scry 2 to potentially set up the top card as well, so there's synergy between the two abilities. And at a base it's a 4 mana 4-4, four, four, which is very respectable stats, especially in black, which typically doesn't get very efficient creatures like this. So yeah, the Devouring Chaos seems awesome and uh, gets an A bomb level status, but of course you want to make sure you can activate the red ability, which is the more exciting of the two. Then we have Inkrise Infiltrator, 2 mana for a 1-2 human ninja, 
at common it flies, so already has my attention as a great ninjutsu enabler. And we can pay 4 mana to give it plus 2 plus 2 until end of turn. And I cannot stress enough how useful that threat of activation is, because now it's an even better ninjutsu enabler. We attack or 1-2 even if the opponent has, let's say, a 3-3 three, three flyer out, then they're not going to want to block the infiltrator. And now instead of pumping the infiltrator, we can use it for ninjutsu if we want to. So yeah, this is awesome for the blue-black ninja deck. Not quite as cheap as the one mana blue flyer, which of course is much easier to then replay and get more ninjutsu creatures going. So the difference between one mana and two mana is still very big. But of course this can also just be serviceable as a two drop that we can pump later in the game to get extra damage in. So C plus for Inkrise Infiltrator. Next is Invoke Despair, part of the Invoke cycle of rares. So 5 mana, including quadruple black for a sorcery that says target opponent sacrifices a creature. If they cannot do that, they lose 2 life and we get to draw a card. And then we repeat that process for both an enchantment and a planeswalker. Not too many planeswalkers in limited. Let's say this is opponent sacrifices a creature, opponent sacrifices enchantment, they lose 2 life and we draw a card. That seems like a pretty good deal for 5 mana, even though I mentioned earlier that making the opponent sacrifice isn't always, you know, as good as you would like it to be. The fact that they have to sacrifice two things and we still get that third effect is quite nice. But we have to, of course, overcome the hurdle of quadruple black, which isn't uh, straightforward. So I think C plus overall for Invoke Despair maybe not quite as powerful as some of the other invoke sorceries we've seen, but uh, yeah, still respectable. Next we have another legendary dragon spirit, Junji, the Midnight Sky, 5 mana for a 5-5 five five with flying and menace. As I mentioned, all the dragon spirits get an S. This one, when it dies, we get to choose between each opponent discards 2 cards and loses 2 life. Or we can put target a non-dragon creature from our graveyard onto the battlefield under our control and we lose two life. So we either make the opponent discard two or we get to reanimate a creature. Yeah, both those abilities seem great. We've got a 5-5 five, five flying menace, that's a must answer. So unless the opponent has one of those few clean answers like an enchantment aura to deal with it or an exile effect, this is going to be very backbreaking. And also worth pointing out, it does indeed say a graveyard and not our graveyard, so we could also reanimate opposing creatures, which is very nice. Next is Kaito's Pursuit, 3 mana sorcery, and this is the mind rot effects of the set. Target player discards 2 cards, and in this case ninjas and rogues we control gain menace until end of turn. Mind rot effects weren't amazing in the last couple sets, mostly because there was a ton of graveyard recursion. We don't really have the same problem here, so discard 2 should be better than it was before. Uh, and then of course giving ninjas and rogues menace could be relevant in especially blue-black. Although I don't imagine that we're going to have enough mana to play Kaito's Pursuit and Ninjutsu something in the same turn, so that might be a bit of a pipe dream. But yeah, still seems okay as far as mind rot effects go. So I think this is C playable. And then a Kami of Restless Shadows is 5 mana for a 3 3 spirit at common. When it enters a battlefield, choose one between a return up to one target ninja or rogue creature card from your graveyard to your hand, or put target creature card from your graveyard on top of your library. So this is a bit of a weird one. If we choose the second mode, this card's pretty unexciting, since, you know, it's not generating card advantage and we're paying 5 mana for a 3-3. Three, three. So unless you've got a bomb that you absolutely want to get back from the graveyard, this seems mediocre. Now if we're getting back a ninja or rogue, we get to put it in our hands, so it turns into a grave digger, a 5 mana grave digger, but it's also a bit bigger as a 3-3. Three, three. So that's nice. Um, 
But the problem is, does a ninja and rogue deck really want a 5-mana 3-3 spirit that doesn't have any synergy with ninjutsu whatsoever? Probably not. So that's kind of where I struggle with uh, Kami a little bit. So yeah, maybe a blue-black ninja deck that didn't quite get there will include this. But I think like the very streamlined, low-curve, low costs, lots of cheap evasive enablers, that type of ninja deck probably doesn't have room for Kami. That probably lands it at like a, a D, maybe D plus, C minus. Just don't imagine wanting to play this very often. You could potentially ninjutsu back the Kami to then re-enable it, but just seems difficult to make that happen. Then we have Kami of Terrible Secrets, 4 mana, 3-4 for a spirit at common. When it enters the battlefield, if you control an artifact and an enchantment, you get to draw a card and gain one life. So not the easiest to enable, but could be a nice uh, creature for the black-white enchantment deck specifically. So how reliably can we get an artifact and an enchantment in play by turn 4? That's going to be kind of the main question we have to answer. And it's probably going to be different from one deck to another, but this is where having those uh, two mana spirited companions, for instance, is great since it's just a cheap enabler that draws a card, so it digs you deeper into the deck to find more artifacts to assemble your uh, artifact and enchantments requirements. So yeah, probably a C for Kami of Terrible Secrets. But uh, in the black-white deck specifically, this might go up in value, of course. Leech Gauntlet, 2 mana for a 2-2 artifact creature equipment leech with lifelink. So already 2 mana 2-2 two -two artifact creature with lifelink, I'm sold. But there's more, we can reconfigure it for 4 mana, in which case it turns into equipment, in which case it turns into an equipment, giving the equipped creature lifelink. Don't have a ton more to add to this. But uh, seems great, gets a B. Then we have Lethal Exploit, 2 mana for an instant, giving a target creature minus 2, minus 2 until end of turn, gets an additional minus 1, minus 1 for each modified creature we controlled as we cast this spell. So, black, not the primary color for modified creatures, but it does have a couple equipments, as we've seen, which can potentially help modify our creatures. There was that rare ninja that came with a menace counter, maybe there's going to be a few more. So those could all be helpful. Otherwise we're mainly looking at our second color to help provide more modified creatures. Green, for instance, has a ton of plus one counters, which could help. So that's where lethal exploit's probably going to be at its best in black-green. But uh, yeah, 2 mana, minus 2, minus 2, fine removal spell. 2 mana, minus 3, minus 3 is a great removal spell. So I think this is like a C plus in a very high modified creature deck. This might bump up to a B, but a C plus for lethal exploit. Next we have Life of Toshiro Omezawa, two mana, Enchantment Saga at Uncommon. Get to choose one between target creature gets plus two plus two until end of turn, target creature gets minus one minus one until end of turn, or we gain two life, and that's for the first two chapters. So yet another way to punish one toughness creatures. And then on the final chapter, transforms into Memory of Toshiro, a 2-3 enchantment creature human samurai. Can tap, pay a life to add black mana to spend only to cast instant or sorcery spells. So two mana is pretty cheap. Assuming we can kill a one toughness creature with this, it's amazing because we get to kill a creature right away and then there's a ton more value to be gained. If it doesn't kill a one toughness creature, could still be okay, but it does lose quite a bit of value. So I think it's still a card I'm gonna play in most decks, but it could also be an amazing sideboard card if you do see a couple one toughness creatures on the opposing side. Could be great at taking out those one one enablers for the ninja deck. So if you're up against an opposing ninja deck, this could be quite strong. So yeah, just don't be afraid to side this in or side this out if you're playing best of three. In best of one, still probably happy with the first copy. So C plus for Life of Toshiro. 
Then we have the Long Reach of Night for mana for another uncommon enchantment saga. On the first two chapters, each opponent sacrifices a creature unless they discard a card. And then on the final chapter, transforms into Animus of Night's Reach, an 0-4 enchantment creature spirit with menace. And when the Animus attacks, it gets plus X plus so until end of turn, where X is the number of creature cards in defending player's graveyard. So it doesn't take too much for this to become a real threat. And in the meantime, our opponents sacrifice two creatures, or potentially discarded a couple cards. So it doesn't take too much for the uh, Long Reach of Night to be a, a nice 2 for 1, potentially even a 3 for 1. Might not catch us back up if we're very far behind on board and we top deck this in the late game. There might be scenarios where the opponent is happy to sacrifice some random tokens and then this might not be at its best. But especially when you're playing like against a, a green ramp strategy and uh, you're forcing the opponent between sacrificing their big creature or discarding a sweet card in hand. That's where this is going to be at its best. But overall, probably worthy of a B. Could see this one fall down to a C plus eventually. Malicious Malfunction, 3 mana, uncommon sorcery, saying all creatures get minus 2 minus 2 until end of turn, and if a creature would die, exile it instead. So not the first time we've seen a 3 mana black sweeper give everything minus 2 minus 2. And it usually depends on the available archetypes, how good it is. Blue-black ninjas probably doesn't want this type of effect, but I could see like a black-green removal-heavy deck wanting access to a sweeper, or maybe the black-white deck um, can use this to kind of hold off early aggression while it builds up a couple artifacts and enchantments. So I think this time around a minus two, minus two exile is going to end up being better than some of the previous iterations. So it's all format dependent. Still not a card you're going to necessarily take incredibly highly, uh, since, you know, if you take this early, not only are you taking a black card, but you're also at the same time committing to, let's say, black, white or black, green. So it's not quite as flexible as taking any old black spot removal spell. But a C for malicious malfunction is acceptable. Then March of Wretched Sorrow is part of the cycle of rares with X in their mana cost. Can exile a card from our hands. A black card I should add to make it cheaper. And then deals X damage to target creature or planeswalker and we gain X life. So gaining life on this uh, removal effect is pretty nice. Means that in a racing scenario we could gain the upper hand. It's never going to be incredibly efficient. If we have to kill like a 5-5 five, five creature, we're spending 6 mana, which we may or may not be able to. But uh, it's also an instant, so it can be quite a blowout in the middle of combat, potentially. So yeah, I like March of Wretched Sorrow, so we'll give this a B. Mukotai Ambusher is a 4 mana 3-2 artifact creature ninja rats and common has lifelink and ninjutsu for just two mana. So pretty big difference between casting it for four mana and using ninjutsu. So once again showing the importance of having those early cheap uh, flying enablers. And this is going to make it difficult for the opponent to race if we can put this in on turn two, hit them for three, gain three. Now they have to keep creatures back. If we can then interact, get some creatures out of the way, the opponent's going to fall further and further behind. Yeah, assuming you've got the enablers for it. I like Ambusher as a C+. Outside of the ninja deck, this is still okay because it's an artifact creature, so it fills a, a role in the black-white deck. And uh, as a 3-2 lifelinker, it kind of forces the opponent to trade for it or present a profitable blocker, and if they have to trade for it, then black-green could also maybe benefit from it by eventually getting it back from the graveyard. So it does seem to fit into a few different archetypes, even outside of blue-black, where it's probably going to be at its best. And an artifact, I guess, also good for red-black. Next we have Mukutai Soul Ripper, a 2-mana 4-3 artifact vehicle at rare. Crew cost is 2, so pretty cheap. And when it attacks, we may sacrifice another artifact or creature 
if we do put a plus one plus one counter on it, and it also gains some menace until end of turn. So in red black artifact sacrifice, this is going to be amazing. As something that just keeps growing over time, menace makes it very difficult to block, and at two mana we can get it out very quickly. So this could even have some constructed applications. And uh, yeah, for limited, I like it quite a bit. At the very least, the B in red black's kind of artifact sacrifice might even go closer to an A. Then we have Nashi, Moon, Sages, Scion, a 3 mana, 3 2 legendary rat ninja at mythic rare. Ninjutsu for 4 mana, so a little bit more expensive. But when it deals combat damage to a player, we get to exile the top card of each player's library. Until end of turn, we may play one of those cards, and if we cast a spell this way, we have to pay life equal to its mana value rather than pay its mana cost. So we don't have to pay any mana, just a little bit of life to get a nice bit of card advantage. And uh, yeah, especially for deck has a ton of removal to clear a path so we can keep connecting with the Scion. The uh, card advantage is going to be overwhelming. And uh, thanks to Ninjutsu, we should be able to guarantee at least the first hit. So yeah, there's a lot to like about it. Um, somewhere between an A and a B. Getting the first hit in for 4 mana, we get a 3-2. Do have to pick up a creature, but it does provide immediate card advantage. Question is, once it's in play, is it still going to be useful? I guess it is quite threatening for the opponents that are going to have to respect it, keep enough creatures back. And uh, that's where you maybe buy yourself time to develop your board a little bit more. So yeah, somewhere between a B and an A, B plus, A minus. Go with B here. Nezumi Blade Blesser is a 3 mana, 3 2 red samurai at common. Has a death touch as long as you control an artifact, and menace as long as you control an enchantment. Yeah, especially if we have both, this is going to be very difficult for the opponent to block. Of course, black white is the more intuitive home for it. So, yeah, C for Blade Blesser seems fine. Nezumi Prowler, a 2 mana, 3 1 Rat Ninja at Uncommon, Ninjutsu for just 2 mana. And when it enters the battlefield, target creature we control gains Death Touch and Life Link until end of turn. So having this stapled onto Ninjutsu means we can potentially surprise the opponent by using the Ninjutsu ability, and the creature they thought they were blocking profitably all of a sudden gains Death Touch and Life Link and ends up trading. So that's a common scenario. Plus, we could always just play this uh, just from our hands and uh, give something Death Touch and Life Link to maybe enable a different Ninjutsu creature. And uh, it's also not embarrassing just playing this on turn 2 as a 3 1, so it hits pretty hard. So, yeah, the Prowler has a lot going for it. I think might even bump it up to a B, just all those different use cases I just mentioned uh, make it. A great card, also an artifact creature, so it has a bit of synergy in other archetypes as well. Then Okiba, a Reckoner Raid, a one mana enchantment sag at common. On the first two chapters, each opponent loses one and we gain one, and eventually transforms into Nezumi, a road captain, a 2 2 enchantment creature, a rat rogue with menace, saying vehicles we control have menace. Now I don't expect black to play a ton of vehicles could maybe end up uh, in like black-white where vehicles can make up your artifact quota. But even in blue-black ninjas, I kind of like this as something you play early, drains the opponent for a little bit, and then gives you an, an evasive creature, good at enabling ninjutsu. And then if you pick it back up, you're not too sad if you replay it for just one mana, drain the opponent some more, eventually get another 2-2. In a deck that doesn't have many other one mana plays, this seems like a nice way to kick things off. And uh, yeah, again, it has a lot of cross archetype synergy between ninjas, caring about enchantments. Yeah, it just seems like a pretty good deal for one mana. Probably C. There's just not that many high impact one drops, so if you get to start out with a one drop and the opponent doesn't, that's one potential way to gain an advantage. 
Then we have Okiba, Salvage, 5 mana, Sorcery and Uncommon, saying return target creature or vehicle card from your graveyard to the battlefield. Then put two plus one plus one counters on that permanent if you control both an artifact and an enchantment. So not the easiest requirement to meet. Typically these five mana reanimation effects are sort of mediocre, because a lot of the creatures in limited are like three, four mana, so paying five mana doesn't necessarily generate a big advantage. Now, if you do get those two plus one counters, then the card becomes a lot more appealing. Just don't know if uh, there's going to be a ton of room for this type of effect in your uh, black-white, let's say, artifact enchantment deck. So I'm a bit skeptical on uh, the salvage, so start out with a conservative C. Could still be a reasonable inclusion. Reckoner Shakedown is 3 mana for a sorcery, saying target opponent reveals their hand, get to choose a non-land card from it. If we do, that player discards that card. If we don't, put 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters on a creature or vehicle we control. So one potential issue with discard effects is in the late game, if the opponent's empty-handed, they don't do anything. Well, at least with Shakedown we could still get 2 counters out of the deal, so that's nice. That being said, is this an effect I actively want? Probably not. Unless we're playing sideboarded games and I know for a fact the opponent has an unbeatable bomb, then I guess I might side this in to try and snipe it, but overall there's better cards we can be playing, so it gets a D. Reckoner's Bargain is 2 mana instant. As an additional cost to cast we have to sacrifice either an artifact or a creature, and then we gain life equal to the sacrificed permanent's mana value, and draw 2. So, somewhat reminiscent of Deadly Dispute from the recent Forgotten Realms expansion, and uh, yeah, this could be okay in like a red-black sacrifice deck, maybe black-green, where you've got some graveyard recursion, so could fit into a few different places. It's an okay card, but you do need to make sure you have the early sacrifice fodder to make it worth it. So cheap creatures with good enter the battlefield abilities come to mind, and uh, then the bargain becomes much better. You can maybe like chum block with your small creature and then sacrifice it, so you also prevented a bit of damage in the process. Those are the types of situations you want to try and set up, but uh, I'll go with C for Reckoner's Bargain. Shouldn't be in too high demand. Return to action. Two mana instant, saying until end of turn, target creature gets plus one plus two and gains lifelink, and when that creature dies, return it to the battlefield tapped under its owner's control. So we've seen these feign death type effects before, usually they cost one mana, so having to pay two mana is not ideal, makes it much more difficult to keep it up as a combo trick, and the opponent might be able to play around it more easily. Now that being said, giving a lifelink is certainly impactful in a racing situation. Maybe that makes up for it. Still falls somewhere between a C- and a D+. Not a card you want to have a ton of copies of, so like as a one-off maybe in your aggressive black deck, so could maybe be okay in a ninja deck as a way to let you enable an attack, and then the opponent's kind of between a rock and a hard place, because if they take it you could maybe enable ninjutsu. If they don't take it and they block, then return to action could be a decent trick to kind of uh, get ahead. So I'll give return to action a C, but it's certainly a low C. Soul Transfer is a 3 mana rare sorcery, saying choose one. If we control an artifact and an enchantment as we cast the spell, we can choose both instead, and then we can either exile target creature or planeswalker, or return target creature or planeswalker from our graveyard to our hand. So of course we're usually gonna want to exile a creature or planeswalker, but if we're lucky enough to get to choose both, then it's a nice two for one. So for three mana, now it is a sorcery, so no instant speed blowouts, but still a very efficient removal spell I'm happy to have in any black deck, even if I don't have any artifacts or enchantments. So easily a B, and will be awesome if you can ever choose both modes. Tatsunari, Toad Rider, 3 mana, 3-3, three, three, legendary human ninja at rare, and says whenever we cast an enchantment spell, if we don't control a creature named Kami, creates Kami, a legendary 3-3 three, three, 
black and green frog creature token that says when we cast an enchantment spell, each opponent loses one life and we gain one life. And then for one and blue-green hybrid, so either blue or green mana, we can give the Toad Rider and target frog we control unblockable except by creatures with flying or reach until end of turn. So it's quite a mouthful, but uh, we can break it down pretty easily as a 3-mana three 3-3 three, three makes another 3-3 three, three token if we play an enchantment. And if that token dies, we can make another 3-3 three, three token by playing another enchantment and can potentially drain the opponent, can make it evasive to an extent. So just a lot of very useful abilities. So assuming your deck has enough enchantments to enable it, this seems like a bomb level card. Just a ton of stats for just 3 mana. Can't really ask for more. Then we have Tribute to Horobi, a 2 mana rare enchantment saga. And this one definitely made me pause for a second. On the first two chapters, each opponent creates a 1-1 black rat rogue creature token. We don't really like giving the opponent stuff, especially not two 1-1 tokens over the course of two turns while our enchantment doesn't do anything for us. This uh, third chapter better be good. And it kind of is. Echo of Death's Whale is a 3-3 enchantment creature spirit with flying and haste. And when it enters a battlefield says gain control of all rat tokens. So we get the two token back we get the two tokens back that we gave our opponent previously, assuming they didn't die before. So it does sort of mean that while you play this, you're not allowed to attack, otherwise the opponent just chumps to you know remove your rats. So you just kinda have to sit there, let those rats hit you. And uh, the nightmare scenario is the opponent has some ninjutsu creatures and turns those rat tokens into different creatures, and you still lose the rats in the process. Yeah, especially when facing ninjutsu creatures, this is going to be pretty ugly. Assuming you're playing against an average deck without any ninjutsu creatures, you're just going to have to take a bit of damage from the rats while they, they hit you, since you don't want to lose them, and then eventually you'll get them back. And then we've got a 3-3 Flying Haste, can attack right away, and when it attacks, we may sacrifice another creature if we do draw a card. So we can turn those two rats into two extra cards, and we still have a 3-3 Haste that, you know, flies over and can attack right away, so... For two mana, it's a pretty complex card. It's gonna be pretty bad when facing opposing sacrifice decks that can sacrifice the rats, and as I mentioned, ninjutsu decks. There might be some other scenarios that are pretty bad for us, but uh, those are the ones I can think of right off the top. So, overall, tribute to Horobi. I'll land on a C+, since, uh, again, it's, it's not an easy card to get great value from cleanly without the opponent potentially interfering and messing up our plan, but if all does go according to plan, it's not bad. Then Twisted Embrace, 4 mana enchantment aura at common, enchants an artifact or creature we control, and when it enters the battlefield we get to destroy target creature or planeswalker an opponent controls. And the enchanted creature um, or rather the enchanted permanent, if it's a creature, gets plus one plus one. So a very good removal spell at common, but it does have a small requirement, which is you control a creature, and the opponent hopefully doesn't kill your creature in response. So if the opponent is keeping up mana and can potentially represent like an instant speed removal spell, it's going to be very sketchy to go for this. But if they don't, then we get a 4 mana sorcery speed removal spell that also gives our creature plus 1 plus 1. It's an enchantment to enable enchantment synergies, can maybe later get it back. So there's a lot to like about this, probably going to be at its best in black, white and black, green. But uh, yeah, overall seems like a solid common. And I think I'm willing to give this a B. Definitely the low end of B compared to some of the instant speed removal spells we've seen. But uh, yeah, still good removal that I'm happy to have. And then Undercity's Crouncher is next, 3 mana for a 1-4 artifact creature, human rogue at common, can tap to create a treasure token, but can only be used if a creature died this turn. 
So I'm going to be at its best in like a red-black artifact sacrifice deck, which uh, we haven't seen a ton of great synergies for so far. But of course we haven't covered the red cards yet, so maybe there will be more synergies there. The fact that it makes a treasure token means that an artifact is entering the battlefield, which can potentially enable some synergies as well. So yeah, outside of red-black, probably not super interested, but in red-black specifically seems okay. So I'll give this a C. Then Unforgiving One is a 3-mana 2-3 Uncommon Spirit with Menace. And when it attacks, we get to return target creature card with mana value X or less from our graveyard to the battlefield, where X is the number of modified creatures we control. Again, black doesn't have a ton of modifications necessarily, so we'll have to rely on our secondary color to provide more of those. A 2-3 minus for 3, nothing exciting, we've seen plenty of those before. And... Uh, yeah, we do need to have quite a few modified creatures before this becomes worth it. So this seems like a difficult one to trigger reliably and get a lot of uh, advantage from. So yeah, a 3 mana, 2, 3 mana is nothing special, so I think this is more of a C than anything else. And then a virus beetle is next. 2 mana, 1, 1 insect at common. And when it enters the battlefield, each opponent discards a card. So this is exactly the type of 2-drop that a lot of decks are going to want to start out with. The uh, black-white artifact enchantment deck can use this as an early artifact to enable some of its synergies, and then you don't mind sacrificing this to some effect to maybe later get back. And uh, yeah, same goes with black-green, really. Red-black artifacts can play this early, sacrifice it for value. So it just fits into a lot of different decks and uh, yeah, seems like a very nice 2-drop, similar to the Spirited Companion. This is kind of its counterpart and I'm happy giving this a C+. And then you're already dead, our final black card. 1-mana instant at common, destroying target creature that was dealt damage this turn and draw a card. So this is another great use case for our beetle that we just covered, as we can chum block something bigger and then finish it off with our 1 mana instant and draw a card in the process. It does require a little bit of setup. It's not as easy to get a, a clean 2 for 1 out of this as you might think, but uh, at single black it's not too difficult to disguise, so the opponent will have to think twice about attacking into 1 black open mana. You can attack into larger creatures with it, so potentially plays well with ninjutsu creatures as sort of if they block we can play this, if they don't block we ninjutsu. So fits into a lot of different archetypes and uh, at one mana it's just incredibly cheap. So hesitant to give this a B, but a C plus still seems appropriate. First red card, Aki Ember Keeper, 2 mana for a 2-1 enchantment creature Goblin Warrior saying whenever a non-token modified creature we control dies, create a 1-1 colorless spirit creature token. So red-green specifically is the color pair that will care the most about modified creatures. And uh, yeah, a 2-mana two 2-1 two that will incidentally create some tokens is not a bad deal. Doesn't take many tokens for this to be quite a headache for the opponent. Just keep in mind that in black we just covered a few cards that can punish the opponent for one toughness creatures. So two ones do have the danger of uh, being taken out more easily than a two toughness creature would be. But uh, still like the Ember Keeper quite a bit, so we'll give this a C+. Aki Ronin, two mana, one three, Goblin Samurai, so goes in the red black or a red white Samurai and Warrior deck says whenever a samurai or warrior you control attacks alone, you may discard a card if you do draw a card. So you have to discard before drawing, also known as rummaging instead of looting, but uh, yeah, they're very similar. So Aki Ronin seems like a, a fine filler card for the red-white deck, but nothing amazing, so C for Ronin. Then Aki Warpaint is a 1-mana enchantment aura at common, giving the enchanted artifact or creature plus 2 plus 1. So 
pretty small boost in power and toughness. And of course comes at the risk of getting 2 for 1. So not a big fan, give this a D. Ambitious Assault is kind of our trumpet blast effect of the set. 3 mana instant. Creatures we control get plus 2 plus 0 until end of turn. And if we control a modified creature we also get to draw a card. A red-green is not the color pair I associate with a go-white deck. We've seen a few white cards that um, make a few tokens where this might be at its best. But uh, even with the uh, two-mana Aki Ember Keeper we just covered, this is not a bad combo with it. Both cards care about modified creatures. Also, it doesn't care that the creatures have to be attacking, so you can actually use it defensively as well. So, Ambitious Assault seems like a playable trick. Um, just make sure you have enough cheap creatures, ideally token makers, make it uh, even better. And if it replaces itself, it seems like a pretty nice inclusion. Next we have the Legendary Spirit Dragon at Mythic in red, so gets an S. 4 mana, 4-4 four, four Flying Trampler. When it dies, we get to choose one between exiling the top two cards of our library. Until the end of our next turn, we may play those cards, or we create three treasure tokens. Yeah, both of those sound like a pretty good deal. Probably want to go for the card advantage, unless we're ramping into something specific. But uh, another must-answer card that still leaves behind a lot of value, even if you do. Bronze Plate Boar is a 3 mana 3 2 artifact creature equipment boar with trample and has reconfigure for 5 mana, so pretty pricey, giving the equipped creature plus 3 plus 2 and trample. This card might have been a little bit better as a 2 3 trampler because then it could actually hold off opposing random 2 2 creatures, and then eventually, if the board is stalled, we can reconfigure, maybe power up one of our larger creatures and make it more difficult for the opponent to chum block. As a 3-2, kind of puts you in this awkward spot if the opponent is sending in a couple two-powered creatures, as then you have to decide, if, is it worth it to keep my board? Do I want to trade it off? And then we don't really make use of the reconfigure as much. But uh, yeah, it's still just upside on a 3-2 trampler for three. It's also an artifact, which has a bit of upside in a lot of decks. But... Uh, not as excited about this as I probably should be. don't even know if I'm going up to C plus for this, just because 2 toughness just trades so poorly. So I think I'm just going with C for Bronze Plate Boar. I kind of expected more from it, but the reconfigure is also just very expensive. Next is Crackling Emergence, 2 mana for an enchantment aura. Enchants a land we control, so that's kind of weird. And the Enchanted Land is a 3-3 red spirit creature with haste. It's still a land. And there's a bit of protection built in, because if the Enchanted Land would be destroyed, instead sacrifice the Emergence and the land gains indestructible until end of turn. It seems okay because it protects the land so it doesn't die. 3-3 hastes, those sound like pretty nice words. But we also have to realize that if we enchant our lands, we're basically either giving up a land to have it be a creature, or we're not attacking and blocking with the creature and still tapping the land for mana. So in either one of those scenarios, we're probably not very happy, even though 2 mana 3-3 three, three haste sounds nice. So I don't think this card's particularly playable. I'll give this a D. Next is Dragon Spark Reactor, a 2 mana uncommon artifact. And when the reactor or another artifact enters a battlefield under our control, put a charge counter on it. And then we can pay 4 mana, sacrifice the, re sacrifice the reactor to deal damage equal to the number of charge counters on it to target player, and that much damage to up to one target creature. It takes a while for the reactor to get going. Your deck needs to be pretty dedicated to the whole artifact theme, play a lot of them ideally. Maybe play some tokens, like we saw with the Anvil in black-red, which could put a lot of counters on the reactor. Those are the types of combos we want to assemble. And then, yeah, if we can play this early, then late game, this could potentially deal like 10 damage to the opponents and kill a creature. Of course, it is for mana to sacrifice, so it's a little pricey. Yeah, it all depends how the rest of your deck is 
setup, this could end up being like too slow, requires too much setup, or it could be the best card in your deck if you have enough enablers for it. So overall, where do I fall on Dragon Spark Reactor? Probably like a C, where the decks that really want it should be able to get it late, so I don't think you'll have to first pick it or take it highly. But in the decks where it's good, it might be really good. Yeah, C seems fine for Dragon Spark Reactor. Then Experimental Synthesizer is a one mana artifact at common. When it enters the battlefield or leaves the battlefield, we get to exile the top card of our library, and until end of turn, we may play that card. And three mana to sacrifice it and create a 2 2 white samurai creature token with vigilance. So for a one drop, this has a lot going for it. Now it's probably not a card we want to play on turn 1, because then we won't be able to make use of the extra card when it enters. And uh, we don't necessarily have to pay the 3 mana to sack it. If we have another way to sacrifice the synth Synthesizer, then we'll also have more mana to potentially play whatever card we exiled. So if we have a different effect that sacrifices an artifact, it might be even better. But uh, yeah, for a 1 mana artifact, this potentially does a lot. So I like C plus for it, but probably only going to be amazing in like a, a red black sacrifice deck. But even in a red white kind of warrior samurai, this is a card we could conceivably play early if we're kind of lacking cheap plays. But if we also top deck it in a late game, this could be an awesome two for one or even three for one. So yeah, for one mana, this seems pretty de pretty decent. So C plus. Explosive Entry is a 2 mana sorcery, destroying up to 1 target artifact and putting a plus 1 plus 1 counter on up to 1 target creature. So we covered the 1 mana artifact removal, which I wasn't too fond of. This one doesn't have any restrictions in terms of mana values, and we also get to put a plus 1 counter somewhere. We can even cast this without destroying an artifact just to get a plus 1 counter if we don't have anything else going on, because it says up to 1. So. This seems more like a card I would main deck compared to the white artifact removal. So Explosive Entry I think gets a, a C. Explosive Singularity is a 10 mana Mythic Rare Sorcery. As an additional cost to cast it, we may tap any number of untapped creatures, and then we get a 1 mana discount for each one, and then it deals 10 damage to any target. So it can also go upstairs. Yeah, I mean, as a finisher, if the opponent's at 10 life, this seems pretty great. Maybe have 3 or 4 creatures out, then this turns into like a 6 or 7 mana finisher, which is still realistic. And uh, yeah, hopefully red is aggressive enough where dealing the first 10 points of damage is manageable. A nice little uh, convoke finisher, as it were. And uh, we'll give this a B. Fable of the Mirror Breaker, a callback to Kiki Jiki, a 3 mana rare enchantment saga. On the first chapter, creates a 2 2 red goblin shaman a token, saying when this creature attacks, create a treasure token. So reminiscent of Captain Lannery Storm. Then on the second chapter, we made this card up to 2 cards if we do draw that many cards. So a nice bit of card selection. And then on the final chapter, it transforms into Reflection of Kiki Jiki, a 2 2 enchantment creature. Can pay one mana, tap it to create a token that's a copy of another target non legendary creature we control, except it has haste and we have to sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. Not quite Kiki Jiki, but very close. Can uh, re trigger some enter the battlefield abilities, allow you to get some extra damage in. So, certainly does a lot. And uh, could even chum block with the token. Um, if we activate Reflections of Kiki Jiki in our end step, then the token will stay until the next end step. So that's potentially one way to make two tokens to attack with at once. So there's a lot of neat stuff you can do, similar to the original Kiki Jiki, although maybe a little bit more difficult to like uh, assemble an infinite combo with it, since you need to pay the one mana every time. But uh, yeah, still seems very powerful, and we'll give this an A, bomb level card. Even the 2-2 token that makes the treasures already quite strong.
then flame discharge X and red for an instant at uncommon, dealing X damage to target creature or planeswalker. If we controlled a modified creature, then it deals X plus two damage instead. So that doesn't seem too difficult for a lot of red decks to achieve. And uh, yeah, even without a modified creature, it's still an okay removal spell. So all things combined, probably like a C plus, maybe a, a B minus in the right red green modified deck. A Gift of Wrath is a 4 mana enchantment aura at common, enchanting an artifact or creature, giving it plus 2 plus 2 and menace. And when it leaves the battlefield, we get to make a 2 2 red spirit creature token with menace. So this kind of solves one of the problems with auras, which is getting 2 for 1s and losing everything in the process. At least here we get a 2 2 menace token in return, which, you know, could still provide a nice bit of board presence. So Gift of Wrath seems like a playable aura that I wouldn't be embarrassed to put in my deck. Can also count as a modification, so especially in red-green could be helpful. So I'll give this a, a C, a playable aura for once. Next we have the legendary enchantment creature Shrine in red, the Goshentai of Ancient Wars. 3 mana 2-2 two, two first striker, pretty decent stats. And then at the beginning of our end step, can pay one mana to deal X damage to target player or planeswalker where X is the number of shrines we control. So this can just kind of sit there, 2-2 two, two first strike. Not a bad card to have on defense. And then if we have the spare mana, can start pinging away. And if we can lift the dream and assemble multiple shrines, this will quickly end the game as well. Yeah, probably still a C+. Plus goes up very quickly in value as soon as you assemble more than one shrine. Next we have Goro Goro, Disciple of Ryusei, a 2 mana, 2-2 two, two legendary goblin samurai at rare. Can pay a red mana to give our creatures haste until end of turn. And can pay 5 mana to create a 5-5 five, five red dragon spirit creature token with flying. Can only activate this if we control an attacking modified creature. Yeah, this card seems awesome. A 2-2 two, two with a ton of upside. Just paying a red mana to give all our creatures haste would already make this a very good card. And then the 5 mana ability is a game winning. Shouldn't be too difficult to attack with modified creatures without giving too much in the process. And even if it does require us to kind of give up a creature to turn it into a 5-5 five, five dragon, that might be a trade we're happy to make. So this seems like a bomb level card, gets an A. Then we have Heiko Yamazaki, the general, completes the kind of a cycle with the reds, or with a white legendary samurai, a 4 mana, 3-3, three, three, a legendary human samurai with trample, and whenever a samurai or warrior we control attacks alone, we may cast a target artifact card from our graveyard this turn, as opposed to an enchantment. Now this is 4 mana compared to 3 mana for enchantments, so this one seems a little bit worse, but yeah, still not a bad inclusion. So I think a C plus seems fine here. Next we have Invoke Calamity as part of our Invoke cycle, so 5 mana including Quadruple Red for an instant saying we may cast up to two instant and or sorcery spells with total mana value six or less from our graveyard and or hand without paying their mana costs. And if those spells would be put into our graveyard, they get exiled instead. And we exile Invoke Calamity, so no infinite shenanigans. As I said, it's going to be somewhat difficult to have a deck that has a ton of instants and sorceries we necessarily want to play with this. Somewhat hesitant to uh, give this too high of a grade because of that. Now, if we do happen to have two nice removal spells in the graveyard, maybe we're like a, a red-black deck that just happens to pick up a couple nice removal spells along the way, then five mana to get two of them back to maybe kill two additional creatures. That doesn't sound like a bad deal. So, yeah, probably go with like C for Invoke Calamity. Also still have the problem of quadruple red, which isn't the easiest to cast. Iron Hoof Boar is next, a 6-mana 5-4 artifact creature boar with trample and haste. 
can also channel it for two mana and then we get to discard it to give target creature plus three plus one and trample until end of turn so six mana five four trample haste pretty nice creature to top deck in the late game and we have the flexibility of the combat trick so yeah this seems like a pretty sweet inclusion with uh, a lot of flexibility so i'm happy to have access to it and uh, c plus for iron hoof boar similar to i think the crab we gave a c plus as well has similar flexibility Kami of Industry, 5 mana, 3 6, spirit at common. When it enters the battlefield, return target artifact card with mana value 3 or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. It gains haste and sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. Bit of a strange card. Have to have an artifact that we can maybe sacrifice as soon as we get it back, so we can uh, sacrifice it on our own terms as opposed to having to sacrifice it end of turn. 3-6 for 5, good blocker, not the best attacker, so kind of weird stats to see in red, but maybe in a red-black sacrifice deck you'll still want this. Still not uh, very high on it, so C for Kami of Industry. Kami's Flare on the other hand is great, a 2-mana instant at common, dealing 3 damage to target creature or planeswalker, and also deals 2 damage to that permanent controller if we control a modified creature. So ignore the modified creature part, this is a B. And the modified creature part, it's still a B, but even better. So very happy with Kami's Flare. Having cheap instants, also a great way to potentially counter the uh, ninja strategies, as we can still maybe kill something after the opponent uses ninjutsu to cheat something into play. Kindled Fury is a 1 mana instant, giving target creature plus 1 plus 2 and first strike until end of turn. Not a terrible combo trick if you're in the market for combo tricks. My kind of uh, hesitation here is that there's cards like Iron Hoof Boar in the set, which give you the flexibility of a combo trick with channel as well as having a 6 mana creature attached to it. So why play Kindled Fury when you could play Iron Hoof Boar? Of course, you're not always going to have the option to play Iron Hoof Boar, but overall leaves a little bit to be desired when uh, playing Kindle Fury, so I'll give this a D. Then we have Kumano faces Kakazan, a 1 mana uncommon enchantment saga, and on chapter 1 it deals 1 damage to each opponent and each planeswalker they control. When we cast our next creature spell this turn on chapter 2, that creature enters the battlefield with a plus one plus one counter on it, and eventually transforms into etchings of Kumano, a 2-2 creature, enchantment creature with haste, saying if a creature dealt damage at this turn by a source we controlled, it would die, exile it instead. So a nice little upside. Yeah, this seems awesome for a one drop. If we can play this, play 2-drop on turn 2, it picks up a counter, turn 3 we get a 2-2 haste. That's quite a bit of pressure, so for an aggressive red deck this is perfect. It's uh, not going to have the most synergy in terms of creature types as a human shaman. An enchantment in red's not as good as an artifact would be, but past that it's still a pretty good deal for 1 mana. So C plus for the one mana saga and potentially also card with constructed applications for what it's worth. Next is Lizard Blades, a two mana 1-1 one, one artifact creature equipment lizard with double strike and we can reconfigure it for just two mana to give the equipped creature double strike. So already a two mana 1-1 one, one double strike is playable especially if we have some pump spells to go with it and reconfigure makes it even better. So Lizard Blades, a high B, might even sneak its way into the A category. If we can combine it especially with like a large green creature that maybe tramples, this could end the game in a hurry. March of Reckless Joy, part of the cycle, so an instant can exile a red card from our hands to make it too cheaper. And then we get to exile the top X cards of our library, play up to two of those cards until the end of our next turn. So, 
can potentially provide a little bit of card advantage. Um, probably a card you want to play as kind of the last card in your hands when you have the most mana available to try and get the most value. So yeah, decent two for one, maybe a little bit expensive um, compared to some of the blue options, but C plus for March, red green especially doesn't get a ton of source of uh, sources of card advantage. So this could be a nice curve topper in that style of deck where green helps you make more mana for it. Then Ogre Head Helm is a 2 mana 2-2 two -two artifact creature equipment Ogre at rare and gives the equipped creature plus 2 plus 2 if we reconfigure it for 3 mana. And when the equipped creature or the helm deals combat damage to a player, we may sacrifice it and if we do, discard our hand to draw 3. So potentially a nice way to refuel if we're empty handed, draw 3 cards, although you know, the 2-2 two -two creature's unlikely to connect in the late game once we want to sacrifice it. And if we did have to reconfigure it, then we had to invest a little bit of mana into the whole process. But still, a nice way to potentially refuel, and you can always just keep it as an equipment. So, as far as 2-drops go, this is a very good one. And C+, plus, B-, minus, somewhere in that range. I'll go with uh, B for Ogre Head Helm. Peerless Samurai is a 3 mana 2 3 human samurai at common, has menace, and says whenever a samurai or warrior you control attacks alone, the next spell you cast this turn costs 1 generic mana less to cast. So, not a bad effect. Can help us get on the board quickly in those red white samurai and warrior decks. And, uh, yeah, any mana discount is appreciated. So, Peerless Samurai, playable, not particularly exciting, probably still just a C, but in red-white you'll be happy with as many of these as you can get. Rabbit Battery is a 1-mana one 1-1 one -one artifact creature equipment rabbit at uncommon, has haste, and says equipped creature gets plus one plus one and has haste and reconfigures for just a single red. So incredibly cheap as an equipment, and can maybe chip in as a creature as well. So Crystal Slipper has come a long way. Yeah, Rabbit Battery seems awesome. And uh, I'll go as far as giving this a B. Seems great for any aggressive red deck, even an artifact for your artifact synergies. Reinforced Ronin, one mana for a 2-2 artifact creature, Human Samurai with haste. And at the beginning of your end step, return it to its owner's hand. Can also be channeled for two mana, discard it, and draw a card. So channel on this type of effect is perfect, since we can play it early, get some damage in. It's a way to continuously trigger enters the battlefield abilities on cards that care about artifacts entering the battlefield, like maybe the reactor we mentioned earlier. And then in the late game, once the 2-2 doesn't have a chance to attack anymore, we can simply uh, channel it and replace it. So as far as one drops go, this is another very solid inclusion and will lead to some fun gameplay patterns potentially. So C plus for reinforced Ronin. Scrap Welder is a three mana three three goblin artificer at rare can tap and sacrifice an artifact with mana value X to return target artifact card with mana value less than X from our graveyard to the battlefield. It also gains haste until end of turn. So sadly, has to be mana value less than X, so it's difficult to gain too much advantage from the ability, but uh, it's still upside on a 3 mana 3-3, three three, which is still a fine creature. So can be too picky about it and could potentially set up some very sweet artifact recursion loops which uh, especially red black will be able to take advantage of so c plus for scrap welder scrapyard steel breaker is a four mana three four artifact creature human warrior at common can pay a mana sacrifice another artifact to give it plus two plus one until end of turn so once again, threat of activation is what matters, even if you don't intend to sacrifice anything. 
the opponent still has to respect the pump ability. And then an artifact creature is uh, always nice to have. So overall, still probably a C for the Scrapyard Steelbreaker, but in the right red-black artifact sacrifice deck, this goes up in value. Seismic Wave is a 3-mana instant at uncommon, dealing 2 damage to any targets and 1 damage to each non-artifact creature target opponent controls. So if the creature we're targeting is a non-artifact, it's going to end up taking 3 damage total. So 3 damage plus the potential of wiping away some 1-toughness creatures. Sounds like a pretty good deal for 3 mana. So unless you're up against an artifact deck where this is going to be a little bit lackluster, Seismic Wave should be pretty solid. So C plus for Seismic Wave. Next is the Shattered States Era, a 5 mana enchantment saga at common. On chapter 1 we gain control of target creature until end of turn, untap it and that creature gains haste until end of turn, so our typical act of treason effect. Then on chapter 2 our creatures get one additional power until end of turn. And finally it transforms into Nameless Conqueror, a 3-3 enchantment creature with trample and haste. So pretty slow effect in the sense that we have to wait until maybe turn 7 to get our 3-3 three, three creature, which is quite a while, at which point a 3-3 three, three might not be all that impactful anymore. Difficult card to evaluate in maybe like a red-black sacrifice deck, where we can sacrifice the thing we steal. This is something we want, although a lot of the sacrifice effects require mana to activate, so then we might have to wait until we have like 6 or 7 mana before we can play this and then sacrifice the creature we steal. So just incredibly slow compared to the typical 3 mana Act of Treason effect. Not super high on the Shattered States era, but as always need to be respectful of those Act of Treasons. So I'll give it a, a C grade. Next is Simeon Sling, a 1 mana 1-1 one, one artifact creature equipment monkey. And uh, when the Simeon Sling or the equipped creature becomes blocked, it deals 1 damage to defending player. And reconfigures for just 2 mana. So another nice little 1-drop we can get in play early. And then late game still provides a bit of value, potentially dealing those last points of damage. So yeah, seems like a nice little 1-drop that I'm happy to have in uh, most red decks, especially in uh, kind of artifact synergy decks. So we'll give this a C. Sokens on Smelter is a 2-mana two 2-2, two -two, uncommon Goblin Artificer, saying at the beginning of combat on your turn, you may pay 1 mana and sacrifice an artifact. If you do, create a 3-1 red construct artifact creature token with haste. So the fact that the token is actually an artifact is very relevant to potentially enable more artifact synergies. And uh, yeah, it's not that expensive to activate this ability. There's going to be quite a few artifacts we don't mind sacrificing. So for a 2-drop, that's a 2-2. Two -two. This is a ton of upside. So C plus for the Smelter. And once again, a red-black card mainly. Tempered in Solitude, a 2-mana uncommon enchantment, saying whenever a creature you control attacks alone, exile the top card of your library, and you may play that card this turn. So potentially a card draw engine for the red-white kind of warrior samurai deck, but it could also be nice alongside some evasive creatures, which is more of a blue thing, so maybe this is still a card you can play in like a blue-red deck, even if it doesn't have any artifact synergy. It's still not the easiest card to make work, so you do need a pretty specific deck for this to be worth it. So you can give it more than a C, but could be playable under the right circumstances. Thundering Raiju is a 4-mana 3-3 three, three rare spirit with haste, saying when the Raiju attacks, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on target creature we control, and then the Raichu deals X damage to each opponent, where X is the number of modified creatures we control other than the Raichu. So we could technically put the plus one counter on the Raichu itself, making it into a 4-4 four, four haste for 4, 
which is already great. And then it just keeps adding more counters to the team, potentially dealing a, a lot of damage in the process as well. So this seems like a bomb, very hard to deal with when played on curve. Gets an A. Then we have the Towashi Song Shaper 2 mana 2-2. Two, two. Artifact creature, human artificer at common. And whenever another artifact enters a battlefield under our control, it gets plus one plus so until end of turn. So we've seen quite a few ways to potentially repeatedly generate artifacts to trigger cards like the Song Shaper. So should be able to attack as a 3-2 pretty reliably, potentially even more. So for a 2-drop in the red aggro decks, this seems excellent. And uh, yeah, potentially even a C+. Twin Shot Sniper, 4 mana, 2-3, Artifact, Creature, Goblin, Artificer, at Uncommon. Has Reach, and when the Sniper enters the battlefield, it deals 2 damage to any target. So, maybe Flame Tongue Cowwood this is not, but it's definitely approaching it. Potentially getting us a nice 2 for 1. And then we also have the flexibility of Channel for 2 mana, can discard it to deal 2 damage to any target. So it can even go upstairs if needed. And uh, yeah, 2-3 reach in reds helps you deal with those pesky flyers. So it seems amazing and gets a B. Unstoppable Ogre, a 3 mana, 4-1 artifact, Ogre Warrior at common. When it enters a battlefield, target creature cannot block this turn. So one toughness kind of rings some alarm bells in the background, but a 4-1 hits pretty hard. Wish we could prevent something from blocking when the ogre actually attacks, which uh, is not going to be the case. So it seems like something the opponent can still handle pretty easily. But in a very aggressive red deck, both a 4-1 that kind of forces the opponent to respect it, as well as preventing something from blocking, this could be pretty good in multiples, where we just kind of chain together a few ogres, and maybe eventually figure out a way to go over the top with maybe an equipment or a pump spell. Can maybe trample over thanks to that uh, iron hoof boar. So that, that those are kind of the synergies you want to keep an eye out on. So unstoppable ogre, still nothing exciting, but seems playable. Go with a C. Upriser Renegade, 2 mana, 1 3 human samurai at uncommon. And the Renegade gets plus 2 plus 0 for each other modified creature we control. Does need a little bit of work, but there are a few ways we can already get a modified creature on turn 3, in which case this could attack for 3 on turn 3, which is pretty decent. And then in a late game, it could even become uh, a lot better. Now it does say other modified creatures. So modifying the Renegade itself isn't going to be good enough. But uh, yeah, still seems okay. So especially in like a red-green deck, this should be one of your better 2-drops. So I'll go with a C+, but just keep in mind that it's not going to be all that great outside of a red-green. Voltage Surge, 1 mana instant at common. As an additional cost to cast it, we may sacrifice an artifact. And then it deals 2 damage to target creature or planeswalker. If we paid the additional cost, it deals 4 damage instead. So even just 2 damage for 1 mana would be okay, but we get the additional upside of potentially dealing 4 damage. Now it doesn't go upstairs to the opponent's face, but still a nice little removal spell gets a C+. Seems like a great answer to the various ninja decks. Our first green card is Azusa's Many Journeys, a 2 mana uncommon enchantment saga. On the first chapter lets us play an additional land this turn, on chapter 2 we gain 3 life, and finally it transforms into a likeness of the Seeker, a 3-3 three, three enchantment creature, that when it becomes blocked lets us untap up to 3 lands we control. So not a bad way to ramp, letting us play an extra land and gaining some life. Of course is lacking card draw, but eventually it turns into a 3-3, three, three, which you know sort of counts as drawing a card and putting a 3-3 three, three in play for free. So sounds like a pretty great deal for 2 mana. Of course, if we draw it late game, it's going to be a lot less exciting when we have to wait two turns for it to do anything relevant, so we do have to take that into account as well. But when played on turn two, this is going to lead to some very powerful starts indeed. So we'll go with C+. 
Next is a Bamboo Grove Archer, a 2 mana 3-3 three, three enchantment creature, Snake Archer at common. Has Defender and Reach, so a great early defensive creature to have access to. And Enchantment, a very relevant card type in green especially. And for 5 mana we can channel it to destroy target creature with flying. So if the opponent has a creature that's somehow bigger than our uh, Archer, we can still take it out if needed. So yeah, the Archer seems like a very nice 2-drop for a more defensive green deck that wants to set up for the late game C+. Bearer of Memory, a 3-mana three 3-2 three, enchantment creature at common. And for 6-mana, can put a plus up a swan counter on target enchantment creature. Also gains Trample until end of turn. So a little bit narrow in terms of what it can put a counter onto, also very expensive. Does have Threat of Activation, although the threat of putting a counter on the bear itself still only turns it into a 4-3, so an opposing 3-powered creature still trades for it, so it's nothing too amazing. But it is a mana sink if your deck is lacking those in a late game, you'll still be happy to have access to it to eventually start growing some of your creatures. And a lot of the creatures in green happen to be enchantment creatures, besides the bearer itself. So, C for Bear of Memory, fine card, but you do need to kind of work for it to really make it worthwhile. Blossom Prancer is a 5 mana 4 4 creature, spirit at uncommon, has reach, and when it enters the battlefield, we can look at the top 5 cards of our library, reveal a creature or enchantment from among them, put into our hands, rest goes on the bottom, and if we didn't, we still get to gain 4 life. So if we want to, we can always choose the 4 life over the card, which there might be situations where that's necessary. But a 5 mana 4 4 with reach that essentially draws a card when it enters seems awesome. So Blossom Prancer gets a B. Very good card. Boon of Boseju, a 2 mana instant at uncommon, saying target creature gets plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the greatest mana value among permanents you control, and we get to untap it. So I imagine for the most part we're gonna have at least a 2 mana creature in play, turning this into plus 2 plus 2 and untap, but it could easily get a lot more powerful in the late game if we have like a 4 or 5 mana creature in play. As far as combo tricks go, this seems like a pretty good one. Still probably won't give it more than a C, but uh, I could see this doing quite a bit of work under the right circumstances. Next is Boseju Reaches Skyward, a 4 mana uncommon saga. On chapter 1 we can search for two basic forest cards to put into our hand, sadly not into play right away. On chapter 2 put up to one target land card from your graveyard on top of your library. So we're accumulating a lot of lands. A 0 0 creature that gets plus 1 plus 1 for each land we control becomes bigger the more lands we have, and Boseju can potentially accumulate 3 lands total. It's not going to be too difficult to make that into a large threat, and then the fact that it searches up 2 forests is already kind of a 2 for 1, even if it doesn't technically ramp us. Chapter 2 is probably not going to do a whole lot, since I don't expect our graveyard to be filled with a ton of lands necessarily. But uh, I guess it's pure upside. Maybe plays with those uh, channel lands that we'll see at rare that you can discard for a certain effects. Seems like a pretty good deal for 4 mana. So we'll give this a B. Next we have a Careful Cultivation. A 3 mana enchantment aura at common. Can enchant an artifact or creature. As long as the enchanted permanent is a creature, it gets plus 1 plus 3 and a reach and can also tap for double green. But the effect we're actually most interested in is the channel ability, which lets us pay 2 mana, discard it, and create a 1-1 one, one green human monk creature token that can, uh, can uh, tap for green mana. A nice 2 mana accelerant that we can essentially play at instant speed, so the opponent is less likely to be able to remove our creature. And then we also have the upside of potentially playing the enchantment aura, if that lines up even better. So get quite a bit of flexibility on top of a 2-mana ramp creature, which is awesome for a common here. So C-plus for careful cultivation. 
Then we have Coiling Stalker, 2 mana, 2 1 at common. Snake Ninja, so one of the few ninjutsu creatures in green. Again, ninjutsu for just 2 mana, and when the Stalker deals combat damage to a player, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on a target creature we control that doesn't have a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it. So potentially a way to get some modified creatures going on our side. Now, 2-1, not all that exciting. 1 toughness potentially could be a problem. But if we can ninjutsu it, it quickly picks up a plus 1 counter to make it a little bit bigger. But there's no way to really snowball it into a huge creature since it limits to uh, 1 counter. Still seems fine, like a playable C level common. Next is Commune with Spirits, 1 mana sorcery, lets you look at the top 4 cards of your library, reveal an enchantment or land to put into our hand, rest goes on the bottom. Pretty narrow little cantrip, don't think it's a card I'll include in a lot of decks, even if I do have a sufficient number of enchantments, and of course can always hit a land as well, but just seems kind of unnecessary unless there's a specific bomb we're looking for that we need the Commune with Spirits. So, give this a D. Could be good in, indeed, like a shrine deck that needs to assemble a bunch of different shrines. So you should be able to pick it up if necessary. Next is the Dragon Kami Reborn, 3 mana rare saga. On the first two chapters, we gain 2 life and look at the top 3 cards of our library, exiling one of them face down with a hatching counter on it. And then we put the rest on the bottom and eventually transforms into... Dragon Kami's Egg, which is an 0-1 enchantment creature, saying when the egg or a dragon we control dies, we may cast a creature spell from among cards we own in exile with hatching counters on them without paying its mana cost. Of course, getting to look at essentially uh, 6 cards total makes it pretty likely that we'll have found a good creature to exile that we then get to cast for free. We did get to gain a bit of life in the process. So that's nice, but we still need to go through the trouble of actually having our 0-1 die before we can uh, play that card for free. And we're also not guaranteed to get a huge mana discount if we only found like a random 3-drop. So potentially a nice uh, combo enabler for limited. It seems medium and best. Um, there's not going to be a lot of other dragons to combo with it necessarily. So Dragon Kami Reborn. Seems like a, a fun setup card if you have the saga in your deck. You probably want to be on the lookout for including as many expensive creatures as possible. Cards with channel, of course, have natural synergy with it. So C plus for Dragon Kami Reborn. Next is Fade into Antiquity, a 3 mana sorcery, exiling target artifact or enchantments. I believe this is also a reprint, but... Uh, in this set, where there's a ton of artifacts and enchantments floating around, they probably don't want to give us a 2-mana naturalize at uh, instant speed, so instead we get a 3-mana sorcery speed version, which is still totally main deckable. I imagine this will be a card you're happy to have in any green deck, up to maybe 2 copies even. Um, although there will be matchups where you might have to sideboard this out if you're playing best of 3, but for the most part I'll be happy with... Uh, a fade into antiquity and C plus seems like a good grade for it. Fang of Shigeki is a 1 mana 1 1 enchantment creature snake ninja with death touch. So, actually, a great enabler for ninjutsu as well, even though green doesn't have a ton of them. There's maybe a little bit of overlap with blue or black in the other ninja colors, and then this is a, a great one to attack with and hopefully cheat some creatures into play. And then being an enchantment also has interesting synergies in green. C plus for Fang of Shigeki. Favor of Jukai is a 4-man enchantment aura, enchanting an artifact or creature. And as long as the enchanted permanent is a creature, gets plus 3, plus 3 and reach. But we can also channel it for 2 mana, in which case it's a nice combo trick, giving target creature plus 3, plus 3 and reach until end of turn. So the flexibility here is nice. Being an aura means it can modify a creature. And the uh, stats increase is pretty significant here. 3 extra power and reach is quite a bit. That being said, there's still the risk of getting 2 for 1. 
but we can always just keep this as a combo trick instead. If it didn't have the channel ability, I would give this a D. With the channel ability, I think this becomes a very playable card in any green deck, especially red-green, if you care about modified. So we'll give this a C. Generous Visitor, a 1-mana one 1-1, one, one, Creature Spirit at Uncommon, saying whenever we cast an enchantment spell, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on target creature. So we don't even have to put the counter on the Visitor itself, we can put it wherever it suits us best. And there's no shortage of enchantments, especially in green, green-white is the main enchantment color, but can make up a lot of other cool synergies in various colors. So if we can play turn one visitor and then play a couple enchantments, the value quickly adds up. So this seems like an easy B. Geothermal Kami is a 4 mana 4-3 four, spirit at common. When, when it enters the battlefield, we may return an enchantment we control to its owner's hand. And if we do, we gain 3 life. So maybe a way to reset a... Uh, saga enchantment, so we can get the value from the first couple chapters again. It's a May ability, so it's upside on a 4-3. can maybe save an enchantment creature that's locked underneath an opposing enchantment. So there's a lot of scenarios where this can provide a nice little advantage. At the end of the day, nothing amazing, so we'll give this a C. The Goshintai of a Boundless Vigor is the 2-mana Green Shrine. It's another legendary enchantment creature. This one, a 1-1 one, one Trampler. And at the beginning of our end step, can pay 1 mana to put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it for each shrine we control. And I guess we can choose any target shrine. So by itself, it's pretty slow to get bigger. But it does have synergy with Modified. And it does also have enchantment synergy, so it kind of fits into a lot of the different green archetypes. And then of course the dream is to get multiple shrines going, at which point this turns into quite a threat. So overall I'll give this a C+, mainly for the modified synergy. Grafted Growth is a 3-mana enchantment aura at common, enchants a land. When it enters we can put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on target creature or vehicle we control. And then the enchanted land taps for 2-mana of any one color. So a very similar effect we've seen in the past. This time we can also put our counter on a vehicle, which is additional upside. So if we're playing a ramp strategy that needs to make more mana, this is one way to do it. And uh, ideally we also care about modified creatures as the plus one counter is a way to enable it. So fine card, nothing special, gets a C. Greater Tanuki is a 6-mana six 6-5 six enchantment creature dog at common, has trample and channel, lets us discard it to search up a basic land to put on the battlefield tapped. So an excellent way to ramp. So additional copies of the Greater Tanuki kind of enable the other copies, so I'll pretty much play as many of these as I can get, because we can first channel to ramp and then start playing 6-mana six 6-5 six creatures which are quite sizable in this set where creatures tend to be on the smaller side, vehicles tend to be a little bit bigger, but a 6-5 is still bigger than most vehicles. And then uh, also an enchantment for potential enchantment synergies. So yeah, there's a lot to like about it. C+. I like all the big channel creatures pretty much. Harmonious Emergence, a 4-mana enchantment aura, enchanting a land we control. And then turns it into a 4-5 a green spirit creature with vigilance and haste that's still a land. And similar to the red enchantment, if the land would be destroyed, instead we get rid of the emergence and the land gains indestructible until end of turn. So the big difference here is the vigilance keyword, allowing us to attack with our 4-5. And then second main, if needed, we can still tap it for mana, which is something we weren't able to do with the red enchantment. A 4-5 also quite a bit larger and more impactful. So Harmonious Emergence I actually don't dislike as far as 4-drops uh, go. Of course, ideally want to play this once you have 5 mana, so the 4-5 can attack right away as opposed to being tapped. So treat this more like a 5-drop. So that also factors into it, but C for Harmonious Emergence, I think it's playable. Heir of the Ancient Fang is a 3-mana 2-3 Snake Samurai at common. When it enters a battlefield, 
It enters with a plus one plus one counter on it if we control a modified creature. Now it's not going to be trivial to control a two mana modified creature, so it's unlikely that we can play the Heir of the Ancient Fang on turn three with a counter on it already. But if we can somehow get there, then this card's great. Otherwise, it's more like something we can maybe double spell with on turn five or six and get the extra counter from it, and then it counts as an additional modified creature for potential more modified synergy. So, fine card, still probably just a C. If we were able to enable the air more reliably on turn three, it would go up in value for sure. Historian's Wisdom, a three mana enchantment aura, enchanting an artifact or a creature, it's an uncommon. And when it enters a battlefield, if the enchanted permanent is a creature with the greatest power among creatures on the battlefield, get to draw a card. And as long as the enchanted permanent is a creature, it gets plus two plus one. Not too difficult to get to draw the extra card off of it, considering the bonus. Unless you're a modified deck that really wants the uh, modified bonus, basically, then you're probably still not interested in it and there's still the risk of the opponent having instant speed interaction to mess it up. But yeah, in red-green modified it's probably fine, otherwise I'll give it a C. Then we have Invoke the Ancients, a 5 mana rare sorcery, part of the Invoke cycle, so quadruple green, creates two 4-5 green spirit creature tokens, and for each of them puts our choice of Vigilance counter, Reach counter, or Trample counter on it. Now the big difference with the green invoke sorcery and the other colors is that green actually gets way more ramp, which in turn also turns it into fixing. If we have a two drop that taps for green, we have more green mana to cast invoke the ancients, and green also just a color that has access to more mana fixing to make it more realistic for us to cast invoke the ancients. That's going to give it a significant increase in uh, rating here. And of course, two, four, five creatures, that's just a ton of power and toughness. And we get to min-max all the different counters, which also make the tokens count as modified creatures, so another reason to like it. So Invoke the Ancients, I think, is bomb level, gets an A. Just make sure you have lots of mana creatures to help with the quadruple green. Next we have Jugan Defense the Temple, a three mana mythic rare enchantment saga. On chapter 1 makes a 1-1 one, one, a green human monk creature token that taps for green. On chapter 2 put a plus one plus one counter on each of up to two target creatures. So I'm getting some Rishkar vibes here. And then on the final chapter transforms into Remnant of the Rising Star, a 2-2 two, two enchantment creature dragon spirit with flying, saying whenever another creature enters a battlefield under our control, we can pay X, and if we do put X plus one plus one counters on that creature, so that's a lot of value, a nice kind of, uh, what's the 2-drop again from Eldraine that you could pay X mana, very similar here. And it also once again counts as adding modified counters to your creatures, in addition to the second chapter which already modified a bunch of creatures. And then as long as you control 5 or more modified creatures, the remnant gets plus 5 plus 5 and has trample. So, not too difficult to get to five modified creatures, assuming, you know, the game isn't over yet from all the extra counters you're accumulating, but it's actually realistic for you to get a 7-7 flying trampling dragon spirit. So, this card seems very powerful indeed, and probably gets at least an A. Hesitant to give it an S, because at the end of the day, if the opponent kills your remnants, Sure, you still got a little bit of value, but probably not as much as you would like. No, actually I've talked myself into giving this an S. Even if they kill the remnant, you still got a 1-1 one, one mana creature and two plus one counters. I think that's probably enough value to be happy. So S for Remnant of the Rising Star. Then we have Jukai, Preserver, a 4 mana 3-3 three, three enchantment creature human druid at common. When it enters, put a plus 1 counter on a target creature we control. So once again, good for our modifications. And we can channel it for 3 mana, putting a plus 1 counter on each of up to 2 target creatures we control. That's not a bad combo trick. And it's just a flexibility here once again of channel, almost all the channel cards. 
I'm pretty high on, thanks to the flexibility they provide. And both halves here are pretty efficient. We can put the plus one counter on the preserver itself, turning it into a 4 mana 4-4. Four four. And it has even more flexibility, so C plus for preserver, big fan. Also an enchantment creature for those green-white enchantment synergies. Jukai Trainee, a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two human samurai at common. When the trainee blocks or becomes blocked, it gets plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn. So kind of a callback to Bushido from the original Kamigawa set. And uh, also samurai for potential samurai synergies, not that there's a ton of those in green. So yeah, fine 2-drop, nothing exciting, gets a C. Kami of Transience is a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two spirit at rare. It tramples and says whenever we cast an enchantment spell, put a plus 1 counter on it. And at the beginning of our end step, or each end step rather, if an enchantment was put into our graveyard from the battlefield, we may return the Kami from our graveyard to our hand. So nice recursive creature. Plays well with... Uh, yeah, pretty much any enchantment. I guess the sagas mostly turn into creatures now, so those don't naturally end up in the graveyard, but creatures do, so still great synergy there. And yeah, for a 2-drop it doesn't ask much of us, just that we play a bunch of enchantments and it will become larger, eventually come back. So could see this having some constructed applications as well. Kami gets a B, seems great. Kappa Tech Wrecker, a 2-mana 1-3 Turtle Ninja at Uncommon. Can pay 2-mana for Ninjutsu, and when it enters the battlefield, it enters with a Death Touch counter on it, so also counts as a modification. And when it deals combat damage to a player, we can remove a Death Touch counter from it to exile target artifact or enchantment that player controls. So this is great as a way to enable uh, the various Ninjutsu creatures. And it's also something we can ninjutsu itself, at which point we can make it uh, easier to destroy, or I guess exile even, an artifact or enchantment. And disenchants are very powerful in this set. This one does require a little bit of work, so it's not just, you know, two mana exile artifact or enchantment. But sometimes you would rather have a 1-3 death touch, in which case this also delivers. So a lot of flexibility and decent stats, so... At least a C plus for the Kappa. Then we have Kodama of the West Tree, a 3 mana 3-3 three, three legendary creature spirit at Mythic with Reach, and says modified creatures we control have Trample, and whenever a modified creature we control deals combat damage to a player, get to search our library for a basic land to put on the battlefield tapped. Alright, so not a bad payoff for the modified deck, 3-3 three, three with Reach for 3, already reasonable. And uh, adding Trample seems nice, so we'll give Kodama a B. Then is the Legendary Dragon Spirits in green, as all the Dragon Spirits gets an S. This one a 5 mana, 4-4 four, four Flying Death Touch. When it dies, get to choose between searching our library for up to 3 land cards, put them into our hands, or create an XX green spirit creature token where X is the number of lands we control. Yeah, this one is awesome too. Just a great two for one under most circumstances. And uh, not much more to add there. Next is the March of Burgeoning Life. So the March is part of the rare cycle of X uh, instance here. So we can Exile cards or a green card from our hands to make it cheaper, although this one is uh, not very good. We get to choose target creature with mana value less than X. So if X is 3, we can choose a 2-drop. Search your library for a creature card with the same name as that creature and put it on the battlefield tapped. So if I pay 4 mana, X is 3. 2 is less than 3, so I'm paying 4 mana for a 2-drop. And I also have to have the same 2-drop in my deck, which is pretty difficult in Limited. Not sure what this is accomplishing in Constructed, but in Limited this is an F. Master's Rebuke, a 2-mana instant at common, saying a target creature you control deals damage equal to its power to target creature or planeswalker you don't control. So 
kind of our ramp through, instant speed rabbit bite, whatever you want to call it. Uh, pretty good in green usually, and it's probably going to be one of the best commons, so it gets a B. Next is the Oroki Merge Keeper. 2 mana, 1 1, Snake Druid add on common, taps for green. And as long as it's modified, can tap for double green. So if we happen to put a plus 1 counter on it at some point, it becomes an even better mana creature. But even as a 2 mana, 1 1 that taps for green, it's totally fine. So C plus for the Merge Keeper. Next is Roaring Earth, 2 mana enchantment at uncommon, saying whenever land enters the battlefield under our control, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on target creature or vehicle we control. Now this seems like an awesome landfall card, even if it's not a landfall set. And then we can also channel for X and double green, discard it to put X plus 1 plus 1 counters on target land we control. And then it's a 0 0 spirit with haste, that's still a land. So in the late game, if we're out of lands and hands to trigger Roaring Earth, we can instead just make a large creature. Early on, probably play it as an enchantment and pick up a ton of plus one counters. Great for enabling your modified synergies. So there's a lot to like about it. And uh, yeah, probably even go up to a B for Roaring Earth, especially if you've got some other ways of putting lands in play or fetching up lands so you can keep fueling it for the rest of the game. Season of Renewal, 3 mana instant, lets us choose one or both between returning a creature from our graveyard to our hand and returning an enchantment from our graveyard to our hand. So especially in a deck with channel synergies where we can discard things early and then later get back with Season, this seems awesome. Um, outside of channel synergies, it maybe becomes a little bit more difficult to get a clean 2 for 1, but I'm probably going to be pretty happy with at least the first copy of this in any green deck because most green decks have no shortage of enchantments, and most decks happen to have lots of creatures as well. So, yeah, nice 2 for 1, requires a bit of setup. Probably a C, not a card that's going to be in very high demand, I don't think, but at least the first copy should be quite serviceable. Next is Shigeki Jukai Visionary, a 2 mana 1 3 legendary enchantment creature Snake Druid at rare. Can pay 2 mana, tap it, return it to its owner's hand, and then reveal the top 4 cards of our library, put a land from among them onto the battlefield tapped, so it kind of ramps us, rest into our graveyard, so it's also enabling graveyard synergies. And then we can channel it for double X and double green, discard it, and return X, target non-legendary cards from our graveyard to our hand. So by picking it up, we're not only filling the graveyard, but we can also then use the channel ability afterwards. So it kind of works with itself in a way. Even if it is quite mana intensive to play it, activate it. At the same time, it's also generating additional mana by putting lands in play. And then in the late game, using channel can be a great way to kind of go over the top. So yeah, overall pretty happy with uh, Shigeki as my 2-drop. And probably give it a B. Then a spinning wheel kick, double X, double green for an uncommon sorcery, saying a target creature we control deals damage equal to its power to each of up to X target creatures and or planeswalkers. So it's going to be 4 mana for X equals 1, 6 mana for X equals 2 to potentially take out 2 creatures. So it's not all that difficult to get to X equals 2, and then it's just a nice 2 for 1, assuming there's no instant speed interaction from the opponent. So yeah, spinning wheel kick seems pretty great. Gets a B. Spring Leaf Avenger, 5 mana, 6, 5 insect ninja at rare with a ninjutsu for just 4 mana. And when the Avenger deals comma damage to a player, get to return target permanent card from our graveyard to our hand. So not only does it have great stats, it also has ninjutsu, and if it deals damage, provides card advantage. Yeah, this gets an A. Seems like a bomb. Story Weave, a 3 mana instant at Uncommon, letting us choose one between putting two plus one counters on target creature we control. So we can do that at instant speed, which is relevant. Or put two lore counters on a saga we control, and then next time one or more enchantment creatures enter the battlefield under our control, they enter with two additional plus one counters on them. 
So good synergy with, of course, all the sagas that transform into creatures, and then the creature gets two counters. The main issue here is that a lot of the payoff of the sagas are the creatures themselves. So sure, we can speed up the creature, which is nice, but then it's kind of like we're putting an aura on a creature by putting two counters on it. Now we do have also the flexibility of just an instant to put two counters on stuff, but at that point I think I would rather have the uh, the four mana enchantment creature that we covered earlier with channel. That just seems like a better card. So maybe there's a saga deck where we are happy to have story weave, but <clears throat> I'm pretty skeptical. So I'm going to give this a D. But if you <clears throat> are lacking comma tricks or need a way to enable modified synergies, I guess this could still do. Tales of Master Sashiro, a 5 mana common and shaman saga. First two chapters put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on target creature or vehicle we control. Also gains vigilance until end of turn. And eventually transforms into Sashiro's Living Legacy, a 5-5 five five enchantment creature with vigilance and haste. Haste is always nice on these enchantments, as that allows us to attack right, right away, as opposed to having to wait another turn. And 5-5, uh, five five, pretty big, Vigilance is nice. Now we do have to wait for it still, 5 mana, turn 6, and then turn 7 we get to attack with our 5-5. Five five. So that's a lot of time to wait, and the first two chapters, you know, are not all that exciting. So I'm still hesitant to give this more than a C but a playable card. In an enchantment deck you'll maybe want it a little bit more, especially if you can play it at a discount. Tamiyo's Safekeeping, a 1 mana instant at common, giving target permanent we control, hexproof and indestructible until end of turn, and we also gain 2 life. So as far as combat tricks go, this is not my favorite kind in limited. Sure you can protect a key creature, but it doesn't add any power or toughness, it doesn't help us trade a smaller creature up for a larger creature, unless that large creature just doesn't have any toughness whatsoever. So even though Hexproof and Indestructible are nice keywords, I'm still kind of hesitant to include this as a combo trick, so I'll give this a D. Maybe it becomes worth it if you've got a bomb or two you absolutely want to protect. Then Teachings of the Kirin, a 2 mana rare enchantment saga. On the first chapter we mill three cards, creating a 1-1 one, one colorless spirit creature token in the process. On chapter 2 puts a plus 1 plus 1 counter on target creature we control. And finally transforms into Kirin, touched or rocky, a 1-1 one, one enchantment creature snake monk. And when it attacks we get to choose one between exiling target creature card from a graveyard. And then we get to make a 1-1 one, one token. Or exile target non-creature card from a graveyard in which case we can put a plus one plus one counter on target creature instead. So the first two chapters are pretty nice. We get a 1-1 one, one token, we make a modified creature, and then the uh, enchantment creature is not bad, although the main concern is by the time it turns into a creature and gets to attack, the opponent's probably going to be able to block it pretty easily, and it only triggers once it attacks. So at that point we're like holding back a 1-1 until we eventually cash it in for either a token or a plus one counter. Seems kind of medium, but uh, yeah, we still got our value in the first two chapters, I think, especially if we have some graveyard synergy and we care about milling. So it's still not a, a bad card. Also good for the modified decks. So overall, C plus for teachings of the Kirin. Next up we have Weaver of Harmony, 2 mana, 2-2 two, two, enchantment creature snake druid at rare, saying other enchantment creatures we control get plus 1 plus 1, so very significant bonus. And then we can pay a green, tap it to copy target activated or triggered ability we control from an enchantment source and choose new targets for the copy. Seems pretty sweet with all the different sagas and uh, potentially other enchantments that have triggered abilities. And it's all on a 2-2 creature that's also pumping the rest of our enchantment creatures, which again green has no shortage of. So could also work with the shrines indeed. So there, there's a lot of neat synergies with the Weaver of Harmony, and it's very cheap to 
use the activated ability on it. So a Weaver of Harmony, at the very least B, might even sneak its way into the A category, but I guess it's enough of a build around that not every deck can uh, really use it as a bomb. Web Spinner Cuff is a 3 mana 1 4 artifact creature equipment spider at uncommon with reach. And the equipped creature, if we reconfigure it for 4 mana, will get plus 1, plus 4, and reach as well. So, would rather have an enchantment as opposed to an artifact in green? A 1 4's reasonable stats, and reach is always nice to have when facing flyers. But uh, I'm not ecstatic about it, so probably just like a, a C plus for the web spinner cuff. Our first artifact, automated artificer, two mana, one three artifact creature that can tap to add colorless mana to spend on activated abilities or cast artifact spells. So not a bad ramp card in like a blue red artifact deck, for instance, that can also hold off opposing two drops. So I'll give this a C. Next we have the Bronze Cudgels, a 1-mana artifact equipment at Uncommon. So one of the few equipment without reconfigure, which is a little weird to see in this set. Equips for just 1-mana, so it is pretty cheap, which means it's potentially a good enabler for the modified deck, as you can quickly attach this to a creature and future modified bonuses will apply. And then we can pay 2 mana, and then until end of turn, the equipped creature gets plus X plus O, where X is the number of times the ability resolved. So the first activation, plus 1 plus O. Second activation, a total of plus 3 plus O. Third activation for 6 mana, and our creature gets plus 6 plus O. So it does scale pretty reasonably if you can activate it multiple times, but it is still a pretty big mana investment, and it doesn't do anything if you don't spend the mana besides maybe enable your modified synergies. So, yeah, not super high on the cudgels, but maybe in a red-green deck it gets better, especially if your creature has trample, so you can make sure that damage goes to the opponent's face. A brute suit, a 3-mana 4-3 artifact vehicle at common with vigilance and crew 1, so very cheap to crew. Seems like a nice inclusion for the blue-white artifact deck. And... Uh, yeah, not a whole lot to add to it. Fine card, nothing exciting. Gets a C. Circuit Mender, a 3-mana 2-3 artifact creature at Uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, we gain 2. When it leaves the battlefield, we draw a card. So the dream, I guess, is using Ninjutsu with it, so we can replay it to get more value. But even as a 2-3 that we can maybe sacrifice or trade with, seems great. So... Very reminiscent of the 2-2 uh, from uh, Kaladesh, I believe, that had similar abilities. So this might be even better. So Circuit Mender gets a B, goes into pretty much any deck. Containment Construct, a 2-mana two 2-1 two artifact creature construct at Uncommon, says whenever we discard a card, we may exile that card from our graveyard, and if we do, we may play that card this turn. So, reminiscent of the theorist, the conspiracy theorist from uh, Strixhaven, I believe. There's not a whole lot of discard effects in this set as a problem, and it doesn't enable itself. I guess it maybe works with channel, where we discard cards, but then it's going to be difficult for us to have enough mana to uh, both use channel and play the card in the same turn. Seems a little bit difficult to make this work, but at the end of the day it's a 2-mana two 2-1. Two and it's an artifact for potential artifact synergies, like a C or a C+. The one toughness is still kind of a concerning aspect. Dramatist's Puppet, a 4-mana 2-4 artifact creature construct at common. When it enters the battlefield, for each kind of counter on target permanent, put another counter of that kind on it or remove one from it. So that includes plus one counters, even loyalty counters on planeswalkers can remove those from opposing cards as well. And a 2444 isn't horrible. So Dramatist Puppets, not an exciting card, but if you're lacking playables, it'll do. I'll give this a C. Eater of Virtue, a 1-mana legendary artifact, equipment at rare. It's only 1-mana to equip, giving it plus 2 plus 0. 
similar to Bone Splitter, which is a very great equipment in uh, Limited. And then there's more. If the equipped creature dies, we exile it. And as long as a card exiled with Eater of Virtue has flying, the equipped creature has flying, and the same is true for First Strike, Double Strike, Death Touch, Haste, Hexproof, Indestructible, a Lifelink, Menace, Protection, Reach, Trample, and Vigilance. So it kind of absorbs the powers of the Fallen Warriors that wielded it before. So even without all that extra text, Eater of Virtue would be great. With all that extra text, it becomes even better. I'll give this an A, seems like a bomb level card. Ecologist's Terrarium is one of the common mana fixers in the set, a two mana artifact that when it enters a battlefield lets us search your library for a basic land card, reveal it, put it into our hand and then shuffle. And then there's more, can pay two mana, tap and sacrifice the Terrarium to put a plus one plus one counter on target creature, can only be used as a sorcery. So great mana fixer for any two color decks trying to splash, great for all the five color nonsense uh, kami or uh, I guess shrine decks you might want to build. It's also a way to enable modified for your red green decks, so it does a lot of different things. Also an artifact that stays in play for your black white kind of artifact enchantment deck. So the terrarium is probably going to be in high demand and uh, yeah, if you need the mana fixing, make sure to pick these up. Probably going to be similar to environmental sciences, like a card that seems pretty innocent, but ends up being a, an important role player in a lot of different strategies. So overall, Ecologist's Terrarium, it's a very high C+, maybe B-, minus, somewhere in that range. The fact that it's colorless and any deck can play it probably means you should prioritize it even more because it's going to be gone pretty quickly but on the other hand if you're just like a two color deck that doesn't care about artifacts doesn't care about modified counters like maybe a blue black ninja deck then you probably don't care about the terrarium either i think it's still probably closer to a c plus than a b minus but either way a very important card for the limited environment Next is High Speed Hover Bike, a 2 mana 2 2 artifact vehicle at Uncommon. And it has Flash and Flying. Crew cost is only 1. And when it enters the battlefield, we get to tap up to 1 target creature. So the usual play pattern is probably going to be to pass and then flash this in before attackers to prevent the opponent from hitting with their biggest creature. And then it's also not going to be able to block on the next turn. Can crew the Hover Bike to start chipping in. And yeah, flying vehicles are always nice. This one's very cheap, easy to crew. So there's a lot to like about it. C plus for hover bike. Next we have Iron Apprentice, a one mana zero zero artifact creature construct at common. And when it enters battlefield, it enters with a plus one plus one counter on it. And when it dies, if it had counters on it, put all of those counters on target creature we control. So the apprentice is actually another important role player. It's a one drop to potentially enable ninjutsu, although there's not too many uh, amazing two mana ninjutsu cards necessarily, but still it is a potential way to enable those. It's a cheap artifact that leaves something behind when it dies, so perfect for the red black sacrifice deck. It's a creature with a plus one counter on it, so it counts as modified, great for the red green modified deck. So you can quickly see how the Apprentice just fits into a ton of different archetypes. And uh, as a one drop, it's uh, always nice to have something to do early when other decks don't. So yeah, there's a lot to like about it. C plus, I think, for Apprentice, even though it seems like a pretty innocuous little card. Next is Mech Titan Core, a two mana, two four artifact vehicle at rare. Crew cost is two. And we can spend 5 mana to exile the Mech Titan core and 4 other artifact creatures and or vehicles we control to create Mech Titan, a legendary 10-10 construct artifact creature token with flying, vigilance, trample, lifelink, and haste. That's all colors. And if that token leaves the battlefield, we get to return all the exiled cards back to the battlefield tapped under their owner's control, except for the Mech Titan core itself. 
It's a very powerful card and it's not too difficult to get all those artifacts in play. So gonna be at its best in like a blue-white artifact deck, blue-red maybe, or even uh, black-red, where you're gonna want to have a lot of artifacts, maybe even artifact tokens. Yeah, this seems like a very powerful card if you ever get to transform it. If you don't transform it, a 2-4, not that exciting of course, so you will need to put the work into it. But uh, assuming you can draft this early, you can kind of build around it. And there's plenty of payoffs for controlling and playing lots of artifacts. So yeah, we'll give this an A, bomb level card. Next is Mirror Box, a 3 mana rare artifact saying the legend rule doesn't apply to permanents you control. Each legendary creature you control gets plus one plus one. And each non-token creature you control gets plus one plus one for each other creature you control with the same name as that creature. None of those abilities are particularly exciting, so the overall card's not particularly exciting. Maybe has some fun constructed applications, but as far as limited is concerned, this gets an F. Next is a network terminal 3 mana artifact that common can tap for one mana of any color, so another nice mana fixer. Can pay one mana, tap it, and tap another untapped artifact we control to draw and then discard. So nice little upside on our three mana ramp artifact. So yeah, will be useful for decks attempting to splash a third color or those crazy five color shrine decks perhaps. But uh, yeah, if you don't have a ton of expensive cards, you probably don't need network terminal. And uh, especially if you don't have a lot of author artifacts to use a second ability. So overall, just a C. Next is a Ninja's Kunai, a one mana artifact equipment at common. Equips for just one mana, so once again, cheap way to enable your modified synergies. And then we can pay one mana, tap the equipped creature, and sacrifice the Kunai to deal three damage to any target. So in total, it's three mana plus tap a creature to deal three damage. Not the best rate, but hopefully you've got other synergies like Modified that you care about. And then uh, can always act as removal if needed. Nothing too exciting. Not sure if this is closer to a C or D, like C minus D plus. Go with a C for Kunai. Next is Papercraft, a decoy, 2 mana, 2-1. Two, Artifact creature frog at common. When it leaves the battlefield, you can pay 2 generic mana. If you do draw a card, having to pay the two mana is kind of awkward since you don't really want to keep up two mana at all times. And then a 2-1 two, for two, not particularly exciting. I think this is closer to a D. Patchwork Automaton, a two mana, a 1-1 one, one artifact creature construct at uncommon with a ward two. And whenever we cast an artifact spell, put a plus one counter on it. Yeah, this seems pretty decent in those dedicated artifact decks, mainly the blue, blue-reds, maybe artifact decks. If you can get this in play early, it's going to grow very quickly. So Automaton in the right deck probably can go up to like a B. Then we've got Reckoner Bank Buster. Two mana, 4-4 four, four artifact vehicle at rare. When it enters the battlefield, it enters with three charge counters on it. You can pay two mana and tap it and remove one of those counters to draw a card. So that's very reminiscent of Maze Mind Tome. And then if there are no charge counters on the Reckoner, then we get to create a treasure token and a 1-1 pilot token that basically has crew three, which is perfect for crewing the bank buster itself, which will still stick around. So I don't have the flexibility of scrying like we did with Maze Mind Tomb early. But it draws cards and still leaves behind a 4-4 and makes a creature and a treasure, so still seems awesome. And um, while it may not seem like it, I think the overall value it provides is enough for me to give it an A. Raito Sentinel, 3 mana, 3-3, three, three, artifact creature construct at uncommon with Defender, enters a battlefield milling 3 cards. And then we can pay 3 mana to put target card from a graveyard on the bottom of its owner's library. The set doesn't strike me like it's going to be grindy enough to have these effects be super relevant. So a 3-3 defender for 3 that mills doesn't seem all that great. Probably gets a D. 
And then Runaway Trash Bots, a 3 mana 0 4 artifact creature at Uncommon, with Trample that gets plus 1 plus 0 for each artifact and or enchantment card in our graveyard. Yeah, we'll need a little bit of work for it to be really worth it. I guess it's a filler 3 drop for those artifact decks. Probably don't want it in the most dedicated enchantment deck since you want actual enchantments instead. So we'll give this a C. Searchlight Companion, 3 mana 1-1 one, one artifact creature drone at common that flies, and when it enters it is joined by a 1-1 one, one colorless spirit creature token. So, could potentially work as a ninjutsu enabler as we get to generate a bit of enters a battlefield value, although it is kind of expensive at 3 to replay it afterwards. Uh, it is an artifact, so that's nice. So, has a couple synergies going for it. Especially if we can maybe get the uh, blue reds to drop uncommon that makes artifacts cheaper so we can play it for two mana, then it becomes more interesting maybe alongside ninjutsu. So companion seems playable but we'll probably have to work for it to be really great so we'll give it a C. Shrine Steward, five mana, three two artifact creature construct at common when it enters can search your library for an aura or shrine card, reveal it and put it into our hand. So if we're searching up an aura, this seems pretty expensive. Um, so probably a card dedicated to the uh, shrine deck that's going to want to assemble all its shrine synergies. Even there, it's kind of clunky, but probably a necessary evil. So probably give this a D overall. Maybe if your deck has a couple good auras that can act as removal spells, then it could go up in value, but it's still pretty slow, so a D might be playable in some decks. Next is the Surge Hacker Mech, 4 mana, 5-5 five, five, artifact vehicle at rare, crew cost is 4, has menace, and when the mech enters a battlefield it deals damage equal to twice the number of vehicles we control to target creature or planeswalker an opponent controls. So in and of itself it deals 2 damage, and that can quickly scale up, so this seems like an awesome creature that has an immediate impact, and then crew force not the easiest admittedly, but uh, still a 5-5 five, five menace, so it beats down pretty hard if you do manage to crew it. So yeah, this might get a bomb status, especially if you have a deck with multiple vehicles to power it up, so blue-white is where this will shine. And then Thundersteel Colossus, a card I already alluded to when discussing Anchor to Reality, the blue 4-drop that can search up an artifact, or a rather a vehicle or equipment. Could potentially find your Thundersteel Colossus, a 7-mana, seven 7-7 seven, seven artifact vehicle at common with Trample and Haste, and a crew cost of 2, so not too difficult to get going. Now it is very expensive at 7-mana, there is still artifact removal to potentially worry about, so don't necessarily want your expensive card to be an artifact or enchantment in this set. But, you know, can't deny that it's a nice big curve topper. So especially nice if you can make it cheaper once again with those blue-red synergies. And haste means it can uh, potentially represent a lot of damage out of nowhere. So yeah, Thundersteel Colossus actually seems like a reasonable curve topper in some decks but it is still pretty narrow, and I think most decks that want it should be able to pick it up pretty late. So we'll go with a C. And Tawashi Guidebots, a 4 mana 2-1 artifact creature construct at uncommon. When it enters, can put a plus one plus one counter on target creature we control, and pay 4 mana, tap it to draw a card, and it costs one less to activate for each modified creature we control. So it can already modify a creature when it enters, 2-1 that adds a counter somewhere for 4 is a little bit below rate, and the activated ability is also kind of expensive, but it is potentially a nice card draw engine for those red-green decks that are maybe good at assembling power and toughness, but lack some sort of card draw engine in a late game, so this could maybe help. So yeah, guidebot's okay, nothing exciting, give it a C. Walking Skyscraper is the 8 mana 8-8 eight, eight artifact creature construct at uncommon, costs 1 less to cast for each modified creature we control, has trample, and has hexproof as long as it's untapped. 
So that's the uh, hexproof creature I alluded to when discussing the uh, Cloud Steel Kirin, which prevents you from losing the game as long as it's uh, attached as an equipment. Of course, not the easiest combo to assemble, but um, I wouldn't be surprised to see a screenshot the day of release of someone already assembling it. And uh, yeah, an 8 8 Trampler closes out the game pretty quickly. So it's also just a good curve topper for your modified deck. So again, that's probably most likely to be red-green, but could also be solid in some other color pairs that have synergy with artifacts. Who knows? A little expensive, but powerful. We'll give the Skyscraper C. And then all the lands, we will give a cumulative grade of C+, plus for all the gain lands. So, so they come into play tapped and gain one life and make two colors. So cards like Bloodfell Caves, Blossoming Sands, and there will be a couple more. Then we also have a cycle of rare lands, legendary lands with channel, so we can discard them to get some sort of effect. And in this case, Buseju, we can discard for two mana to destroy an artifact, enchantment, or non-basic land, and the opponent gets to search up a basic land in return. Also becomes cheaper if we control a legendary creature. So in a set full of artifacts and enchantments, this seems pretty great. And uh, yeah, it's still a land that's untapped, so there's no real downside over a forest. So we'll give Buseju a B, a card I'll take pretty highly, just because it goes into any green deck and provides a lot of free upside. This small backwater, another gain lands, Iganjo, another legendary land. This one channels for 3 mana to deal 4 damage to an attacking or blocking creature, and also cheaper if we control a legendary creatures. So another B. Got Mech Hangar, a uncommon land, taps for colorless, can make one mana of any color to spend on pilots or vehicle spells, or can pay three mana, tap it, and then target vehicle becomes an artifact creature until end of turn. So it could be a, a nice ability if you're lacking other pilots. So outside of a dedicated vehicle deck, I probably don't want this in an artifacts vehicle deck, probably blue white. This seems like a reasonable inclusion. Still doesn't cast your author colored spells necessarily, so have to be mindful of that. But uh, C for those blue white vehicle decks. Then we've got Otawara, Soaring City, another channel, legendary land, four mana to return target artifact, creature, or enchantment, or even planeswalker to its owner's hand, and it gets cheaper with the legendaries. We'll give a B as well. We've got a roadside reliquary, a colorless land at uncommon, can pay two mana, tap and sacrifice it to draw a card if we control an artifact, and also draw a card if we control an enchantment. So in the dedicated black-white enchantment artifact deck, maybe I'll want this as an extra mana sink in the late game. Still doesn't fix our mana, so somewhat hesitant to include too many of these, but we'll uh, give this a tentative C. Got Rugged Highlands as another gain land, Scoured Barrens, and then a Secluded Courtyard, a land that as it enters you, name, you have to name a creature type, makes colorless mana or one mana of any color that we can only spend to cast creature spells of the chosen type or activated abilities of creatures of the chosen type. So it will be a nice mana fixer for those uh, historic deck, historic brawl decks. I guess maybe standard, this could find some use cases, but uh, yeah, I don't recommend it for limited, give it a D. And then a Sokkenzon, another legendary land, can channel to make two 1-1 one, one tokens that also have haste, and can also potentially ambush an opposing attacker, since we can do this at instant speed once again. Also gets a B. Swiftwater Cliffs, another gain land, and then... Takenuma abandons Mire, a legendary land, channels for 4 mana to mill 3 and then return a creature or planeswalker from our graveyard to our hand, and also becomes cheaper with legendaries. So once again, probably at least a C+, maybe a B. This one doesn't affect the board immediately, unlike the other legendary lands, but still a nice value card in the late game as opposed to a basic land. And Thornwood Falls. And Tranquil Cove. Next we have Uncharted Haven. Enters a battlefield tapped. As it enters, choose a color and then makes one mana of the chosen color. So a nice tapped mana fixer. 
Again, probably useful for those five color decks or potential two color decks with a light splash. So in those decks, probably give this a C plus. And then a wins card, Crag, or last card, another gain land that gets a C plus. That concludes our limited set review for Kamigawa Neon Dynasty. Again, want to remind everyone that if you're interested in the spreadsheet for this entire set review that I'll try to keep up to date, it will be available for all Twitch subscribers and Patreon members. And uh, again, I'll try and keep it up to date as I play the set more, as I'm sure some of these grades will fluctuate over time. And I want to make sure to give you the most up-to-date ratings available. And uh, yeah, otherwise, stay tuned for more limited streams coming in the near future. But for now, want to thank everyone for watching, hope you enjoyed, and as always, have a nice day. I also want to thank all my patrons for being part of the channel, and you can become a patron yourself today and decide the topic of future videos over at patreon.com forward slash legendvd.